Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. The City of the Dead. There are 10,000 citizens in the City of the Dead, each with a white marble slab indicating each residence. The gates of the City of the Dead have long been closed to newcomers. It is a city whose population has remained unchanged for the last 10 years. And the mayor of this city is Joshua Friday. Some call him caretaker of the old cemetery in the valley. But anyone who knows Joshua Friday at all calls him mayor. He is the only living person in the City of the Dead. That is, unless you care to include Lammy Fink, a slow-witted fellow who does kitchen police duty, and a little gardening in the city during the day, and retires beyond its precincts at night. The City of the Dead lies in a tiny valley 25 miles from the suburb of a great city. It is off the main highway and completely isolated from the world. But now it's 9 o'clock on a moonlit, windy night in October. Come on, come on, get out of that car. You heard me. What, what do you want? You want me to plug you? Oh, Jimmy, do what he says. You too, girl, get out. You let go of me. You let that girl alone. And get out of the car, both of you. Yeah, now start walking. No, the other way. But that's toward the graveyard. You heard me, and don't look back or they'll pick up your bodies in the morgue wagon in the morning. Now get moving. Jimmy... What's happening to us? Keep walking. Don't look around. They've stolen your machine. I know it, Phyllis. I couldn't tackle two armed men. Of course you couldn't. Shouldn't have parked way out here in the country. But it was nice. It was so still in the moonlight. Who do you suppose they were? Probably car thieves. They didn't touch us. Jimmy. Church bell. Oh, but there aren't any churches around here. Oh, sure there is. That little old church down at the other end of the valley. Oh, but that's all falling to pieces. It hasn't been used for years. That's right. Funny, isn't it? Jimmy, I, I'm scared. Do we have to go on? Well, look, Phyllis, there's a light ahead of us. You know what it is? No. Oh, Jimmy, what's that? Quick, get off the road. Behind those bushes. Get down. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, what was that? What was... Shh, shh. Oh. oh, I wish we were home. Don't talk so loud, fellas. I act as though we were being chased. Chased? Listen. You don't hear anything, do you? No. I mean, come on. Keep on the grass. Well, where are we going? You saw that light. I just remember that the caretaker of the city of the dead lives around here somewhere. That must be his place. Well, I, I don't like that name. What? City of the dead? Yes. Graveyard's bad enough. Well, anyway, we'll get him to let us use his phone and call the police and have a car sent out for us. Well, there, you can see the outline of the house among the trees. See it? Uh-huh. Looks awfully lonesome, doesn't it? Mm. Look. What are those? We're inside the city of the dead. Those are the tombstones glistening in the moonlight. I don't like it, Jimmy. Oh, here's the door. Oh, Jimmy, don't leave me. I'm right here in the shadow. He doesn't answer. It's funny. What do you want? Oh, no. Hey, hey, where did you come from? What do you want? Uh, Are you the caretaker? Supposing I am. Oh, what made you sneak up on us from behind? That you making that crazy noise. What noise? Oh, you mean the man crying? Oh, so it was you. Oh, no. No, it wasn't. He passed us down the road. He was scared. What are you doing here? Why, my car was stolen from us. Oh, stolen? Hi, Doc! Open the door! Yes, two men held us up. We want to phone to the city for help. Do you hear, Doc? They're coming, Mayor. Oh, here you are. Well, yeah. what have you there, Mayor? Go on in, you two. Yes, sir. Lock up again, will you, Doc? Sure. Were they the ones picking up the rumpus? Hmm. 
Yeah, you tell a queer story. Here, you two, sit down. Said the car was stolen, Doc. Who stole it? Well, I don't know, just two gunmen. Yeah. Now here, Mayor, you better let me do the questioning. We'll get further. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, what's your name, son? James Parker, sir, and this is Miss Phyllis Carroll. Hmm, how do you do, Miss Carroll? Now, Mr. Parker, as I understand, you and Miss Carroll were out riding this evening. Uh-huh. We were parked down the road near your house. Parked? What for? <laughs> no, no, Mayor. Well, it looks suspicious to me, Doc, with all these other goings on. No, oh, you just don't understand modern young folk, Mayor. You'd better let me do the talking. Now then, you were parked on the edge of the road, I take it? Yes, sir. And then what happened? Well, two men suddenly appeared, one on each side of the car, and told us to put up our hands and get out of the car. They were armed, you say? Yeah, both of them. When we got out, they told us to keep walking in the direction of the graveyard. What's that? No, oh, son, don't ever say that word again in front of the Mayor Friday. This is the city of the dead. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go on. Well, just as we saw the light in the caretaker's... It's Mayor, we... son. Mayor. Yes, sir. Just as we saw the light in the Mayor's house, we heard someone coming down the road as hard as he could run. He was scared. Hysterical, huh? Mm, yes, sir, he was. Crying and sobbing. Oh, Jimmy, you forgot about the bell. Bell? Yes, the church bell. It seemed to come from down at the other end of the gra- uh, the city of the dead. I guess it was from the old church down there. Mm, you hear that, Mayor? There ain't been no bell in them ruins for ten years, Doc. No bell? But we heard it. But I tell you, you never that... mind, Mayor. Now then, son, what happened after that? Well, after the man ran by, we waited a few moments, and we came to the door and knocked. That's all. No, I see. What do you make of it, Mayor? Don't like it. Think they're lying. But we're not. Listen, let me call up the police. Police? The police? Listen, I'm mayor of the city of the dead, and what I say goes. Yes, sir. And I ain't never had any police in this city, and I ain't never gonna have. And besides, there isn't any telephone here. But I saw a telephone Son, wire. you heard me say there was no telephone here. Oh, but, but I've got to let my mother know. I'm sorry, Miss Carroll. It seems to be fate. But what are we going to do? No one ever comes by this way. Well, Mayor Friday will put you up for the night, I think. He has a couple of extra rooms, eh, Mayor? Eh? Oh, sure. Sure. Oh, but I've got to get home tonight. Now, now, Miss Carroll, you better just take it all as an adventure and make the best of it. Isn't that right, son? Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, maybe if we started to walk back, we could pick up a ride when we hit the main highway. No, 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 we couldn't think of letting you do that. You simply must accept Mayor Friday's hospitality. Now, I'll tell you what, while the mayor is fixing up your rooms, I'll brew us a cup of coffee. But I don't want any coffee. Oh, tut, tut, of course you do. Yeah, there's still a fire in the kitchen stove, and the kettle's almost to a boil. We'll have coffee in a jiffy. But I want to go home. Don't say any more, Phyllis. Jimmy, what does it mean? I don't know. Something's up. I don't get it, but we better play up to him. Pretend like you thought nothing was a matter. Well, are, are we prisoners? Well, it looks like it. Now, don't worry, though. I can take on these two old duffers if I have to. Well, but who is this? This dark person. Oh, sh- here he comes. Now then, coffee's all ready. Yeah. Hey, there you are, Miss Carroll. Thank you. Yeah, and there you are, Mr. Parker. Oh, thank you, sir. And here's some buns. They're better if they're hot, but they'll do for this sort of a snack. No, thank you. I, I'll just have coffee. Sir, I thought that Mr. Uh, Mayor Friday lived here alone. <laughs> you wonder who I am, eh? Well, I'm what your city doctors would call an old codger, I'm afraid. Just an old country doctor. Doc Tuner is what they call me. But I wouldn't think they'd need a, a physician in the city of the dead. Oh, no, no. The city of the dead isn't my seat of practice. That is, I should say, it wasn't my seat of practice. You see, son, I'm retired now. All my patients are dead. Dead? All of them? Well, it's this way, young folks. I was a family doctor and had my little practice and was like a member of each family that a doctor I knew all the little troubles and every pain of each of my patients. Never seemed to hanker to add new patients to my clientele, especially as I grew older. Uh, more coffee, Miss Carroll? It does taste good. Well, as time went on, I found myself laying more and more of my patients to rest in the city of the dead. But there hasn't been anyone buried in the city of the dead for the last ten years. Well, this was years ago, son. Well, finally, about ten years ago, I discovered that all the families I'd doctored were either dead or had moved away. As that I hadn't added any new patients, I was a doctor without a practice. But couldn't you have got more? Oh, suppose I could, but I never made a practice of it, so I didn't hanker to begin trying at my age. 
I was getting well along, and besides, I had enough to live on. Oh, I see. <laughs> Which means that you don't see it all. Well, son, as I said, I lost the last of my patients about the time they closed the City of the Dead as a burying place and opened up a newfangled cemetery over on the other side of the city. My last patient just slipped in under the bars, you might say. Last person to be buried here. All your your patients are buried in this great uh, City of the Dead? Every one of them. So you can see the City of the Dead has a very soft place in my heart. I often come down here and stay a spell with the mayor. It's kind of like being with old friends. Going down there among those little white headstones brings back all the old days to me. And you just happen to be here on a visit tonight? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, here comes the mayor. Well, your room's just ready. Yeah, that's good. I suppose, Miss Carroll, you'd better take the first room. Mr. Parker, you take the one right next to it. Is that right, ma'am? Don't make no difference. Well, good night. I hope you both sleep well. I'm calling you for breakfast. Uh, good night, Dr. Tuner. And you too, Mr. Uh, Mayor Friday. Good night, son. And you, Miss Carroll. Yes. Good night. Good night, Phil. Remember, I'm right next door. Night, Jim. And now you, son. Yeah. Hi. Hi out there. Hey, what do you mean by locking the door? Oh, Phyllis. Phyllis. You mean it's that you? Yes, Phyllis. They've locked me in and the window's barred. <laughs> Out of the night come two youngsters. Into the web of intrigue woven by two strange old characters they fall. Prisoners of Doc Tuner and Mayor Friday. Just who are... But before we go into that, a word from our sponsor. Having locked Jimmy Parker and Phyllis Carroll in adjoining bedrooms in the caretaker's cottage, old Doc Tuner and Mayor Friday are out among the gravestones investigating. Well, look here, Mayor. We won't be able to find anything down here among the graves this time of night. Yeah, moon's good. Anyway, I know every stick and stone in the City of the Dead. I'll know if anybody's been prowling around. Good morning will do just as well. No, it won't. I'm going to look, and if I catch anybody prowling around... Well, I got my gun. But if the men got away, as those youngsters said... Both of me ain't telling the truth. All that nonsense about hearing a church bell. Well, the girl was telling the truth, Mayor. I know the truth when I hear it. Dang funny. Ain't no church bells within 20 miles of here. I tell you, Doc, I'm just going to raise old Ned if I catch anybody bothering any of my citizens. They come to the city of the dead to rest, and I'm going to see that they get it. No, of course, Mayor, but what gets me is why anyone should want to rob a ten-year-old grave and let... Fine joke, Mayor. Huh? Well, never mind now. This is going to take some thinking over. I'll tell you when we get back to the house. Uh, look yonder at the whisk of fog among the stones. Yeah. Yeah, them's the first bits of fog sweeping down the valley. Another couple of hours and the whole city will be so thick you can cut yourself a hunk. Hmm. Strange how I love this old place. Those wisps of fog remind me of rays, nice friendly phantoms. Mm-hmm. I think you have the same feel about this place as me. Uh, listen. Hmm, there, there's your church bell. But there ain't any bell, I tell you. I seen them take it out of the tower ten years back when they quit using it. Yeah, maybe your ears are deceiving you, but personally, I hear church bells. Yeah, it gives the fella the creeps, don't it? Yeah, it seems to me there are altogether too many mysterious things happening in the city of the dead, if you can get what I mean. I don't. Well, for a city of quiet, decent folk that are supposed to be at their last resting place, there's a beastly lot of nocturnal activity. Hmm, listen. Bell stopped. Say, I got a thought, Mary. Yeah? Why don't you put old Lammy Fink to keep a lookout at night? If he saw a prowler... If he he'd... saw a prowler, he'd have a fit. Hmm. Lammy Fink. That addle brain wouldn't stay in the city of the dead after dark for anything on earth. Well, to be honest about it, Mary, it looks to me like the kids are telling the truth. In the morning, we'd better feed them and send them on their way. And have them go home and tell a long rigmarole about auto bandits and hysterical men and phantom church bells and us locking them up for the night? Well, you can't keep them locked up indefinitely. Better turn them loose before any more harm's done. Mighty funny they should show up right at this time. Looks queer to me. Somebody's been monkeying around in the city of the dead for the last week. Then we up and catch a couple. Don't seem natural to me that they should be innocent. Well, and then I lied to him about the telephone. That's something else for him to talk about. I shake, Doc. If they went to the police with all that, the city of the dead would be run over with police and thrill hunters for weeks. I ain't gonna have it. What's this? 
Look here. Man's cap. Yes, it's a cap, all right. Recognize it? Uh, yes. You don't say, Mary. Yes. Belongs to Lammy Fink. Mm, don't tell much. Might have left it here yesterday while he was working. No, he didn't. I was by this way after he left last night. Wasn't here then. And anyway, he was he was working down at the other end of the city. And again, I seen him when he left after work. And he had it on his head then. <laughs> Well, those are three pretty definite reasons to make us believe that Lammy Fink isn't so afraid of the City of the Dead after dark as you thought. Mm. Likewise, it rather indicates that Lammy was down here tonight. I know Lammy. He wasn't down here. Not if he could help it, he wasn't. You're a stubborn fellow, Mayor. You deny their church bells even when you hear them. Now you intimate that a man's cap has arrived on the scene without reason or assistance. Yeah, things ain't like they should be, Doc. Something's the matter. Somebody's desecrating the City of the Dead. Well, the thing to do is to question Lammy tomorrow. Shh, wait, listen. Hmm, church bell again. Say, I'm beginning to think you're right about investigating that old church. I'll go down with you tomorrow. I ain't gonna wait till tomorrow. I'm going down there now. Oh, come now, Mayor. It's getting foggier in the deuce. You won't be able to see anything. Going anyway. If there's anything there, I'll see it. Oh, what's the use of chasing phantom church bells this time of night? Don't come if you don't want to. I'm going. Well, if you're going, I might as well go too. <laughs> You ain't fidgety at your age, are you, Doc? Who, me? Blamed old fool, come on. Can't see a blame thing. Got a flashlight, Doc. I always carry one. Mm, dilapidated old ruin. Should have been torn down long ago. Come on. I'll lead. And look out where you step. Every board's full of rottenness. Floor's liable to collapse and let you through. I ought to know that. Been in here often enough. Hey. What in tunk is that? Oh, nothing. nothing but the rafters creaking. Can't you feel the whole building sway when the wind blows? It's that old. Yeah, and your whole shebang's likely to crash down on us. I don't reckon so. Keep quiet. What the deuce for? You don't expect to run anything into anything here, do you? Most folks have better sense than to risk their neck in this kind of a place. If a bell rung, somebody rung it. But you said there wasn't any bell. Mm -hmm. Last time I was in here is when we buried old man Burton. It's more than ten years back. You remember old man Burton, Mayor? Yeah. Yeah, walked down this very aisle behind his coffin. You're oh, Lord Almighty, Mayor. Yeah, just a screech owl, Doc. That's the blamedest noise. Shh, hold it. I told you we should have waited till morning. Ah, uh, it ain't nothing. Come on. Where are you going now? We're going to climb up this chair ladder into the belfry. No, we're not. I am. Like as not, one of the rungs will give way and you'll break your neck. I'm going to chance it. Well, yeah, then let me go first. No. This chair's my funeral. You be careful, Mayor. Listen to those rungs squeak under your weight. Yeah. Now, they'll hold, I guess. Are you coming? Yes, of course. Hold that light down here so I can see what I'm doing. All right. Right behind you. All right, Doc. You wait for me at the top of the ladder. Yeah. If anything doing, I might as well be in on it. Yeah. <sighs> All right, Doc. Yeah, except for a bad case of goose pimples. Now, I, I'm going to turn on the flashlight. Better crouch down in case there should be anything. I'm crouched. Mm -hmm. Look out! Look out! Huh? What's the matter? Didn't you see it? See what? Whatever made that noise. <laughs> that was pigeons. Scared the pie out of them. And I saw a shape. Shadows. Yeah, just a pigeon flying around. I don't believe it. I saw something big. Oh. Yeah, where is it then? Couldn't have gone down the ladder. Couldn't have jumped out of the belfry without busting its neck. Yeah, have your own way. Anyway, there isn't any bell up here. Exactly like I told you. So, you see, we had all this monkey business for nothing. You satisfied now? I heard a bell tonight. Yeah, of course you did. So did I. Well, where did it come from? Ain't no other buildings around for 20 miles. Yeah, looks to me like you deepened your mystery rather than solved it. Yeah. Look, look. Cobwebs all over the place. Ain't nobody else been up here for years. Anybody could tell that. 
Hey, Mayor, let's go back to the house to do our cogitating. I'm not what you'd call comfortable perched up here in this old belfry. Yeah, reckon we might as well go down. Yeah. Yeah. Glad that's over. I'd make a blamed poor monkey at my age. Come along. Now, where do you think you're going? Well, as long as I'm here, might as well look over the whole place. Mm, you sure are anxious to break a leg. You feel how springy these floorboards are? I'll we'll be able to give away any minute. We'll take a look behind the altar. Eh, yeah, what's back there? Yeah, it used to be the preacher's study. It was never used, though, after the old bell ringer committed suicide in there. Well, so, Mayor, I'd forgotten about that. Old Sammy Martin hanged himself, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, locked the study off and never used it after that. Of course I remember now. Fifteen years ago, if it was a day. It ain't locked no more, I don't reckon. Look here, Mary, I, I'm not so certain I like this. Like what? Well, we've got a dead bell ringer. Yeah? No, we've got a phantom bell. You think there's any connection? No. Are you? I hope not. Who ever heard of a doctor being scared of ghosts? Mm, I don't recollect saying anything about being frightened. I'm just putting two and two together. Mayor! Mayor! Oh. Where are you? Where's the light? Oh. Are you hurt? Oh, oh. No, I'm, I'm all right. Just broke through the floor and... Oh. Mm, hurt? Uh, Have you got the light? No. No, I just skin my shin blast this rotten place. But the light... Uh, here it is. I hung on to it. <laughs> My soul, what was that? Come from the study, didn't it? Yes, sounded so. Shh. Oh, that, that's, only, that's only the rafters. Here, here, help me pull my leg out of this danged hole. Well, wait a minute until I turn on the light. No, 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 leave it off. You sneak up on the study. What do you mean, sneak up? Here, give me your hand. There you are. Now, look here, Mayor. I've had enough for one night. I'm going to see what made that noise. No fat chance of sneaking up on anything after the crash you made when you fell. We'll sneak up to the door and throw it open. Yeah, and get shot for our trouble. No, no, we won't. We'll be lying flat on the floor. Oh, yeah. Yes. Then we'll wriggle into the room. Now, listen, I'm no snake. Then we'll wait until we hear a noise. You're crazy, Mayor. Yes, maybe so. Anyway, as soon as we hear a noise, we'll flash on the light and nab whoever's there. Hmm, just as easy as that. Come on now. Don't make a sound. Here's the door. Lie down flat. Right in front of the door? Yes. It swings in. I'm right alongside you. Well, who's going to open the door? I am. I've unlatched it. All i got to do is give it a push. Well, push. <laughs> what? Ow! Ah. Oh, great jumping seizure. What What was that, Doc? Oh, I don't know, but whatever it was, it ran the full length of me. Stepped on you? Stepped on me and dang near ground me into the floor. Stepped smack on my head. Are you hurt? Well, I don't feel any too good. Can you walk? Oh, of course. Yeah, well, our ghost oh. seems to have gotten away. Turn on the light. Let's get into the room and look around. Yeah, I could do with some light. There. Mayor, I haven't told you the worst yet. Huh? The worst? Yes, the worst. Mayor, whoever it was that ran over me didn't have shoes on. Look where his nails scratched my face. Oh, gosh almighty, Doc. Wasn't it a man? Well, I tell you, he was barefooted if it was. Gee, Rushi. It'd take claws to make scratches like that. Here, here, tie your face up with this, this handkerchief. It's bleeding. Mm, I hope you're satisfied. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I want to look around this study. Give me the flashlight. Mm, no limit to your curiosity. There it is again. Whatever it is, it's hanging about outside. Look! Look there, Doc. It's the bell rope. Bell rope? Yes, see it? That claw-footed man or whatever it is has been ringing the bell from in here. Look! Look where it disappears through the ceiling. Hmm, it's a new rope. Hey, Mayor, what, what are you doing? I'm going to ring that dang bell. Now, you want to prove to yourself that there is a bell, huh? Yeah, and of course there's a bell. I always knew there was. Well, go ahead. Pull it. My face hurts. I'll give it a yank that will pull the whole contraption down. Well, pull. Pull. Yeah, here goes. <coughs> oh, Mayor! Mayor! He's shot. 
It wasn't a bell. It was a trap. You have just heard the opening episode of The City of the Dead, especially written and produced for your sponsor by Carlton E. Morse. What is this clawfoot thing? What is the meaning of the phantom church bell? Why are Jimmy and Phyllis held prisoners? And finally, who shot Mayor Friday? And how and why? The mystery grows deeper and creepier next week with Chapter 2 entitled, I've Dug Up Something Ghastly. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like big adventure, come with me. If you like stealth and intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. But first, our sponsor, the City of the Dead. Midnight in October, a night when almost anything is liable to happen, and much already has. Old Joshua Friday, mayor of the City of the Dead, otherwise known as the caretaker of the old cemetery no longer in use, had just been mysteriously shot. The shooting took place when Mayor Friday pulled a bell rope in the little church ruins at the lower end of the City of the Dead. Old Dr. Tuner and the mayor had been led to the abandoned ruins in their search for the phantom toll of a church bell. They found no bell, just a bell rope. And when the mayor pulled it, he was shot. And now, back in the mayor's cottage at the other end of the City of the Dead. Earlier in the evening, Dr. Tuner and the mayor had locked up young Jimmy Parker and the girl, Phyllis Carroll, who had stopped there for aid when their parked car had been stolen from them by gunmen. But that was nine o'clock. It's midnight now, and Doc Tuner had carried the unconscious body of his friend from the old church back to the caretaker's cottage. Is... is he dead? Of course not. You think I'd lug a dead body through a cemetery at midnight? How badly is he hurt? Oh, I reckon it's just a scalp wound. Who shot him? I wish I knew, Miss Carroll. I reckon I'll do a bit of telephoning. But you told us you didn't have a phone. Did I now? You most certainly did. Yeah, guess that's just one of those things. But look here. Now, Parker, keep your shirt on. Just sit still and listen while I take care of things. Oh, so that's where you keep the phone. Yep. Long distance, please. Mm Uh-huh. Long distance? Uh, Listen, Central, will you get me Skyline 2020? Who is it you're calling? You know in good time. But... Hello? Hello, Captain Friday's office? Yeah, well, it's Captain Friday in. Good. Uh, hello, Captain. Uh, say, this is Dr. Tuner. Yeah, Doc Tuner. No, nothing much. Say, I, I'm down with your father in the city of the dead. Yeah. Now, listen, Captain, something's happened to the mayor. No, no, it's not his heart. He's been shot. No, he ain't going to die just to clip on the head. Yeah, I tell you, if it is serious. But look here, boy. There's something wrong down here. Something wrong, I say. Yeah. Could you come down for a week? Yeah, keep your mouth shut and come down. Good, that's the ticket. And be sure you don't talk. Yeah. Goodbye. Has Mayor Friday got a son? Yeah, Captain Friday, private investigator. Owns his own agency up in the city. And he's coming down here? He is, and he'll want to talk to you, too. When is he coming down? A couple hours. But why can't we call the city? Not until you talk to the captain. (gasps) Dr. Tuner, what on earth is that on your back? My back? Yes, there's a footprint on your coat. You don't say. Yeah, I'll take my coat off. What kind of a thing made that? Hmm, the same thing that scratched my face. Jiminy Crickets, what a footprint. Did someone knock you down and walk on you? Looks like it. Mm-hmm. Who ever heard of a barefooted man running around at midnight in a cemetery? Well, did he scratch you with his hands? No, with his claws. 
A man with claws? Well, look at this footprint. That's a human foot, all right, and a two giant claws at the end of his toes. Ooh. Well, did you see him? I did not. I felt him plenty, though. Yeah, did he shoot the mayor? Well, I reckon the story will keep until the captain gets here. Hello, that's the mayor. Well, is he coming, too? No, I reckon not. Good sign, though. Oh, I want to get away from this place. Doctor, how long are you going to keep us here? Well, that depends, Miss Carroll. That depends. Would you rather spend your time here or up at the city in jail? Jail? What kind of talk's that? What have we done to be sent to jail? That remains to be seen. We'll just sit right here and wait. Two o'clock. Oh, dear. There he is. That'll be him. Hello, Doc. Hey, Captain Friday, you made a quick trip. One of the traffic boys brought me down on his motorcycle. How's Dad? Just as I told you, not in the slightest danger. Still unconscious, though. Uh, this is Miss Phyllis Carroll and James Parker. Hi. How do you do? Company, eh? Well, in a way, maybe. Not company? What then? Out here. Supposing you sit down and hear the whole story. There's a deuce of a lot of nonsense going on out here. Fire away, but first you're sure the old man's okay. Yes, the wound is hardly a scratch. Just grazed him, huh? Mm. Okay. Go ahead with your story. Well, in the first place, there have been indications of marauders in the City of the Dead for the last three nights. Yeah? Footsteps on the gravel. Footprints the next morning. Once the mayor was certain, he saw one down among the graves. Mm-hmm. And then tonight, well, they, we heard a scream that had raised the dead, and then someone ran by the house sobbing as though scared out of his wits. Man? Mm, sounded so. The mayor slipped outside, and pretty soon he shouted to me to open the door, and he brought these two youngsters in. Well, well. And they swear they didn't make the noise. Did either of them look as though they'd been frightened? Mm, no, just nervous. They said they'd just been held up by two gunmen and their car taken away from them. Better and better. What next? Well, after they were held up and were walking toward the cottage here, they say this frightened man that the mayor and I heard ran past them. Did you get a good look at him? No, we got off the road and we heard him coming. No. Yeah. Too bad. And then they claimed to have come directly to the house here. They wanted to telephone the police in the city. And Dr. Tuna said there wasn't a phone in the house. What was that for, Doc? Mm, uh, let's pass over that for the moment. Uh-huh. Go on. Well, the uh, mayor and I took it into our hands to uh, well, detain these two young people. Locked them up? Well, yes, in a way. I handed business. Well, how do we know but what they're grave robbers? do. So. Ever rob a grave, Miss Carroll? No, sir. You, Parker? Do I look like a grave robber? There you are, Doc. Looks like you and Dad pulled a boner. Mm -hmm. Now then, what happened? Oh, we yes, I almost forgot about the phantom church bell. Don't tell me you've got a ghost mixed up in this. Well, these youngsters came in with the story of hearing a bell ringing down at the other end of the city of the dead. Down in the old church? Yes, but the mayor said there wasn't any bell there. This is beginning to have possibilities. Well, after we locked up these two, we went out to look around, and I'll be a son of a gun if we didn't hear a bell. Well, Captain, your dad's sort of impetuous at times. <laughs> Thanks after his son. I bet your money he dragged you down to the old church. He did. First up in the balcony, and then back to the old study behind the altar. Isn't that where that old fellow, what's his name, hanged himself? Yes, it is. Well, as we were creeping up on the room, the most ghastly moan you ever laid ear to came out of the study. Ah, the ghost. I was ready to come home by then, but the mayor insisted that we'd had something cornered and we ought to capture it. So we laid down on our stomachs and wiggled up to the study door. It was darker than the inside of a pirate's heart. And we were lying directly in front of the door, and the mayor shoved it open. And out popped the ghost. I wish it had been a ghost. Look how it ripped my face with its claws. Oh, that's how you got scratched up. It ran the full length of me, wailing fit to curl your hair. You don't say. It ran out of the building, and the mayor and I jumped to our feet, and your dad switched on his flashlight, and the study was empty. Naturally. But there was a new bell rope hanging through the ceiling. The bell? That's just what your dad thought. He gave the rope a yank, and someone shot him. Huh? But did the bell ring? I, blame if I know. I was so rattled, I didn't hear anything. I, I didn't wait. I grabbed the mayor up on my shoulder and didn't look back till I got home. Amazing. Offhand, how do you think Dad was shot? There are no windows in the study, as I remember. The no, there ain't. And I'll swear there wasn't anyone in that room but us. Could anyone have shot from the door? No, it had swung shut. And besides, the mayor had his back to the door, and he was shot from the front. Curious, sir, and curious, sir. Um, tell me more about this animal that gave you the trunk. Now here, look at that footprint on my coat. Does that look like animal to you? No. Barefoot man, what do you know? And look at those claws. 
I don't believe it, Doc. Mm, that footprint and these scratches are all the proof I want. Then I'm supposed to find a barefoot man with claws, a phantom church bell, a hysterical man, not to mention two auto thieves. More than that, I'm supposed to find out why two law-abiding citizens, one of them my own father, have practically kidnapped a perfectly respectable boy and girl. Mm -hmm. I reckon you'll be just as well off not to look into that bank or very close. Uh, oh, yeah, and there was something else. You know the mayor's got a sort of a half-wit gardener working for him. Oh, Lammy Fink? Mm -hmm. Is he figuring on this, too? Well, we found his cap down among the tombstones as we were going down to the church. Here it is. The mayor said he saw Lammy wear it home from work last evening, and it looks to me like Lammy was back in the City of the Dead last night. No, not Lammy. He's scared to death of this cemetery after dark. Mm, that's what your dad said, Captain. Now, that's the truth. I know Lammy. He wouldn't come near the place after sunset. Well, yeah, then explain the hat. Give me time, Doc. Give me time. I haven't been here a half hour yet. Look here, you two talk and talk. Aren't you going to let us call the city? Now, well, what about it, Doc? Going to let our young friends depart in peace now? No, look here, Captain Friday. We can't do that. I, I want to talk to you alone for a spell. All right, Doc, if you're ready to talk. Uh, you don't mind if Dr. Tuner and I adjourn to the kitchen for a little chat, do you? Come on, Doc. Well, it's like this, kids. Dr. Tuner has thrown new light on this business. Uh, suppose you tell me, Mr. Parker, who you are, what you do. I'm a student at the University of California, junior year. I see. Living with your parents? No, I have a room in a small hotel. What hotel? In Britain. Would you be missed if you didn't show up for, say, a week? Why, I suppose so. I see. What about you, Miss Carroll? I don't work anywhere. Live at home? With my mother. What's your address? The Brundell Apartments on Jackson Street. Any phone? Franklin, 7076. But, but you aren't going to keep us here, are you? Tell me this, Mr. Parker. How did you happen to come down to the City of the Dead tonight? Just driving. No ulterior motive. I mean, besides the moon and the girl. No. Well, look here, you two. You seem to have gotten yourselves into a mess. But no. Yes, wittingly or unwittingly. Now then, you have a choice. Either you remain here for a week and submit to being locked up nights and having a guard at all other times, or else I'll have to take you back to the city and have you locked up. We haven't done anything. Oh, that's to be proven. I can have the police hold you for investigation. Well, I don't understand it. I don't know what it's all about. You can't do this to us. Nevertheless, it's happening. Now then, which shall it be? I, I don't know what to say. I want to go home. Well, that's impossible at the moment, Miss Carroll. If you chose to stay here, I'll make it right with your mother. Likewise with your hotel party. Oh, Jimmy. We could get I... out on bail. Not on a held for investigation charge, you couldn't. Believe me, I'd advise you to stay. Jail's a rotten place to spend time. Oh, yes. Oh, please, let's stay here, Jimmy. All right. We'll stay. Good. I'll run up to the city in the morning. Probably get back tomorrow afternoon about five. You, you're going to the city to, to check up on Jimmy and me? Is there any harm in that? No. No, I guess not. That's fine. You two wait here a minute. I want a word with Doc Coon. Oh, Jimmy, darling, what have we got ourselves into? Well, get hold of yourself. I knew we shouldn't have come. I knew it all the time. Then the youngsters, Phyllis and Jimmy Parker, aren't so innocent of the night activities as they're pretending. What will Captain Friday have to report when he returns from the city? But first, our sponsor. Dr. Tuner, back again. Well, back from the city already. Quick trip, Captain Friday. Yep, sitting pretty. 
Oh, hello, Miss Carroll. Didn't see you in June. Did you see my mother? I did the first thing this morning when I got to the city. I left her not the least bit worried. But how did you explain? Don't give it a thought. Just settle down and have a good time while you're here. How's the mayor, Doc? Yeah, he came too just after you left this morning. He was feeling so rotten. I gave him a mild powder. Still sleeping. Did you tell him you brought me down here? Yeah. What did he say? No, he growled a little bit, but he's really tickled. He was. <laughs> Old son of a gun. Say, Doc, what time are you going to give us some dinner? Oh, in about an hour, if Miss Carroll here will give me a hand. Why, of course I will. Well, that'll give Parker and me a little time to look about. Like to come along with me, Parker? Why, sure. Good. We'll take a run down among the tombstones. See you later, Doc. It's been a long time since I had a good look at the city of the dead. Oh, that's all? Mm-hmm. Here, let's cut across this way. Where are we going? I want to look over the ground where the mayor and Dr. Tuner picked up Lammy Fink's cap last night. Did Lammy show up for work this morning? I guess not. I heard the mayor and Dr. Tuner talking about it when the mayor came, too. Doc promised to go over to Lammy's cabin and see what was the matter. Did he go? I suppose that's where he went. Anyway, he locked Phyllis and me up about noon and was away for a couple of hours. Yeah. Be careful where you walk and let me know if you find any footprints. Not that you're likely to find any on this graph. Captain Friday, what's it all about? Why are you keeping us here like this? Answer me one question, Parker, and perhaps I can answer both of yours. Well, I will if I can. What were you and Miss Carroll actually doing here at the City of the Dead last night? I told you. See, there you are. You won't play square with me. How can you expect me to be on the up and up with you? But I tell you, it was just an accident that brought us here last night. And I tell you, I think you're lying. Look, just because you're a private detective... Now, now, Parker, don't get nasty. If you don't want to talk, it's all right with me. I'll find out for myself eventually. In the meantime, our relationship can be pleasant or strained. However you want it. You won't find anything out about me. You took the trouble to look me up while you were in town. I did take the trouble. Well... I found you just what you purported yourself to be, a junior at the University of California. Likewise, Miss Carroll told the truth. Well, doesn't that satisfy you? Under ordinary conditions, I'd be willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. These are extraordinary circumstances. In what way? That remains to be seen. Oh, just a minute, here we are. Dr. Tuna said they found the cap just a little to the left of old Lady Gregory's grave. If I remember, that would be right over there. You mean you know every one of these 10,000 graves by heart? <laughs> well, not all of them. I got a pretty good idea of the lay of the land here. You see, when I was a kid, this was my playground. What a curious childhood. Yeah, that's the grave, all right. Now then, supposing we do a little looking around. Exactly what do you expect to find? I don't know. Look here. If Lammy Fink was here among the graves after dark last night for some diabolical reason, and believe me, it would take the devil and a legion of his assistants to get him here, there must have been a reason for him leaving his cap behind. And you expect to find out what took him away in such a hurry that he didn't have time to stop for his cap? No, it would help. Say, don't you suppose the fellow that ran by us sobbing was Lammy, do you? I've been wondering if it couldn't have been, since I heard about this cap business. Sounds like something Lammy would do. Found anything? No, sir. You? Yep. Rather what I expected to find. What? Well, what was it? I don't see anything. You don't, huh? Come on, I've come on, I've come to see. Let's get back to the cottage. Doc will be having supper for us by the time we get in and cleaned up. But what was it you saw, Captain Fry? You'll find out soon enough, Parker. Don't push me. I'm not much for going off before I'm primed and loaded. I promise you this much, however. This is going to be the biggest night this cemetery's had in a lot of years. you've had your supper, Mayor. Don't you think you better turn in? You look sort of peaked. Yeah, not on your life. I ain't gonna spend much time in bed from now on until I catch the fellow that shot me. Well, that's what I'm down here for, Dan. I'll catch my own gunman, young fellow. Yeah, you probably will at that. Now, but look, now that we're all gathered around in one big family, yeah. what do you say to a little intimate chat? 
Uh, about what, particularly, Captain? Well, for instance, what about Lammy Fink? Nothing. What's that mean? I said there was nothing about him. He wasn't home. You mean he's moved out? No, he just wasn't around. Clothes, food, and the likes were all there. Oh. Well, that's something. Maybe Lammy was down in the City of the Dead last night, after all. Eh, don't believe it. Been down to the old church yet, son? No, not yet, Mayor. Trip to the city took most of the day. Did have a look around the place where you folks picked up Lammy's cap, though. Find anything? I did. Yeah, you did? What did you find, boy? Before I tell you, I want to ask Miss Carroll a question. You mind, Miss Carroll? What? Why, of course not. Good. What would you expect to find if you opened the grave? Why do you say that? Why do you look at me like that? Say, what are you trying to do? Suppose you keep out of this, park. An asinine question if I ever heard one. Yeah. Perhaps you'd like to answer the question yourself. Uh, sure. Offhand, I'd say a corpse. Mm -hmm. Not a half bad guess. Somebody evidently wasn't quite so certain. Look here, Captain. What are you getting at? That's what I say. Somebody evidently wasn't quite certain just what one does keep in a grave. Uh, what do you mean? Somebody opened one down in the City of the Dead last night. Opened a grave? What? Robbing a grave in my city? Buy it under Dad, Dad, take it easy. You know anything about it, Miss Carroll? Why, no. No, of course not. Anything to say, Parker? Do I look like a grave robber? Besides, how do you know a grave was opened? So where the turf had been carefully cut about the edges and then replaced. It was old Ernie Morton's grave, Doc. Ernie Morton's grave, eh? Think of that, Mary. Think of anyone wanting to disturb poor old Ernie Morton's bone. I'll have somebody's hide for this. Thought we'd go down this evening and see whether the ghouls carried Ernie away with them. Here's the grave. Yep, this is the one, Mayor. Strip off your coat, Parker. You and I are going in for a little heavy exercise. I'm to help dig? That's the idea. Hey, see here, the sod's all loose. We'll lift it off first, and then it can be replaced. Ah, uh, the ghouls who did this knew their business. That's a neat job, huh, Dad? Oh, excuse me, Parker. Oh, no, keep out of your way. It is a neat job, but that, eh, Mayor? Yeah, too neat. If you take an expert to cut up the sod as perfectly as this and replace it in this manner... Know anyone who could do it besides yourself, Dan? Any landscape gardener could do it. Here, Parker, pile a sod like this so we can fit it back together when we get through. Could Lammy Fink do it? Lammy? Why, of course he could. Yeah. So I thought. But, but look here, son. You can't make me believe Lammy'd come down here and open a grave himself. Hey, listen to that, Captain. Church bell, all right. Yeah. Coming from down toward the old church, too. Looks like I'm going to have to take a run through the ruins tomorrow. Yeah, go through in the daytime. No godly man would ever go in there at night. The mayor and I know, don't you, Mayor? Yeah. Now, enough of the heavy work, Parker. Here's a shovel. You work at this end, and I'll work at the head for a while. When we get down a foot or two, we'll have to work in relays. There won't be room for us both. I'm not used to this sort of thing. You're not, huh? What about those blisters on your fingers and the palms of your hands? Blisters? Certainly. You don't suppose I'd overlook your hands, do you? Well, I didn't get them digging up bodies. Looked to me as if they were made by a shovel. Suppose they were. Well? Why don't they stop ringing that bell? Getting on your nerves? Yes, it is. What about those blisters? Well, I'm working my way through college, if you must know. So? Got a job gardening. What's the use of lying? It'll only make it worse for you. I'm not lying. Uh, here, rest a moment. Get your breath. Yeah, you're making good headway. Down about a foot and a half already. Yeah, the dirt's still loose. It's easy to you. Yeah, don't you want me to take a hand at shoveling? No, Doc. You'd creak under the weight of a shovel full of dirt. Mm, thanks for nothing. <laughs> You know, it's been 20 years since we laid Ernie away. Do you remember it, Mayor? Yeah. It was storming to beat the deuce. There wasn't anyone present except you and me and the two grave diggers and the fellow that drove the hearse. Yeah, yeah, Doc, I remember. 
One of the grave diggers had to keep bailing out the grave until we could get Ernie into it. Did you help bury all of your patients, Dr. Tumor? Every last one of them. Sort of a little courtesy, if you get what I mean. I saw them through life, saw them safely tucked away in the ground, and now I sort of watch over them while they sleep. Now, go to it, Parker. If you got your breath, you take a shift down in the hole, and then I'll follow you. Yeah, sure, but... But... Well? Well, suppose I dig into something. That'd be awful. Well, suppose you do. Sing out, we'll walk them down and take a look. I don't like it. Good full moon tonight. Yeah. I never stood around on one foot in the graveyard at night before. It does give a fellow the creeps, don't it? Get into Molly Grubble? Mm -hmm. You begin to see things. Bless my soul, did you hear that? That's it. That's it, son. What do you mean? It's the claw-footed man. Claw-footed man? Huh? I don't see anything. There. Over there. There's something white moving. <laughs> it disappeared. Oh. Listen. Captain Friday. Captain Friday. What is it? What's the matter, Parker? I've dug up something ghastly. His dead arm is reaching up to me. You have just heard the second episode of The City of the Dead. Written and produced by Carlton E. Morse. What was it that Jimmy Parker uncovered in the grave? What was the phantom at which Captain Friday shot? What will the old church ruins reveal by daylight? Come with us next week when you will hear the third episode entitled The Body That Walked Off. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. Eight o'clock at night in October. The second night in the City of the Dead. Three men stand on the edge of a partly opened grave. A fourth stands in the grave itself, whispering, I've struck something. Something awful. That was Jimmy Parker. The three men above him on the brink of the grave are Joshua Friday, mayor of the City of the Dead, otherwise known as the caretaker of the old cemetery. Dr. Tuner, now retired from practice, since he has buried his last patient here in the city. And third, Captain Friday, son of the mayor, a private investigator. A grave had been tampered with, and tonight it is being reopened officially to discover why. First, Captain Friday would dig, and then Jimmy Parker would dig, and it was Jimmy who uncovered the dead arm, reaching up. There's something else you should know about Jimmy. He and his girlfriend, Phyllis Carroll, are virtual prisoners of the mayor, Doc Tuner, and Captain Friday. In fact, at the moment, Phyllis is locked in the bedroom assigned to her up at the mayor's bungalow just inside the cemetery gates. Jimmy and Phyllis themselves are under slight suspicion of grave robbing. But just now, Phyllis is locked up, and Jimmy is down in the grave with something horrible. Just as Parker whispered his discovery, there was a hair-raising wail from among the gravestones. It disappeared, Captain Friday. You must have hit it. I didn't hit anything. I fired into the air. Dr. Tuner. Mayor Friday. Everybody. I tell you, I dug up something. What's that? You're crazy, Parker. You won't hit the coffin under four or five feet. I have struck something. It... It's an arm. Jumping G. Horsifer. Are you lying, Parker? Let me turn my flash down in the hole. I tell you... Hey! Didn't you ever see a dead man before? Let me out of here! Let me out of here! Grab him, Doc! You get on! No! Let me go! Let me get away from here! 
You shouldn't have hit him so hard, Captain. Yeah, when he comes to, he won't have any more hysteria than your grandmother. Yeah, you're a tough customer, I'm afraid, my boy. Sure, why not, Mayor? That's part of the game. Yeah. Lay him out here on the grass. He'll be around presently. Well, he wasn't far off. He struck something pretty ghastly, all right. But, son, that ain't Ernie Martin's body. Sure it isn't, Dan. Ernie died a natural death 20 years ago. This man was murdered last night. Do you mean that, Captain? You're a doctor. You should know. Here, take a look at his face. Strangled. Strangled. Not long ago, either, was it? Not more than 24 hours. Here, hand me the shovel. I'll finish uncovering the body, and we'll take it up to the shed behind the cottage. Did you recognize him, Doc? No, I didn't, Mayor. It isn't anyone I ever saw before. Wasn't Lammy Fink, then? My jiggers, I never thought about him. Let's have another squint at that face, Captain. I looked especially, Doctor. It isn't Lammy. Lammy has a deep scar at the roots of the hair on his forehead. There's none on this fellow. No wonder somebody ran by the cottage and out of the city of the dead in hysterics last night. You think maybe it was the murderer we heard, Captain? No, not likely. Why not? Anyone with the courage to commit murder in a graveyard isn't likely to have a case of hysteria. Besides, anyone as frightened as that wouldn't have stopped to bury his victim and replant the turf on the grave. Then where does the hysterical man fit in? I don't know, but I can give a guess. Let's have it, son. Uh, Maybe some passerby who saw something he wasn't meant to see. Perhaps the murder. Ran out of the city of the dead, scared out of his wits. Yeah, we don't have passerbys way off down here, son. Oh, we'll have to see. Yeah. Now, I think we can lift the body out. Here, Doctor, can you reach the arms? Yeah. Good. Up we go. There it is. Up we go. Unhappy business. <laughs> You're not nervous, Dr. Tooney. Yes, I am, Dad. Blame you, whatever. Oh, it's perfectly okay with me, Doc. Dad, you got a stretcher around someplace, haven't you? In the shed behind the house where you got the shovel. I'll run up and get it. No fun carrying a body around in your arms. Keep an eye on young Parker. Shall I fill in the grave while you're gone? Don't touch anything. I want to examine that grave by daylight. You just wait around. I won't be long. Say, Mayor, do you know what I think about this whole business? No. How should I know what you think when I don't know what to think myself? Why in tarnation should anybody dig up one man's grave to shove another one in it? Well, I'll tell you what I think. I've got an idea that someone else has got onto the trail of what we've been after for years. You think that's what's at the bottom of all this? Yes, I do. Uh, Mayor, I, I told the captain all about this. Then you broke your word, Doc Tudor. We promised to never say a word. Well, it was necessary, Mayor. It was the only way I could make him keep Parker here and that Phyllis Carroll prisoners. Besides, he's your own flesh and blood. Uh, he's that, all right. Is he going to help us? Well, he wouldn't promise. The only thing he agreed to was to hold the kids a week to find out whether they knew anything about how you came to be shot. You think they know anything about... about... the other? Well, of course they do. Uh, think they were responsible for this killing? Well, I don't know. The girl was mighty anxious to keep away from this grave tonight. The boy held out better, but you saw how hysterical he got. That looks suspicious. So it does. So it does. Still, they don't fit into the picture right. There's something more to it. They couldn't have rung that phantom church bell we've been hearing... Neither could one of them been the claw-footed men that tromped on me in the old church. They were both locked up in the cottage at the time. Could have friends helping them. Yeah, it looks like a gang, all right. Looks like two gangs. Else why the murder? Jupiter, Mayor, if they're out after the same thing we are and want it bad enough to commit murder... Yes, I've been thinking about that. Well, I'm not telling anyone I know anything. You already shot off your mouth. The claw-footed man again. Look. Look, see him, Mayor? I'm going after him. No, don't do it, Mayor. Don't do it. Look. Look how he bobs and floats among the grave. Oh, let loose of me, Doc. Let loose. Come on, we can catch it. Hey, we're getting everything. Do you hear that bell? Save your breath. We're gaining on it. Run faster. Well, why don't you shoot, Mayor? You got your pistol, haven't you? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, I forgot all about it. I'll stop a minute and we'll take a crack at it. Jumping Jupiter, Mayor, where did it go? I dropped it. That's what happened. You know you didn't. You didn't fall. It just vanished. Wait and see. Cut across the lawn here, but don't walk on the graves. It was right ahead. Here you are. Now where's your claw-footed man? Uh, probably just wounded him. Maybe dragged himself off. Well, we'd have seen him, I tell you. He just plain vanished. I tell you, I dropped him. All right, all right. Hi, but where... Doc, what's happened? Listen. 
Where are you? Hi, Doc Cooner. Here's the captain. Hiya, Captain. Here we are, coming. Dad, all right? Yep, he's all right. Hey, where have you two been? Where's the body? Body? What body, Captain? A body we just dug up. Look here, son. You ain't fooling us, are you? Of course I'm not. You mean to tell me you don't know where it is? Yeah, look here, Captain Friday. Let's get this straight. Ain't the body lying beside the grave where we left it? It is not. You're sure it's gone? It's gone, all right. What have you two been up to? We was chasing that clawfoot fella. He came right down here close by and let off a whole series of whales, so we took after him. Got away, huh? Yep, vanished when the mare took a shot at him. I hit him. The mare thinks he hit him, or it, or whatever it is, but it was gone when we got to the spot where it vanished. And while you were out chasing ghosts, the strangled body got up and walked off. I thought I told you fellas to watch young Parker. And what's happened to him? He got up and walked off, too. Oh, well, come on, let's go back to the grave. Yeah? Did he take the body? How should I know? And Parker got away? He did not. As I came out of the shed with the stretcher, I heard a noise in the house. I peeked in the window and saw young Parker releasing Phyllis Carroll. Left the key in the door, didn't you? Well, thought it'd be safe enough. What was the boy's idea? Well, it looked as though they were trying to make a getaway. Hmm. Trying to run away. That looks bad for him, eh, Captain? Hmm. Ah, right, here's the grave. Still got the hole left, anyway. Hmm, empty, all right. I wish we'd have caught that whaling critter. Might have solved everything. Who ever heard of catching a decoy? Decoy? Sure, Dan. Looks like your whaling ghost wanted you to chase him. Wanted to get you out of the way. But why? Mm, likely we weren't supposed to examine the corpse. Probably its identification would have solved the whole business. Sure, I hadn't thought of that. Well, what's to be done? We're going back to the house and see what Parker and Miss Carroll know. I've got him locked up in his room again. Miss Carroll, Captain Friday wants to see you in the living room. What's happened? Never mind. Go on into the other room. Come on out, Parker. The captain wants to see you. What rights he got slugging me and locking me up this way, even if he is Captain Friday? Well, you'd have gotten worse if you'd tried to make a break out of a jail. Now go on in the other room. Well, we'll see about these high-handed methods. Go. Oh, come on in, Parker. Sit down. You think you're pretty smart cracking people on the jaw. Don't sit there. Come over here, away from Miss Carroll. Why shouldn't I sit by Phyllis? Oh, please, Jimmy, do what he says. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's better. Now then, Parker, what did you do with the body? Body? Yes, Miss Carroll, we found the body. Too bad, isn't it? Body? What body? The body somebody planted in old Ernie Morton's grave last night. Oh, Jimmy. We don't know anything about anybody. Be careful, Phil. They're trying to frame you. Oh, so we're trying to frame you, are we? Tell me something, Miss Carroll. Yes, did you see Parker the day he got his job? What job? You know, the gardening job, Phil, over at the university. Oh, oh, that. Why, uh, why, no. No, I didn't see him that day. Let me see. What day was it he got this job? Why, uh, why... No, no, look at me, Miss Carroll. Don't look at Parker. That's better. Now then, when did Jimmy tell you he got that gardening job? Why, I... I've just forgotten. Sometime last week, I think. He told you about getting the job, did he? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, well, Parker. So you told Miss Carroll about the job last week, huh? I don't know what you mean. Well, then I'll explain. Didn't you tell me you got that job two days ago? Yes. Then how could you have told Miss Carroll about it last week? This is Saturday. That would have been at least a week ago. What about it? Oh, come on now. Admit it. You haven't got a gardening job and you never had one. Isn't that the truth? Well, Answer me. You haven't a job, have you? No. no. Then how did you get those fresh blisters on your hands? Oh, Jimmy, I'm sorry. No, that's all right, Phil. It wasn't your fault. Never mind, Miss Carroll. Answer me, Parker. How did you get those blisters? I... I was... You got them opening a grave, now, didn't you? How can you even think of such a thing? Answer me, Parker. It's none of your business. None of my business whether you go about strangling folks? Oh, he didn't. He didn't kill anyone. Oh, Jimmy, tell them the truth. The truth? Phyllis, what are you talking about? Yes, Miss Carroll. What are you talking about? What? Well, well, oh, I've been so upset by all this. Oh, Jimmy, I want to go home. <laughs> Oh, so Jimmy Parker and Phyllis Carroll are up to their chins in this after all. But what are a good-looking young woman and a college boy doing mixed up with grave robbing and murder? And, but, 
More in just a moment. Dr. Tuna, take Miss Carroll to her room and see if you can quiet her. Yeah, yeah, no, Miss Carroll. You'll feel better after a good night's rest. Now then, Parker, let's have the truth. I haven't anything to say. I'd guess you have plenty to say. You lied about the blisters. You tried to escape after we discovered a murder victim in Ernie Morton's grave. And on top of that, now the body has vanished. We've got a lot of explaining to do. I tell you, I don't know anything. Phyllis urged you to tell the truth. What was she talking about? She was scared. She didn't know what she was saying. She did know what she was saying. What did she mean? I don't know. Yeah. Why did you try to escape after you saw the body? I wasn't going to stay here and be beaten up by you. That wasn't the reason. Something about that body terrified you. Now, what was it? It, it was just a dead body. I never saw a murdered man before. That wasn't it. Something about that body got under your skin. Did you murder that man? No, I swear I didn't. I swear it. Did you recognize the body? No, no, of course I didn't recognize it. Yes, you did, Parker. The moment you saw that face, you let out a yell. Oh, please, Captain Friday, please let us go. Don't you understand? Can't you see? Can't I see what? The same thing will happen to all of us if you keep us here. We'll all be murdered. How do you figure that out? I know it. I know it. Wouldn't you be in just as much danger if I let you go? Oh, no, really. The danger's here, Captain. The danger's in the city of the dead. What do you mean by that? What danger? A murderer. What murderer? There's someone in the city of the dead that intends to kill everyone who knows... Who knows what? I can't tell. I couldn't if I wanted to. How long have you known of this... This murderer? Since I saw the body. And you did recognize it? Yes. Who was it? I can't tell you. Now, look here, Parker. If you are in as much danger as you say you are, I should think you and Miss Carroll would want protection. But it isn't only us. Don't you understand? You're in danger, too. So is the mayor and Dr. Toomer. What's that? I tell you, it's true. They won't stop at anything. They? Is it a gang? No. No, I don't know. Huh. So you won't talk to save your own life? No. Isn't there anything that would make you talk? Will you let me talk alone with Phyllis for a little? Then will you tell us what we want to know? If she's willing. But she's already begged you to tell. She doesn't know all I know. Oh, I see. In other words, you want to tell her the name of the murdered man. I didn't say that. Hmm. Very well, I'll let you talk to her. Hey, doctor. Yes, Captain? I'm going to send Parker in to see Phyllis. Is she all right? Oh, sure. She's all right. I gave her powder. You want her to come out? No, I'm giving Parker here five minutes with her alone. Go on in, Parker. Yes, sir. Let him shut the door, Doctor. It's just five of ten. You got till ten o'clock. Yeah, right in here, son. Okay. Oh, Jimmy, what's it all about? How did we get into all this trouble? Look here, Phyllis. We've got to face it. There's something horrible going on in this place. But you said it would be all right. You said all we'd have to do would be to come down here and dig the... Shh, be careful, Phil. I may be listening. But why do we have to be careful? Why don't you tell everything? Phyllis, do you know who that was we dug up tonight? You... You mean the body? Yes. Oh, please. It wasn't anyone I know. It was, Phil. I'm sorry. Oh, oh Jimmy, who was it? It was your cousin, Bert Arnold. Oh, no, Jimmy. Please, don't cry, Phyllis. I'm awfully sorry, but you just had to know. Oh, but I... Oh, I just saw Bert yesterday. Who oh, would want to kill Bert, Jimmy? Look here, Phil. I think Bert was down here for the same reason we came. Oh, but how did he know? I... I thought I was the only one who knew. I don't know how he found out, but it looks to me like he did know and someone killed him while he was nosing around down here. Oh, Jimmy, this is awful. Awful. What are we going to do? I don't know. Whoever killed Bert is probably out after us, too. Oh, Jimmy, don't say that. You might as well face it. Have you any idea who it could be? Oh, no. No. Any relatives? Well, mother's the only relative I've got, besides Bert. Any distant relative that might have found out something in some way. 
Oh, I don't know. No one I know of. Oh, please, why can't we tell Captain Friday all about it? What do you suppose he's going to think if we tell him what we came down here for and then told him the murdered man was your cousin? Oh, I don't know. I do. He'd think we killed him. Oh, but we didn't. We didn't. Oh, of course not, but... Well, if you want me to tell... Mm, not, if they, not if they'll think we killed him. Well, they will. You can count on that. Well, then we mustn't tell. We mustn't... Oh, I don't know what I'll tell Mother. You'll be lucky not to get kicked out of the university for this. Oh, shh, listen. Come on out, Parker. Time's up. You won't tell. You won't tell, will you, Jimmy? No, fellas, but listen. If you hear anyone trying to get into your room, yell. Don't wait a minute, do you understand? Oh, what do you think? Come on out of there, Parker. Coming. Remember what I say, fellas. Don't take any chances. Good night, Phil. Be careful, Jimmy. Sure. Well, here I am. Yeah. You ready to talk? No. Oh, it's that way, huh? Yeah, that way. Then go on into your room. But let me tell you this, Parker. If you don't come through with me, and mighty soon I'll take you into San Francisco and throw you to the cops. You'll be only too glad to talk. I'll go on to bed and think it over. Did you lock both doors, Captain? Right. And I'm keeping the keys to both Parker's and Miss Carroll's rooms with me. Are there any more keys to those two bedrooms, Mayor? No. Those are all, son. Hmm. Well, it's quarter past ten. I'm turning in. It's going to be heavy work from now on. <laughs> but, Captain, do you think we might be in any danger? After all, a man has been murdered here. Well, who can tell where danger is? Doc, you and the Mayor double up in the big bed in the front room. I'm going to make myself comfortable here on the lounge beside the fire. Now, now look here, son. You won't be comfortable there. Do what I say, Dad. I'm going to boss things around here for a while. Yeah, you know, jack and apes turn you across my knee. <laughs> Good night. Outside of the house. Hey, are you sure? Yeah, of course. Hurry. Right. Is, is Phyllis all right? Yeah, I made sure of it. Everyone's asleep. What are we going to do? Find out who it is. Isn't it a man? Well, if it is, he certainly got himself rigged out. You've seen it? Yeah. What does it look like? Well, by moonlight, it looks like a cross between the headless horseman and one of Shakespeare's witches. Come on, fella. Aren't you almost ready? Right, just a minute. One more shoe. Well, here it is. Get into it. Oh, thanks, why are you ringing me in on this detective business? I thought I was a prisoner. Well, if this fellow's hanging around for a chance to murder you, as you seem to believe, I just thought I'd give him a chance at you. You... you don't really mean that. Well, you know what I mean. All right. Hang right on my coattail and you won't be in any danger even if this fella is after you. Come on. All right. He seems to be patrolling around the house. We'll watch here at the window until we spot him, then we'll slip outside and lay for him. Where did you see him? I watched him circle the house twice. Look, look, there he comes. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what is it? Can you see his face, Parker? Look sharp. Yeah. Now, long hair strangling down all over his face. Hey, look, it's crouching down. Looks like an animal that scents its prey. Look in the shadow there. There's something else moving. It's coming out in the moonlight. A man. He's coming toward the house. He doesn't see that crouching thing. Hello. The fella's going around to the back of the house. The thing's following him. He doesn't see it. Did they go around the corner? Come on, we gotta see the end of this. Easy now. There. Leave the door on the latch so that we can get back in fast if we have to. Mm -hmm. Follow close. Just a minute. Here, let me take a peek around the corner. It's all in shadow. I can't see a thing. We'll have to take a chance. Come on. Softly. Hold it. I'll give it. 
give a look around this corner. Now we'll get some moonlight in the back of the house. See anything? Wait. Look at that, Parker. What's happening? Somebody's working on the bars to your window. The murderer, I told you. Yeah, but where's our pet ghost? He seems to have vanished. Look, a man's cutting the bars. We'll put a stop to that right now. But I hate like the deuce to make a move in the open until I know what's become of our long-haired phantom. Maybe the thing spotted us. Well, you keep a lookout behind. <laughs> there it is. Keep down, keep down. Where? I don't see it. Crouched in that shadow right behind the man. He doesn't know it's there. I wouldn't have that thing. Oh! Look out, it's killing him. It's killing him. Don't let him get away. I missed. It's gone. Quick, run for Dr. Tuner while I see if the fellow's still alive. Yeah, but I do what I tell you. Run. Dr. Tuner! Dr. Tuner! Dr. Tuner! Doc! Hey, Dr. Tuner! Dr. Tuner! Hey, what's your matter? Who is that? What's your matter? Is that you, Doctor? Another man's been murdered. Captain Friday wants you. Where is he? Back in the cottage. Come on, I'll show you. All right, around this way. Hey, who's been killed? I don't know. All I know is somebody's been murdered. Hey, not so fast, boy. Give an old man a break. Right down here, you can see the body in the moonlight. Hurry. Hurry, Doc. Here. Yeah. Here's the body. But where's Captain Friday? Maybe chasing the phantom. I don't know. Here, let's turn this fellow over on his back. See if he's still alive. Take it easy now. Uh-huh. Uh, what do you mean, boy? This body is Captain Friday. Captain Friday? And where's the other body? You have just heard Chapter 3 of City of the Dead. Why is it a corpse in the city of the dead vanishes almost as quickly as it is made? Why is this phantom creature haunting the vicinity of the caretaker's cottage? And what's happened to Captain Friday? All this will unfold next week in the fourth episode of City of the Dead, entitled Old Clawfoot Again. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Eight o'clock on Sunday morning, the second day in the City of the Dead. Eight o'clock in the morning after a night of unearthly events and sudden death. And it all seems to be centered about the caretaker's cottage at the gate of the old abandoned cemetery. Those present include the caretaker himself, better known as Mayor Joshua Friday, Dr. Tuner, retired, all his patients are laid away in the City of the Dead, Captain Friday, son of the mayor, and private investigator from San Francisco, who has come down to the City of the Dead to help his father fight grave robbers. The only persons caught in the net so far are Jimmy Parker, a nice-looking college boy, and his girlfriend, Phyllis Carroll. At two o'clock this fog-choked winter morning, Captain Friday was roused from sleep to find a phantom-like white-robed figure, its face covered with long, white flowing hair, patrolling about the caretaker's cottage. Yes, I awakened Jimmy Parker, and the two of us slipped out of the house and around the corner just in time to see the phantom creature leap on the figure of a man, who at the moment was attempting to break into the cottage. The man died instantly under the gleaming knife in the creature's clawed hand. Before Parker or I could stop it, the thing had gone. Yeah, Captain Friday and I rushed to the scene, but the housebreaker was dead. Captain Friday sent me back into the house for Dr. Tuner. I wasn't gone more than a couple of minutes, but when we got back... Not only was the murdered man gone, but Captain Friday was lying on the ground, unconscious. And a peculiar thing. All the time this was happening, Mayor Friday's been missing from the cottage. But now it's eight o'clock the next morning, and Phyllis is telling what she saw. 
I tell you, I saw it all from my window. You were awake, Miss Carroll? The scream of that man outside my window awakened me. You mean the man that was murdered? Yes. Who was he, Captain Friday? I don't know. He was trying to break into Parker's room when the family ghost jumped him. It sprang on his back like an animal and was gone quicker than a flash. Stabbed him in the back. He was dead when I reached him. That's what I heard. I jumped out of bed and I looked out through the bars of my window. You were just bending over the body, Captain Friday. Well? I didn't know what had happened. It was too dark to tell who you were. Then all at once I saw two shadows creeping up on you from behind. Two? Yes, there were two. Suddenly I heard myself scream. I heard you. That's what brought me to my feet just in time to get that crack on the side of the head. That's funny. Dr. Tuner and I didn't hear a scream, did we, Doctor? But where did Dr. Tuner go? Said he was going to walk around while he smoked his after-breakfast cigar. Well, anyway, we didn't hear Phyllis scream. Well, I did. I must have frightened the men. They didn't wait to examine Captain Friday. They just grabbed the body of the murdered man and ran. Did you see the face of either of my attackers, Miss Carroll? No, I, I was too frightened to notice. Captain Friday, did you find out where the mayor was all this time last night? What difference does it make, Parker? What? Nothing, only... Well, Dr. Tuna thought it rather peculiar. Did, huh? Well, there seem to be a lot of peculiar things going on around here. Do you think that ghoulish killer we saw last night was a man in disguise? Uh, at least it was human. You didn't really think anything could actually look like that, do you? Oh, Jimmy, let's not keep still any longer. I'd rather go to jail right now than spend another night here. Phyllis, keep still. If you're part of this gang of cutthroats... Oh, we're not. We're not. Look here, Captain Friday. If we tell you everything, will you let us go? I can't promise that. Well, will you take us away from the City of the Dead? You indicated last night that the presence of you and Miss Carroll was aggravating the situation. That it was due to your being in the City of the Dead that all these murders are taking place. No, no. Oh, we're only part of the, a part of the cause. I see. Well, you see how it is. If I let you two slip through my fingers, my only tangible clue to the whole business will be gone. No, you've got to stay here. You can't keep us here. We'll be killed. You saw what happened last night. That fella cut through the bars of my window. They'll try again, and next time they'll get me. I know they will. You needn't worry about that. I'll fix the windows so they'll be murder-proof. Now, are you going to tell me what it's all about? Oh, Jimmy, let's tell him. Please, Jimmy. We can't be any worse off than we are now. Well, then I'll tell you. I'm going with Dr. Tuner and the mayor over to Lammy Fink's cabin this morning. After that, we're going down to the old church. I'll lock you two up together and you can thrash the thing out. But mind you, I expect an explanation tonight. Oh, yes, but put us together. I couldn't bear to be alone in this horrible place again. You understand, don't you, Parker? I'm not promising anything. So much the worse for you if you don't come through. Oh, Captain. Captain Friday. Hello, oh, now what's up? Hey, Captain Friday. No, I can tell you what you suppose has happened. Find another corpse, Dr. Thru? No, I didn't. But that grave we opened last night has all been filled up and the sod put back on it. Don't look as though it had ever been touched. Filled up, huh? Now, there's an idea. Graves automatically opened and closed while you wait. I tell you, Captain, this is no laughing matter. Something bigger than the mayor and I ever figured on has broken loose. Hey, where is the mayor, anyhow? Catching up on the sleep he lost last night. Where was the mayor last night, Captain? Don't you know? I swear I don't. Oh. You were supposed to be sleeping with him. If you don't know, how should I? I didn't even know he'd left the bed until Parker came in and woke me up. Mm. I swear I didn't. You don't think old Doc Tuner and your own dad would hold out on you, do you, boy? Nothing's funny somewhere. Uh, now I want you and dad to go over to Lammy Fink's place with me. I don't see what good dad'll do. After that, we'll run down to the old church ruins and see if we can find out who took a shot at dad night before last. Yeah, I've told you all I know. Uh, maybe. Well, you don't suppose we'd have brought you down here in the first place if we'd had anything to hold back, do you? I'm not supposing anything. I'm putting facts together. Doc, go right out to Mayor and we'll be starting. How far is Lammy Fink's house in the City of the Dead, Mayor? Uh, just a hop and a jump. But it ain't a house, son. Just a shack. Look here. You can see it down among the trees. Building himself at odd times. Hmm. Gloomy place for a house. Looks more like a hunted animal's hole. Yeah, he acts like a hunted animal most of the time, don't he, Mayor? Yeah, he's a little off, all right. Uh, I'd rather sleep in the city of the dead than down in this hovel. <laughs> Not Lammy. He's graveyard shy after dark. Oh, well, this is it. Hmm. Lammy thinks residence. One room, one door, and no windows. And a cellar. Cellar? I didn't know about that. Never even thought of a cellar when I was over the other day. Well, then that's the first place we'll look. 
Go ahead, Dad. You know the way. Lean on. Yeah, there's no need to lead. This here path leads around the house to cellar steps. All right, keep going. Uh-huh. Here's the steps. Seem to get down under the house. I'll lead off with my flashlight. When I get to the bottom of the cellar steps, one of you follow, then the other. And take it easy. Those steps don't look any too solid. Do they? they ain't. It's dark and murky down there. There I go. Watch out you don't break your neck. Well, these steps won't hold much weight. Hey! Captain! Captain! What a rat trap this turned out to be. Son, son, are you hurt? Hello. Hello down there. Captain, are you still alive? Yes, of course I am. I've lost my flashlight and it's black on an old man's future down here. Light a match. We'll give a man a chance to pull himself together, Doc. Still got two or three steps around my neck. Uh, can we help? As soon as I unscramble myself. Hey, what's that? Hey, Doc Tuner, Mayor. I'm holed up down here with a body. Uh, who is it, Captain? How do I know? We just met here in the dark. Well, why don't you light a match and find out? We can't get down to the cellar without a rope now that the stairs are busted. How'd you happen to find it? It just reached out and lay hold of me. Jiminy Cricket. There. I'm on my feet again. Now for a light. Well, I'll... Hey, there are two... Oh, three. Doc, Mayor. There are three bodies down here in this cellar. Watch it. What did he say? Did you hear me? There are three bodies down here. Now, Dr. Tuner, I want you and Dad to come on down into the cellar with me and examine those bodies. One of them is Lammy Fink, all right enough. One of them is the strangled fellow we dug up, and the other is the man who was stabbed to death last night. Yeah, if you know so much about him, why should we go down and look at him? I want to see if you know either of the unidentified bodies. I'd bet money I don't, but come along, son. What makes you think you don't, Mayor? Trying to get something on your father, boy. Never mind, come along. Careful on the ladder. There you are. Now, over this way. Look out for those boxes. All right, I'll hold the torch for you. Here they are. Three bodies laid out side by side. Yes. It says Lammy. Poor old fella. How do you suppose he died, son? I can't find a mark on him anywhere, Dad. But get that look of terror on his face. You mean he was scared to death? Take a look for yourself. How long has Lammy been dead, Doctor? Mm, well, at least 36 hours. You certain of that? Well, that's fairly accurate. Then Lammy Fink couldn't possibly have filled up the grave we opened last night. He could not. And who did do it? Dad, you said that you and Lammy were the only ones capable of doing an expert job of replacing turf on a grave. Yeah, I said it all right. Well, Dad? Must have been wrong. You mean there's someone else around the City of the Dead who's capable of such work? Looks like it, don't it? Well, never mind. Mayor, did you or Dr. Tuner ever see either of these other two bodies before? I mean, while they were alive? Not me, Captain. I don't know nothing about them, boy. That's darn funny. I've been through their clothes. Not a thing to identify them. Listen. Footsteps. There's someone in the shack overhead. Shh, just a moment. Who's that, you suppose? There's somebody up there, all right. Come on. We'll go up after him. Take it easy. We don't want to frighten him off. Up you go, Doc. You next, Dad. Yeah. Come on up, Captain. Everything's clear. Yep. There. Here, I'll pull the ladder up, and then no one's likely to bother the bodies while we're away. Captain, I smell smoke. That's it, smoke. I knew I smelled something. Look, look, the cabin's on fire. Quick, we gotta stop it. Come on around the house, quick, get water from the creek. Look, 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 they are holding mackerel in a blaze. Hey, somebody set that fire. The house has been saturated with oil. Look at that black smoke. But where's the fellow we heard walking around? He's probably a mile away by this time. Of all the cockeyed, lunk-headed fools. Now we've lost those bodies. But couldn't we still get him out? That cellar was a furnace 30 seconds after that fire was set. There goes that can of kerosene I saw in the cellar. 
That ends that. But why in tarnation did anyone want to burn down Lammy's shack? Ask me a hard one, Doc. Somebody doesn't want us to know who's being murdered. Dead men can't talk, especially after they've been cremated. But there is still the contents of Ernie Morton's grave and old clawfoot down in the abandoned church. But more of that in a moment. We've been dawdling, Captain Friday. It's almost one o'clock already, and we promised the mayor we'd meet him at the cottage at two. Well, there's the old church just ahead. Yeah, gloomy as ever. You know, Doctor, this place has always given me the creeps. Even when I was a kid. The mayor never brought me here unless it was to arrange for a funeral. Well, that's about all it was ever used for, as far as back as I can remember. Funerals, and now and again a country wedding. This is the first time I've been near the place since it was abandoned. But I remember the day they found the old bell ringer hanging by the neck in the study. Well, I always did think the place was infested with... Uh, with what? With, well, with something ghoulish. <laughs> That's a nice thought. And our visit night before last only went to confirm my opinion. You mean the claw-footed man? Oh, he was only the climax of the whole business. I tell you, the place absolutely reeks of something unhealthy. Oh, uh, it's probably the bats. Uh, plenty of them here. Well, shall we go in? From the slant of that roof, I'd say the whole place would be tumbling in in another year. Careful. The mayor went through the floor the other night. Gloomy as the inside of a grave in here. There. Don't you feel it? Feel what, Doc? The moment I stepped in here out of the sunshine, I felt something come over me like a slimy wet cloak. Don't you get it, Captain? You give yourself the creeps if you keep that up. All I get is an unpleasant smell of mustiness and decay. The place is rotten to the foundation. Yeah, there's something more than a physical rottenness here, Captain. I smell something else. Yeah? I tell you, I do. Well, shall we go back and have a look at the old study? That's where the mayor was shot, wasn't it? That's right. That's where we ran into the claw-footed man or beast or whatever he is. Did you leave the doors shut when you carried the mayor out the other night? I did not. I was too scared. I just picked up the mayor and dashed through. The door was still open. Well, it's shut now. Oh, by Jingo, that's right. Do you suppose that thing's in there now? I got my gun handy to pot him if he is. You better not stand in front of the door. You'll know what happened to me last night. You stand at the side of the door. I'm going to block the way. Don't be a fool, son. You're liable to get hurt. Not while I've got this little plaything in my hand. Yeah, I warned you. You ready? Go on. Open the door and get it over with. Captain, are you hurt? What in the Sam Hill kind of a thing is that? I'm a bald-headed liar if that jack-in-the-box didn't kick me in the face. Are you hurt, Captain? Are you all right? Here, let me help you out. Of course I'm all right. Why shouldn't I be all right? That was a nasty fall. Fall. That claw-footed old boy with his white beard knocked me down and walked the full length of me. Look at me. It's dusty footprints all over my front. Oh. Did I say I was going to block his path? I got one good look at him. An ugly critter. Flowing white hair. A face that looked like a death man. I've seen him before. He's the chap that murdered the housebreaker last night. I wonder who he thinks he is in those long white robes. He's crazy as a gooey duck. Say, hey, we'll need some kind of a light in this study. Oh, I still got my flashlight. Yeah, turn her on. Yeah. How's that? Good. Yep. Great jumping G Horsefat. Captain, look there on the floor behind you. Skeleton. Human bones. All laid out in order. Laid out is right. Looks like old Clawfoot was in here reconstructing a skeleton. Where do you think they came from? The bone? Hmm. Probably out of one of the graves in the City of the Dead. Hmm. Nice person, old Clawfoot. I don't care for the company he keeps. He's crazier than I thought. Imagine a guy shutting himself up in a dark room to play with a human skeleton. Yeah, it looks like we're going to have to do some close inspection on the mayor's graves out yonder. This seems to indicate that grave robbing has sort of become a practice down here. I told you something unhealthy was going on in this place. Hmm. Well, old Clawfoot never lacked for company. Whenever he got lonesome or downhearted, he just up and digs himself a skeleton to amuse him. Hey, here, Captain, where do you suppose this old fool lives? Hmm, offhand, I'd say he'd been making this his headquarters. There's no sign of a place to sleep here, and there's no food. Well, that's something I'll we'll have to look into. Oh, now, Doc, 
Where's this bell rope the mayor was pulling on the night he was shot? Right there, Rick. It's gone. Gone? Where was it? Well, it hung right down there where you're standing. Mm Mm-hmm. Look at the ceiling. No hole in the ceiling for it to come through. Well, there was a rope. Much more, he just pulled it and he was shot. And you're certain the door was shut at the time? It certainly was. Anyway, the shot came from across the room. Mm. Mm, No window. Are you certain there was no one else in the room with you two? Well, of course there wasn't. Where'd the shot come from, then? The same place the bell rope's gone to. Uh, <laughs> what in Tunket does he do that for, going around making noises like a sick cat? Well, we've seen the last of him today. Can we try to grab him? <laughs> Don't you think we'd better finish looking over these ruins? What more is there to see? Well, you haven't been up in the belfry yet. Well, climb that rotten ladder? Not me, Doc. Well, and Mary and I did it, and in the dark, too. Well, that was your own funeral. You can see with half an eye that you two are the only ones who've been up there in the last ten years. Look at the dust and dirt and the cobwebs. Come on, we spent an hour in here. That's enough. I want to get my hands on that fella. Come on, it's one o'clock. We told the mayor we'd be back by two. All right, anything's better in this place. Well, come on out in the sunshine and get it out of your system. Oh, where is our sunshine? Fog, if that ain't the luck. First afternoon fog we've had this season. That puts an end to hunting old Clawfoot. Yeah, miserable stuff, Fog. Gets in your nostrils, wets your clothes, hides murders. <laughs> Come on out of it, Doc. You'll feel better when you had your lunch. Let's go back to the cottage. You gonna leave that skeleton in there? Why, yes. You don't want to pack it around with us, do you? Yeah, you jackass. <laughs> as well off there as anywhere until we can find the grave it was taken from. Perhaps that's old Ernie Morton's skeleton. We'll dig in his grave this afternoon. Oh, there. There you are. There you are. Oh, thank goodness you've come at last. Captain, come in the house quick. Come in here. What is it, Dan? Mary, you're as white as a ghost. Well, if I'd have had a gun handy, I'd have shot that fellow where he stood. Shot who? What are you talking about? Come on in. Hurry up. You too, Doc. You'll have to tend to the girl. Girl? You mean Miss Carroll? Here, shut the door, Doc. That Parker feller stabbed the girl. He killed her, too, if I hadn't arrived just when I did. Stabbed Phyllis Carroll? So he did. Wait a minute, Dan. Did you see him stab her? Just as I come in the house, I heard a scream. I rushed in and unlocked the door. And there she was, lying on her face on the floor. Parker was standing over her with this bloody knife in his hand. Where is the girl? In her room. Go on in and see what you can do for her, Doc. She's unconscious. Go ahead, Doc. Hmm. Tell me how she is as soon as you can. All right. Now then, Dad, where's Parker? He's locked in this closet. The bars on the window to his room's cut. And I wasn't taking any chance of losing him. Well, let him out. Let's see what he has to say. Parker said he didn't do it. Catch him! What in blazes? Is he dead? Dad, you've smothered him in that closet. Get me some water. Hi, Doc, come here. What's the matter? Get a move on. Now, what's the matter? Hello. What's happened to Parker? Smothered in that little closet. Now, his heart's still going. Hmm. Yeah, he's going to be all right. Just a faint. Mayor, throw a little water in his face. Yeah. Yeah. There he comes. Here you are, boy. Drink a little of this water. He's going to be fit in a jiffy. Girl's not in any danger either. Flesh wound and a little blood, that's all. Air. Let me out of here. Give me air. He's all right now, huh? Go back to the girl. She'll be around in a few minutes, too. Air. Where where am I? You're all right now, Parker. Here, can you sit up? Give me a hand, man. We'll get him in the chair. All right. Yeah, how's that? All right. What'd you want to do, smother me? Yeah, you had it coming. What'd you mean, stabbing a girl? I didn't. I told you that before. I saw you. You saw me stab Phyllis? I saw you with a bloody knife in your hands, bending over. You'd have finished her off if I hadn't rushed into the room. You old fool. That talk won't do you any good, Parker. Now, what's your version of this affair? Well, Phyllis and I have been talking for about an hour. Talking about what? Whether we should tell you all of, all we know. Did you decide to talk? No. Hmm. Huh. Did you quarrel? Well, she turned her back on me and called me pig-headed. She was insistent on talking and you refused, huh? Yes. You know that what she could tell might get you in serious trouble, is that right? I suppose so. So you decided to stab her to death to prevent her talking? No, no, it isn't so. That's so. And what did happen? You won't believe me. You bet I won't. Hold it, will you, Dad? Well... Go on, Parker. Well, 
And when she turned her back on me, I walked away. Went over to the dresser and put out my cigarette in the ashtray. Your back was to her? Yes. Suddenly she screamed. I turned just in time to see her fall with a knife in her back. Likely story. I told you you wouldn't believe me. Go on, I haven't said I didn't believe you, Parker. Then what happened? I was so confused, I don't hardly know what I did. I guess I dashed over to Phyllis and bent over her. I don't remember pulling the knife out of her back, but I suppose I did. Because I know I had it in my hand wondering where it came from when Mayor Friday rushed in and grabbed it away from me. Wondered where it came from. Well, I didn't have any knife. How could I have done it? Knife might have been in the room. You recognize it, Dan? No. Parker could have smuggled it in with him. He's had every opportunity. Well, I didn't. How is the girl standing? Facing the door. Hmm. I would have put her back to the window, wouldn't I? Yes. And if you were at the bureau, you couldn't have seen a window, I don't suppose. No. With the shade and window raised? Well, the shade was. I don't know about the window. Hey, Doc. Huh? Is the window up in there? Yeah. Here up. Well, there's a possible out for you, Parker. A good knife thrower could have sent a knife through the bars of the window without any trouble. You think that's what happened? I'm not thinking anything. I really say it's a possibility. Well, I didn't do it. Think I hurt the girl I'm engaged to? People will do strange things to save their own skins. So you're engaged to Miss Carroll? Well, practically. What does that mean? Well, we kind of got an understanding. Uh, you asked her to marry him? No. How does I... In other words, you said that about the engagement because you thought it would be a point in your favor. Look, Parker, you better stick to facts or you're going to get yourself in one fine mess. Well, I intend to ask her. I don't know whether you do or not. Uh, Captain, come in here. The girl's coming, too. Come in and give me a hand. Come on, Parker. Come on in here, Captain. Help me with her. I've got her all bandaged. Oh, Oh. Ain't you ashamed of yourself, Parker? You let me alone. Keep still, both of you. <laughs> yeah, there, there. You mustn't cry. Just lie perfectly still. <laughs> oh, Phyllis. Are you all right? Jimmy. Yes, Phyllis, I'm here. Oh, Jimmy, why did you stab me? Why did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> In the midst of the desperate happenings in the City of the Dead, has Jimmy Parker turned on his own companion, Phyllis Carroll? And what about the phantom claw-footed killer and the desecrated graves? Who is disturbing the dead? And what do they expect to find, save moldering bones? Listen next week to the fifth episode of Carlton E. Morse's City of the Dead, entitled, The Skeleton Walks In. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. Eight o'clock on the third night in the City of the Dead. In the afternoon of the second day in the old abandoned cemetery, Captain Friday had locked Jimmy Parker and Phyllis Carroll together and had taken his father, the mayor, and old Dr. Tuner to Lammy Fink's cabin on the edge of the cemetery. They had found three bodies in the cellar. One was the strangled body found in old Ernie Morton's grave. The second was the body of the man whom the claw-footed phantom had killed at the back of the mayor's cottage. The third was Lammy Fink. According to Captain Friday, he'd been scared to death. That's right. And while we were in the cellar examining the bodies, the cabin mysteriously burst into flames and we barely escaped with our lives. The bodies were completely consumed. 
After this experience, the old mayor, my father, complained of being tired and returned to his cottage inside the gates of the City of the Dead. Dr. Tuner and I went down to the deserted ruins of a church to look for the phantom church bell. In the musty rectory where the bell ringer had hanged himself ten years before, we found old Clawfoot amusing himself with a human skeleton. But the queer creature with flowing beard and flowing robes got away from us. Returning to the caretaker's cottage, we found my dad upset and Phyllis Carroll with a stab wound in her back just under the shoulder blade. Jimmy Parker had been locked in the room with the girl at the time, but he denied the deed. Then Phyllis regained consciousness and sobbed out, Oh, Jimmy, why did you stab me? That was at two in the afternoon. Now at eight in the evening, Dr. Tuner is with his patient. Dr. Tuner, am I going to die? <laughs> I reckon you aren't even going to be very sick, Miss Carroll. Just lost your mind of blood, and the wound won't even leave a scar. Feel much better after a little sleep, don't you? Oh, I've been asleep. Well, sure you have. Here, let me fix that pillow. Uh, Lie on your left side just a little. Uh, that leaves that sick shoulder of yours. Look mighty pretty in that outfit, Miss Carroll, with the firelight playing on you. Oh, I must look terrible. I've been crying so much, but... <laughs> Not a bit of it. You look like a young girl should look. Oh, Dr. Tuner, what would make Jimmy do a thing like that? No, no, you'd better let Captain Friday figure that out. That's his business. By the way, he wants to bring Parker in here as soon as you feel like it. Oh, no, please. I I can't face Jimmy after... after well, he... I reckon that'll be necessary, Miss Carroll. Do I have to see him? Can't be helped, I'm afraid. Well, all right, then. Good. We'll have him in now and get it over with. Captain Friday and his father have Parker in his room giving him a going over. I'll, I'll just call him. Hi there, Captain. That's you, Doctor? Miss Carroll's ready to see you next door. Good. Come on out, fella. Come on, Mayor. I'd rather not see Phyllis tonight. You know, what you want hasn't got anything to do with it. Go on in there and sit down. Okay. Have it your way, then. No. I want you facing the girl. Sit in that straight chair. Yeah, if I'd have known he's going to be all this rumpus, I'd have said take him to the city and lock him up from the first. Never mind, Mayor. We'll get things straightened out for you in the city of the dead. I know the reason why. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Parker? No, I'm not. I suppose you only regret that you didn't kill Miss Carroll outright, huh? Oh, Jimmy. You look here. I didn't stab Phyllis. How many times do I have to tell you? Miss Carroll says you did. Well, I didn't. You said he did, didn't you, Miss Carroll? Yes. You see, Parker? I'd like to hear her tell how I did it. Well, I haven't any objection to that. Miss Carroll, do you mind? Oh, how could you, Jimmy? And all the time I thought it was you and me against everyone. Phyllis, how can you even think... Never mind, Parker. Tell your story, Miss Carroll. Well, we were talking... Tell us what you were talking about. I I wanted to tell you everything we know about all this. I, I wanted to take a chance that you would help us out of a bad situation. Jimmy said no. He said that we... Go on. He said the circumstantial evidence was too strong against us. That we might... You might well, what? We might be found guilty of murder by our own words. Oh, let's see. And you wanted to take a chance and tell anyway. Yes. I thought if we told everything now, we'd have a better chance than if we waited for you to find out for yourself. Good deduction, Miss Carroll. Well, then what happened? Well, we talked and talked, and and then I got angry. I turned my back and walked toward the door. Then, Miss Carroll? And then Jimmy stabbed me, and I fainted. No. No, Phyllis. No, I didn't. But it must have been you, Jimmy. We were locked in the room alone. It had Just to a be... minute. Miss Carroll, is that your only reason for believing Parker stabbed you? Why, yes. Did you see a knife in the room previous to the attack? No. Did you see Parker walk towards you or know that he was approaching you before the blow was struck? No. Did he say anything just before you fainted? What? Why, no. Of course not. Then all you know is that you were stabbed while locked in the room with Parker, and for that reason you suppose it was he that had done it. Well, but how could it have been anyone else? Didn't you ever hear of a knife thrower, Miss Carroll? You mean... You mean somebody threw a knife at me from the window? Why not? Wouldn't have been the first knife tossed through a window. <gasps> well, then it wasn't, Jimmy. Then you didn't. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so ashamed. Phil, I didn't do it. Honestly, I didn't. Why, of course not. I know you didn't. Oh, Jimmy, can't...
Can you ever forgive me? Of course, Jill. It's all right. Here, take my handkerchief. Oh, I've been such a fool. Forget it. But I've been so miserable. Oh, Jimmy, I, I felt so bad I could die. It made me sick, Phil, when I found out you thought I'd done it. I... I just couldn't believe it. Oh, I didn't want to think it, Jimmy. But, but, well, I didn't see any other way out. All right now, Parker, come on back to your chair. Your hands aren't clean in this business yet. Oh, of course he's innocent. It's silly even to think of it anymore. Silly, huh? Well, then listen to what the mayor has to say on the subject. Go ahead, Dad. Don't want to be dragged on, on murder trials. Come on, Dad. Now, don't get temperamental. Don't sass me, young fella. I don't care if you are a detective. Use my son first. Look, Mayor, do you want this business cleaned up or don't you? Well, I was coming up on the porch after returning from Lammy Fink's cabin where I left you folks. Yes? Heard a scream. Girl's voice? Naturally. Seeing how does Miss Carroll. All right, then what? Well, I ran into the house and unlocked the door where them two youngsters been locked up. Yes? And there was this fella Parker standing over the girl with both his hands bloody and he was holding a knife. Well, what of it? Naturally, my hands would be bloody from pulling the knife out of Phyllis's shoulder, wouldn't they? That sounds pretty thin. Why wasn't you doing something for the girl instead of just standing over her with the knife in your hand? Well, I was... I was so stunned by what had happened, I... I didn't know what I was doing. It looks mighty funny to me. Well, I can tell you some other things that look mighty funny, too. Why did you lock Phyllis and me up the first night? Where were you last night when old Clawfoot was roaming around? Why did Dr. Tuna here say you didn't have a telephone the first night we came? There's plenty for you fellas to explain, too, if you ask me. Captain, take that kid out of here. Take him out. Now, Dad. Take him away, I say. Lock him up down at the city. Do anything you got a mind to, but get him out of my house. You all fired presumption of kids in this day and age, huh? Now, 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 look here, Mayor. You haven't any call to be belligerent. You've been picking on him all evening. Picking on him? Picking on him? He's guilty, ain't he? I'm not so certain myself, Mayor. Well, I am. And after all, Mayor, you haven't explained to us where you were while the Phantom was murdering that fellow at the back of the house last night. I don't reckon I'm beholden to any of you. I'm Mayor of the City of the Dead, and if I take it on myself to go down into the city among my citizens, it ain't anybody's business but my own. Of course not, Dad. Now, let's just forget all this quarreling and see if we can't untangle some of these threads. Yeah, I'm agreeable, Captain. In the two days I've been here, one thing stands out. There's some force at work in the City of the Dead. What you mean, force? Some group or groups of people acting in their own interests down among the graves. And I'd just like to lay my hands on them. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are three possible places from which this force may originate. Three? Yes, Dr. Tuner, three. First, there's this clawfoot phantom of ours. You know he's a murderer. Didn't we see him kill the fellow at my window? He killed him, all right. What we don't know, however, is whether or not he's the force working against us. If he is against us, why did he attack the man who was trying to break in and disturb us? By Jasper, Captain, you mean Clawfoot's working with us and again the enemy? Uh, I don't know. Now then, the second source of this dangerous force may originate outside the City of the Dead. Yes, that's it. That's it, it's an outside force that wants something here in the City of the Dead and is willing to murder every one of us to get it. How do you know that, Parker? Why, I'm pretty sure of it. Why? Well, oh, I don't know, I, I just think so. Well, never mind now, that'll keep. Let's get back to the original question, the source of our danger. I've named two, Clawfoot and an outside gang. I suppose I don't have to tell you the third source from which this force may be emanating. Well, I reckon you'd better. I don't follow you, Captain. Yes, go on, son. Quit your intimating and come out straight. I see you get what I mean anyway, Dad. All right, here it is. There's a fine chance that this malignant force we're fighting originates right in this little group. You mean someone here is a murderer? It's quite possible. Horse feathers. Why do you say that, Parker? Well, if you're trying to put the blame for all this business on Phyllis and me, you're out of luck, that's all. Why do you think I was accusing you? There are others in the room. Well, you wouldn't be likely to accuse your own father of the murder. No. And you've known Dr. Tuner all your life. Supposing I have. And that leaves only Phyllis and me. You can easily remove yourselves from the suspected group. How? Talk. How do you know it wouldn't put us in deeper than ever? Oh, Jimmy, no, it won't. Captain Friday will understand. We ought to tell Honestly, we should. I don't think so. Don't be stubborn, Jimmy. Please let me tell. I don't like it. Please, Jimmy. Please. You can't keep a thing, can you? Jimmy, you know better than that. You know I'll never say a word until you give me permission. But it's the same as... Oh, go ahead and tell it. After all, it's your story. Jimmy, don't be angry. I've thought and thought about it. And, and any way I look at it, we'd be better off than we are now. 
You know what would happen to us if they found us guilty. But they couldn't do that. I know they could. How do you know what a jury would do? Very well, Jimmy, if that's how you feel. Well, go ahead and tell the whole thing. Maybe I'm all wet. Doesn't make much difference anyway. They're bound to find out if they keep looking. That's right, Miss Carroll. We're bound to find out. Oh, I don't know what to say now. Supposing I get us into a, into a lot of trouble. Well, go ahead, Phil. Anyway, we're in up to our neck as it is. Well, please, could I have a glass of water first? Yeah, of course you can. Shoulder hurting you? Not too much. Just a numb ache. All right, here. Here's a glass. Thank you. Now, well, we're ready when you are, Miss Carroll. Well, I, I guess I should tell you first that I've known Jimmy Parker since I was six years old. He lived right across the street from me for ten years. Should know each other pretty well. Oh, yes. We went to grammar school together and then to high school. In his senior year, his folks moved back east and Jimmy went with them. I didn't see him for a year then until he came back out here to attend the University of California. That explains how he happens to be living in a hotel. Yes. Well, now that you know about Jimmy and me, I, I guess I'd better go still further back. To my grandfather. My mother's folks. His name was Dr. Theodore Beverly. And he was... What? What did you say? What? Why, I said my grandfather was Dr. Theodore Beverly. Well, I swan. You hear that, Mayor? You mean Ted Beverly? Beverly that used to live on Van Ness Avenue before the San Francisco fire in 1906? Oh, yes. Yes. Do you know him, Mayor Friday? What are you doing down here in the city of the dead? Why, I... I said, what are you doing down here? Captain, Captain, these youngins are up to no good. No good, do you hear me? Pack of thieves and cutthroats, that's what they are. If you'd just hold your horses, Mayor, you'd hear the reason why Phyllis and Jimmy are down here. Or would you? Are they, after all, the thieves and cutthroats the old caretaker wants us to believe? Personally, I have my doubts, but we'll know better in just a minute. Hold on, Dad. Give Miss Carol a chance. I don't like it. I don't want her down here. I don't want her nor nobody else. Never mind that, Mayor. Now, go ahead, Miss Carol. Well, before the 1906 fire and earthquake, my grandfather was a very wealthy man. He had a beautiful home on Van Ness Avenue with lawns and shrubbery and servants and... <laughs> Oh, just everything, I guess. You're right there, Miss Carroll. I've seen your grandfather's place, and it did have everything. All this part is just hearsay to me, you know. It was all over before I was born. Well, anyway, I learned just lately that Grandfather Beverly had a yen for collecting black pearls. Yeah, listen to that, Doc. You hear what she says? Black pearls. Yeah, I reckon I heard all right, Mary. Yes, black pearls. Before the fire, he had one of the finest collections in the world. It was worth about a half a million dollars. That's a lot of money, Miss Carroll. It wasn't for my grandfather, Captain Friday. He was very wealthy. Anyway, the fire came and destroyed his business and wiped out his home and left him just a little bit out of his mind. He never quite recovered from the shock. What happened to him? Oh, he lived for a long time after that. I remember him when I was a very small child. He, he was austere and gruff, and he walked with a kind of stoop. He always acted as though he, he had something awfully important on his mind. Yep, yep, I remember that characteristic. He used to have the habit of staring right through folks. Mm, give a person a creep. Yes, well, what finally became of him? He was drowned. At least he disappeared, and about a week later, a body was taken from the waterfront, and the police identified it as my grandfather. But Mother was never sure. Wasn't sure, huh? No. She kept looking for him for two years, but it was no use. The body was finally buried out here in the city of the dead, and things settled down to normal again. Your grandfather left you and your mother quite wealthy, I take it. Oh, no. Hardly anything. Only a little insurance. Well, what became of his business, all his money? I don't know very much about it. I was too little to understand while he was alive, and and everyone's awfully vague about it now, but, but everything seemed to melt away without him to handle it. Well, that might easily happen to a man's business, Miss Carroll, but it couldn't happen to anything as substantial as a half a million dollars worth of pearls. What became of them? 
We never knew. Until quite recently. Then you know now? Well, we... I... Well, answer, answer. What's the matter with your tongue, young woman? Look here, you don't have to talk to her like that. Mind your own business, Parker. Say, what's the matter with you anyway, Mayor? You act like you were sitting on a keg of dynamite. I reckon the mayor's just a mite interested in Miss Carroll's story, that's all. Got a mighty funny way of showing it. Now then, if everyone has had his say, we'll go on. Miss Carroll, you do know where the black pearls are now. Well, well, I know what became of them. Who told you? Why, why, no one told me. Then how did you find out? Is that the reason you're down here in the City of the Dead? Yes, Miss Carroll. How did you find out about the black pearls at this late date? I had a birthday the 6th of last month. It was my 20th. Yes? On my birthday, I received a little package from Cartwright, Hobson, and Cartwright. The lawyers in the city, you know. And in the package was a letter from the firm saying that they were delivering a sealed package given them on the date of my birth by my grandfather. Yes? Were the pearls in the package, Miss Carroll? Why, no, Mayor Friday. It was much too small for that. It was just a big letter of instructions. Instructions for what? Telling where the black pearls actually were. Oh, I see. Oh, I was awfully excited. I called Jimmy at his hotel over in Berkeley and had him come over right away. Just how many persons did you let in on your secret? I didn't tell anyone but Jimmy. What about your mother? No, not even her. I wanted to keep it from her until I could be sure it was true. So Parker here was the only one you confided in? Yes. Well, what did your grandfather's letter say? It said that this letter was written to protect my future in case of his... my grandfather's death before I reached the age of 20. It said that my mother was his favorite relative and that he'd always intended that the collection of black pearls should go to her first child. That's you? Yes. I was the only child born to my mother. How many children were there in your grandfather's family? Three. Two boys and my mother. Are they living? Uncle Robert may be alive. He disappeared after Grandfather's death, and we haven't heard from him since. Uncle Franklin and his wife are both dead. Did they leave any children? Yes. One son. What's his name? Bert Arnold. Where is he now? What? Why, I... Dead. (laughs) What's that? I said he was dead. Murdered. It was his body you found strangled in old Morton's grave. Gosh, you old hemlock, Mayor. And I can guess who did it. I'll do the talking, Dad. You mean the murdered man was this girl's cousin? The only known living relative that might dispute her ownership of the Black Pearls? That's what I said. No wonder you didn't want to tell. The three of you down here in the City of the Dead alone at night. One of the three found strangled in an old grave, another of you with fresh blisters on your hands. And the motive? A half a million dollars worth of Black Pearls. You see, Phyllis, it's just as I said. Try to make a detective see light with all that evidence against us. Oh, but Captain Friday, we didn't do it. We didn't. What could your cousin have wanted in the City of the Dead? What? Well, I suppose he came for the same reason we did. And what was that? To find the Black Pearl. In the City of the Dead? Yes. Where? Bill, don't tell him. That isn't necessary. I'll let that go for now. Uh, But look here, son. I think you ought to make him tell where those pearls are hidden. I thought so. I'll bet you've known about them all along. That's why you're so anxious to keep everyone out of the city of the dead. So you could hunt for them by yourselves, you and the doc. Now, now, don't you go bringing me into your ruckus. I'm sitting on the sidelines. Captain, if you don't make that young and stop accusing me of things, I'm going to lambaste him. Leave the mayor alone, Parker. Yeah, he started. Never mind. Now, Miss Carroll, did you bring Bert Arnold down here with you the night he was murdered? Why, well, well, I, I, I don't know what night he was murdered. Didn't catch you, did you, mister? No. Now, I'll put it this way. Did you bring him down to the City of the Dead with you the night Parker's car was stolen? No. Did you know he was down here, that he was coming down? No. Honestly, we didn't. Now then, you say the Black Pearls are buried here in the City of the Dead. Yes. Oh, no. That was a rotten thing to do. Let the pearls alone. They belong to Miss Carroll. Well, well. So the pearls are buried in one of the graves in the City of the Dead. She didn't say that. She didn't need to. No wonder the City of the Dead has come alive by night. I wonder how many people in the world know about this. Oh, probably a very few, Captain. The whole city of the dead had been dug up and redug by now. Half a million dollars ain't to be sneezed at. Those pearls belong to Miss Carroll no matter who finds them. That can they belong to the one who has them. Well, Mayor Friday, if you aren't the lowest old codger... Quiet, Parker. Miss Carroll, that letter of instructions from the law firm, where is it? What? We what? burned it. That's a lie, Parker. Hmm. Prove it. You'll be glad enough to bring it out when you go before a jury for murder. You don't think I killed Bert Arnold. 
You know you don't. And what's more, you don't think I stabbed Phyllis. You'd be surprised what I think. Do you know of anyone else who might have reason to stab her? There's somebody else mighty anxious not to have her tell what she knows about those pearls. Who? If I knew, there wouldn't be any mystery. By the way, Mayor Friday couldn't throw a knife, could he? He had the opportunity. Are you, young whippersnapper? I... Hold it, Dad. That's enough out of you, Parker. Go on into your room. But what about Phyllis? Never mind about her. You get into your room before you get yourself in more trouble. Afraid to look into your own father's actions too closely? Is that it, Captain? Get into your room, Parker, now! Okay, okay, never mind the strong arm stuff. Dad, I want to talk to you and Doc Tuner out in the kitchen. Miss Carroll, you'll be all right here for a few minutes. Oh, yes, I, I'll be all right, I guess. Well, if you feel uneasy or need anything, you just sing out. Come on, Dad, in the kitchen. Yeah? What for? What's this all about? I think you know. Close the door, Doc. You and Doc Tuner have got to face it. Let's get it over with. You'd think I was your prisoner instead of your father. Now then, Dad, what's it all about? Huh? What's what all about? Come on, come on. Why all this mystery with me? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You know plenty. And if it's on the level, why can't you trust me? Ain't nothing to trust you with. You and Dr. Tuner here have known about those black pearls all along. I knew Doc was making a mistake when he confided in you. Oh, you did, did you? Don't you suppose I know why you haven't been down in the City of the Dead to look for graves that might have been tampered with? I wouldn't stick my nose in where it ain't wanted if I was you, son. You've been opening the graves yourself, you and Doc. Fine pair you are. You with your talk about being mayor of the City of the Dead and aiming to see that none of your sleeping citizens shall be disturbed. No, no, Captain. And you, Doc, with your pretty talk about coming down here to visit your old friends and patients. Yeah. And all the time you've been digging into grave after grave for those black pearls. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? You ain't got no right to talk to your father like this, Captain. I suppose you both know you could be sent up for the rest of your natural lives for this. I don't reckon you'd do a thing like that, Captain Friday. I ought to. Captain, you're hurting your father mighty deep talking that way. Well, what's he doing it for? Good heavens, man. He's got a trust here. He was put here to see that these sacred mounds of earth were not violated. And what has he done? Broken faith. Opened the graves himself. I reckon you see now, Doc Tuner, why I didn't want to bring nobody else into the City of the Dead. Captain, don't you reckon you better go a little easier on the mayor? Why should I? Well, after all, he's your father. Of course, I know you didn't have any part in the things young Parker keeps hinting at. <laughs> Thanks. Grave robbing is bad enough in itself without adding murder to it. I reckon, son, if that's all you got to say, I'll be turning in. Now, listen here, Dad. There's something more behind all this. You aren't disturbing the dead just for those pearls. There is something else, isn't there? I can you had us lined up about right at the beginning, son. Doc and me are just a pair of skunks. Look here, Doc. I reckon your dad is right, Captain. Ain't no more use to discuss those things. <laughs> That's Miss Carroll. Something's happened. Come on, you two. <laughs> Miss Carroll, what is it? What's the matter? Oh, look! Look there by the door! Well, I'll be a son of a gun. <laughs> look, Doc, a visitor. A skeleton. <laughs> Captain, what's that thing doing here? Where did it come from, Miss Carroll? What's that thing now, now, Miss Carroll, I don't reckon a skeleton can hurt you much. Supposing you tell us how it got there so we can do something about it. Well, the door just suddenly opened and the skeleton walked in and collapsed on the floor. And then the door was full closed. <laughs> Dang, I have a skeleton to do that, if you ask me. Hey, Doc, come here and look at this. Now, what in the name of Sam Hill are you doing to it, Captain? Well, look, the bones are joined together with pieces of wire. Now, what sort of monkey business is this? Here, look. A message tied about its neck. Message? What does it say? It says, I have come to you out of the grave marked Theodore Beverly, but I do not belong in his grave. I am not his skeleton. Theodore Beverly? Why, that's Miss Carroll's grandfather. My grandfather! Grab her, Doc! She's fainted! And now the very skeletons in the City of the Dead are coming up out of their graves to identify themselves. But what does the message mean? I am out of the grave marked Theodore Beverly, but I am not his skeleton. And what has all this to do with the phantom church bell and old clothwood? Many of these things will be revealed to you next week when you hear episode six of Carlton E. Morse's City of the Dead, entitled The Ghoul in the Grave.
Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Midnight, on the third night in the old abandoned graveyard, better known as the City of the Dead. A melancholy silence has settled on the cottage of Mayor Joshua Friday, lifelong caretaker of the old cemetery. Jimmy Parker, a prisoner, sleeps uneasily in one bedroom. His girlfriend, Phyllis Carroll, lies in a bed before the flickering embers of the dying front room fire. The knife wound in her back breaks her light breathing with barely audible moans. Dr. Tuner is sleeping heavily on the lounge, ready to attend her at an instant notice. The mayor and his son, Captain Friday, private investigator, occupy the double bed in the bedroom assigned to Miss Carroll before she was stabbed. Earlier this evening, but let Captain Friday tell it. Earlier in the evening, a skeleton had suddenly been thrust through the front door to collapse on the rug almost at Phyllis Carroll's feet. It was a skeleton neatly wired together, joint by joint. Around its spinal column was fastened a message which said, I have come out of the grave, marked Theodore Beverly, but I do not belong in his grave. I am not his skeleton. Theodore Beverly was Miss Carroll's grandfather and was supposedly buried in the City of the Dead 14 years ago. He likewise had buried half a million dollars worth of black pearls in the City of the Dead before he died and left instructions where to find them in papers received by his granddaughter on her 20th birthday. Yes, that's why Jimmy Parker and I came down to the old cemetery here. And and now this skeleton has come up out of my grandfather's grave to tell me that he is not my grandfather and should not have been buried in my grandfather Beverly's tomb. Yes, well, Miss Carroll went all to pieces over the presence of the skeleton. And it had taken several hours to get the household settled down for the night and to lay the skeleton out decently in the shed at the rear of the house. Finally, a semblance of quiet had descended upon the house, and its occupants had retired to their rest. And so came midnight. Oh. Shoulder hurting you, Miss Carroll? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Tuner. I, I didn't mean to awaken you. You didn't. It was that caterwauling outside. I was just dropping off to sleep when it began. Why do you suppose it does that? Makes that awful noise. Captain Friday swears it's human. Yeah, don't worry about old Clawfoot. You feel feverish? No, just uncomfortable. Let's see. Open your mouth. And put the thermometer under your tongue. There. Have you slept at all? Mm-mm. Why, Tucker, didn't you say so? I'd have given you something. How was I to know you were awake when you lay there as still as a log? Mm-hmm. Here, now, hold your tongue still. I'll do the talking. You haven't been worrying, have you? Mm-hmm. Didn't I tell you not to talk? Here, let me have that thermometer. Hmm. And just a mite of fever. Not enough to keep you awake. I'm going to give you a sleeping powder and tuck you in. I want you to go to sleep. I'll try. Now, what oh. the tuck is that? Oh, that came from Jimmy's room. Hi! Right out there! What's the matter? Is Phyllis all right? What's the matter with you, Parker? I can't sleep. I heard someone talking. Is Phyllis worse? No, Phyllis is not worse. She's trying to get some sleep. Look here, doctor. Let me out of this room. Let me sit beside her the rest of the night. I won't run off. Hey, who's making all this rumpus? Who is that pounding? Oh, you awake too, Captain? Young Parker's pounding on his door. He wants out. Does, huh? What do you want, Parker? I can't sleep, Captain Friday. Let me sit by Phyllis the rest of the night. I won't run away. Why should I do that? Well, I'd feel easier. Oh, I'm sure I could sleep if Jimmy was sitting by me. You kids aren't up to something, are you? Oh, no, really. I feel too woozy and Jimmy wouldn't go away without me. Hello. Old Clawfoot's out again tonight. Yeah, he's been around for the last hour, up to some new devilment, I suppose. Aren't you going to let me out? All right. Come on out. I promise you I won't try to escape. You won't try if you know what's good for you. That room gives me the creeps. Did you hear old Clawfoot at it again? How could we help it? I caught a glimpse of him through the bars of my window. He was out there by the shed. You mean where we put the skeleton? Say, I'd forgotten the skeleton. Yes, that's right where he was. That bird's got a nose for old bones. I think we'd better investigate. Doc, you stay here with Miss Carroll. Parker, you come with me. Uh, Captain, is the mayor sleeping through all this? What? Huh? Oh, Dad? Oh, I guess he is. Tell you what I'll do. I'll lock his door so nothing will disturb him. Let him sleep. Now, what in Tucker do you lock in the mayor in for? 
I just told you, didn't you hear me, Doc? Mm, sounds like a lot of foolishness to me. Oh, never mind. Let's go, Parker. You all right, Phyllis? I'm all right, Jimmy. Don't worry about me. Come along, Parker. Yeah, okay. You sure you saw old Clawfoot hanging around the shed? You don't think I could mistake him, do you? This is the screwiest business. Yeah, keep on the grass. Listen. The church bell. If that isn't coming up the valley from the old church ruins, nothing ever did. Hello, you were right, Parker. The shed door is open. Golly, I wonder if... Let's have a look. The skeleton's gone. Door broken open and the skeleton gone. Not a sign of him. We laid him out on the bench there, didn't we? Look around outside for footprints. Yeah, it's hard to see anything. Even with the moonlight. Yeah, but no fog. See anything? Nothing over here. I don't think so. Hey! Captain Friday, come here. What have you found? Some kind of a bone. Bone? Well, look what you found. You know what this is, Parker? No. One of the bones off the foot of our skeleton. Off the skeleton? Looks like he dropped something in his escape. Yeah, but Captain... Look over there. There's another. Yeah, who says a skeleton can't leave a trail? Come along. Maybe we'll find another one. But it's taking us down into the city of the dead. What of it? Graveyard's a natural place for a skeleton, isn't it? Well, I suppose so, but... I was right. Here's another bone. Looks like an ankle bone, doesn't it? I don't know. I never studied anatomy. <laughs> Do you think old cloth would have done this? Strung that skeleton's bones out over the country this way? It looks like it, doesn't it? But why? I wish I knew. That's the reason we're following this trail of bones. If there's a purpose, we'll find it out soon enough. Oh, there's another bone. Where? They're ahead, glistening in the moonlight. Oh, so there is. Ah, it's a bone from the skeleton's lower leg. <laughs> Looks like old bag of bones is going to pieces fast. Yeah, well, so am I. I don't like trailing skeletons in a cemetery. Not with that claw-footed thing slinking around. I think I see another bone ahead. The trail's leading us down toward the old church. Who knows? Maybe we'll find another message. Messages tied around the neck of a skeleton. That's about the limit. It was a weird bit, wasn't it? Let's see. What was it now? I have come to you out of the grave marked Theodore Beverly, but I do not belong in his grave. I am not his skeleton. That sounds as though the man who was buried as Phyllis's grandfather wasn't her grandfather at all. Do you think that's what the message intended to say? You know, Phyllis's mother never was certain that the body was that of Theodore Beverly. Well, that was a good many years ago. If no one could be certain back at that time, how could anyone know for certain at this late day? I don't know. After all, who wrote the note? Hello. Here's a bone from the upper leg. What do you suppose we'll find next? Look here, Captain Friday. Let's not carry this thing out any further. Let's go back to the house and wait till morning. I should say not. But you don't know what kind of a trap you're running us into. Trap? Yes, trap. Listen. Just the phantom church bell again. Look. Look over there. Didn't you see something move? I did not. Well, I did. I doubt it. You're just plain scared. I tell you, I'm not. I saw something. Something creeping. Something in the shadows of the tombstones. Rot. It isn't rot. It isn't. It's something alive. There are creeping things all around us. I tell you, I can see them everywhere. And I wish to heaven you'd point some of them out to me. I can't see a thing. Except up ahead, I see another bone. I tell you, I'm going back. You're going ahead with me. I'm not. Parker, are you going to come along? No. There you are, and quick. I have a gun here, Parker, and it's loaded. Pretty brave with a gun in your hand, aren't you? I'll give you until I count to three to start walking toward that next bone. I won't move. One. Two. Go ahead and shoot. <laughs> I'm not going to shoot you, Parker. I just wanted to see if you were really as yellow as you were trying to make out. Yellow? Sure. Trying to kid me into believing you're deathly afraid of a cemetery at night. What about it? You haven't seen anything to make you scared and you know it. And you wouldn't be as scared as you pretended even if you did see all those creeping horrors you were babbling about. <laughs> creeping horrors. Hmm. Pretty smart, aren't you? Any man who'll stand up against a gun as you've just done isn't very much afraid of anything. Thanks for nothing. So, as I've got it figured out, there's some very definite reason why you don't want us to go any further. Go ahead and figure all you like. I'm all through figuring tonight, fella. I know now why you balked on me. How do you know? Because I have the same suspicion as you where this trail of bones is leading us. 
I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You think, and so do I, that someone is guiding us to the place where the Beverly Pearls are buried. What is this trail of bones? This search for a king's ransom in pearls? What are these messages from the grave? If the skeleton in the grave of Miss Carol's grandfather is not her grandfather, then who is it? And where is Grandfather Beverly, supposedly for so long at his rest? And why... But more in just a moment. Captain Friday, I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do, Parker. You think, and so do I, that someone is guiding us to the place where the Beverly Pearls are buried. No, nothing of that kind. It's not true. Oh, yes, it is. Now, then, are you going to come along with me to find out, or do you want me to go on alone? I wasn't thinking about the Black Pearls. Zeus, you weren't. Look here, Parker, there's no use trying to kid me. I can read a man's face, and I know exactly what's been passing through your mind. Now, if you like, I'll take you back to the house and lock you in, and then return alone. I'll go along with you. I thought you would. Oh, I wish that bell would stop that. Forget about it. Look, here's another little heap of foot bones. Skeleton's lost his second foot now. And right up there ahead is... No, it's his ankle bone. Well, I'll certainly know bone structure of the human body by the time I get out of this place. Too bad you're not studying medicine over at the University of California. Look at the starch you'd have on most of the fellas. No, thank you. And I'm not growing up to be a grave digger either. <laughs> well, here's the bone of the lower left leg. We're getting well down into the city of the dead, do you realize that? Yeah, we must have come a mile. If it was just a little lighter, we'd be able to see the outline of the old church. I wish I knew who threw that knife that stabbed Phyllis. Mm. A number of things I'd like to know. For instance, I give a half share on the Rockefeller Foundation to know how come Lammy Fink was scared to death. And who burned down Lammy's shack. And who it was that tried to get into your room and was murdered by old Clawfoot. And who Clawfoot is. And who filled up Ernie Morton's grave? And who tried to shoot Dad down in the old church? And who... And what your father does every night when he slips out of the house after everyone else is asleep? There's another bone that makes both feet and legs of our skeleton. We ought to gain on him fast now that he's left his lower extremities behind. Look, there's a little pile of bones over to the left. Oh, so there is. If I'm not mistaken, those are the bones of his fingers and right hand. And I'd still like to know what the mayor does when he slips You'll out. You'll be just as well off, Parker, if you don't wonder too much. Come on. Well, we'd probably find out a lot about this mystery if we did know. I'll tend to that end of the matter. Well, there's the bones of the left hand in a nice little pile. wonder what's become of old Clawfoot himself. Certainly made himself absent since we come out of the house. <laughs> He's a little like the pink flea. Here one moment and where the next. Well, anyway, your father won't be out tonight seeing you locked him in before Let we Let the left. mayor alone. Oh, well, we must be getting near the end of the trail. There's the two forearms of our skeleton together. Look here, Captain Friday. What do you really expect to find at the end of this trail? I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if it were the pearls. Though why in the deuce anyone would want to give the secret away, I don't know. No one knows where the pearls are hidden but Phyllis and myself. Well, if you knew, why didn't you dig them up the first night, the night you were taken prisoners by the mayor and Doc Tuner? We... Well... You certainly did some digging. The blisters on your hand show that. Oh, I dug all right. Well, did you find anything? I guess I miscalculated in the dark. Did you dig in just one grave? I didn't say I opened a grave. Well, then, did you dig in just one spot? Yeah. Why did you give up so easily? Well, we thought we heard someone moving around in the City of the Dead, and Phyllis got scared. She wouldn't let me try a second time. Heard someone, huh? Did you see anyone? Just shadows. We couldn't be sure it was anyone. Phyllis was nervous about being down here anyway, and you can't blame her. No, I suppose not. Then what happened? Well, oh, there's some more bones, Captain. Oh, good. The two upper arms. We must be getting close. There isn't a heck of a lot left to this skeleton. Now, well, go on. What happened after Miss Carroll insisted that you leave the City of the Dead? We went back to the car, which we left on the road outside the City of the Dead above the mayor's cottage. Didn't you fill up the grave? You mean the hole, don't you? Yes. Didn't you fill up the hole you dug? No. We left in kind of a hurry. Then my cue is to look for the excavation. Well, not a good'll do you. Why do you say that? 
Because I've seen the spot since, and it's been filled up. It has? You certain? Yeah, I know it has. When did you have the opportunity of investigating? You've been locked up since that night. And I saw the place the day you took me down into the city of the dead and discovered that Ernie Morton's grave had been opened. Oh, so that's it. Look. Up there. <laughs> well, ain't that some? Our skeleton has had the audacity to leave his pelvis bone lying right out in the open. I suppose we'll find a trail of ribs and vertebrae scattered along ahead of us next. I suppose so. By George, Parker, why didn't I think of it before? I know where we're headed for. Yeah? Where? I'll bet you money this trail is going to lead us directly to Ernie Morton's grave. Oh, you don't say. I most certainly do say. I'll be a mighty disappointed man if I don't find the grinning skull of our friend the skeleton perched on Ernie Morton's headstone. Uh, there's a couple of ribs. Two more of them down there about 20 yards. Good enough. We'll be in sight of Ernie's grave in a few minutes now. Well, what will you do if the trail does end there? We'll sit down and keep guard until morning, and then first thing after breakfast, we'll reopen that grave. There must be something buried there. All the activity seems to center around the place. Well, if you're going to do it by daylight... Shut up, Parker. I hear something. What is it? Shh, listen. Someone's digging over there. Not a word now. Follow me. Yeah. We'll sneak up on the grave robber. Keep down in the shadows of the headstone. I can see his outline. Be careful, he'll hear you. Look. Look there on the headstone. The skull. <laughs> the skull of our skeleton. The end of the trail. And it is Ernie Morton's grave. Oh, if that fellow would turn around, I'd be able to see his face in the moonlight. Look. Look. Now you can see who it is. <laughs> Dr. Tuner, why are Jimmy and Captain Friday staying out there so long? Do you think anything's happened? No, no, you don't need to worry about them. Captain Friday can take care of himself and young Parker. But they were just going out to examine the shed, and, and they've been gone almost an hour. Well, then you just settle down there and go to sleep. Hasn't that powder I gave you made you drowsy? Yes, but but I keep thinking. Oh, he, he's right outside. Well, I don't reckon it matters much if he is. But why don't Jimmy and Captain Friday drive him away? You can't tell. Maybe they're trying to trail old Clawfoot, and he gave him the slip and came back to the house. Oh, but what does he want here? Why does he keep hanging around the house? Well, you're not afraid with me here, are you, Miss Carroll? No, but I wish Jimmy was back in the house. Well, I reckon you're safe enough. And then there's the mayor sleeping right in the next room. Well, goodness knows how he can sleep with all his ruckus. But his door's locked. He wouldn't be any good to us if, if anything should happen. Mm -hmm. He could break the lock easy enough. It's tolerably old. But there isn't any need, young lady. Oh, I am afraid, Dr. Tuner. Maybe Jimmy and Cap Captain Friday were lured away from the house on purpose. Trickety, I never thought of that. See, maybe I'd better wake up the mayor. Then if he says so, I'll bust the lock. Captain had no business locking the door in the first place. Oh, I wish you would. Oh, listen to him. Look, look. What's in to... Look, look at the window. Look at the window. Where? I don't see it. He was there. He was there at the window staring in at me. Who, old Clawfoot? Yes, yes. Oh, it was horrible. I'm hmm, getting mighty brave. I'm going to rouse the mayor. Mayor. Hi, Mayor. Mayor Friday. Oh, oh hurry. Hurry. I can hear that thing crawling around outside the house. He's sleeping dang heavy, even for the mayor. Try again. Hi there, Mayor. Mayor Friday. Hi in there, Mayor. What do you suppose is the matter with him? Dang funny, I can't get a sound out of him. Listen a moment, see if I can hear him breathing. Oh, what do you suppose makes him do that? I can't hear the Mayor at all. That's funny, too, because he always snores like a foghorn when he's sleeping heavily. You don't suppose something has happened to him, too, do you? What could happen to a man in there? The windows are barred and the door's been locked ever since Captain Friday left. But, but the windows were barred and the door was locked when someone stabbed me. Oh, Sir Fant, I wonder if the mayor's been stabbed. I'm going to open that door. Oh, yes, please. I think you ought to. Oh, Dr. Tuner, I'm so frightened. You got me going now. He's at the window again. He's at the window. Oh, make him go away. Well, what do you want me to do? Wave the tablecloth at him? You keep still. I can't do more than one thing at a time, and I'm going to see what's happened to the mayor. Oh, all right. Don't look at the window if he frightens you. Oh, I, I can't help it. What, what are you going to do with, with that chair? I'm going to break in the mayor's door. 
I wish I had a gun. I'd take a pop at that thing. That Bernie's wailing anyway. Oh, please hurry with the door. What are you doing now? I'm moving the other furniture back so I can get a good swing. Now then, we'll see how strong that lock is. Yeah, Starter, not so. You've broken the leg off the chair. You blast the chair. She's given. She's given away. There she is. Is he in there? Is he all right, Dr. Tuner? Blacker and Sam Scratch in here. Where's the mayor's flashlight? They're on the table. Yeah. Now we'll know in about a half a minute. Watch what. Doctor? Dr. Tuner? What's the matter? What's happened in there? Oh, oh Dr. Tuner? Dr. Tuner? He ain't here. The mayor ain't any place in that room. He's not there. He's not hiding her hair out him. Oh, but... Oh, are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. I even looked under the bed for the body. Oh, but, but how did he get out? Are the bars still on the window? Yeah, I looked especially to see. Now, if that ain't the craziest thing I ever heard tell of. Oh, but... But he must be there. Well, he ain't. Oh, but... But people simply can't just disappear through a locked door. They can't. Well, the mayor's gone and done it. Oh, but if the mayor's disappeared, then... Then one of us may be next. Mm, I don't calculate that oh. makes me feel any better. Oh, I wish Jimmy was here. Oh, where is he? Dr. Tuner, Dr. Tuner, do you suppose he and Captain Friday have vanished too? I ain't thinking of anything, except I'm going out and clean up on that tall-footed son of a gun in about a half a minute. Oh, please, you won't leave me, will you? Promise me you won't. I don't reckon you need to worry on that score. I ain't one of them brave fellows that goes out looking for trouble. No, I'll stay here with you, all right. Oh, but what'll we do? You, you don't suppose that, that thing... What thing? Well, whatever it was that got the mayor... You you don't think it's still in the house, do you? Well, how should I know? I don't even know that the mayor's been got. Well, if something hasn't got him, then, then what has become of him? Does your imagination always work overtime this way? A fella could get the creeps just sitting listening to you imagining things. Oh, I'm sorry if I'm acting badly, but but nothing like this ever happened to me before. Well, it doesn't happen to me every day either, thank heaven. If, if that thing outside the door would only go away, I I wouldn't feel this way, but... Dr. Tuner, Dr. Tuner, look. Look at the front door. It's opening. For God's sakes, I forgot to lock it. Oh, hurry, hurry. Lean against it. Oh, hold it shut. Don't let him get it open. I've got it. If I can push it shut, I... Who's out there? Oh, oh, can't you hold it? Can't you hold it? I'm trying my dangest. Whoever's on the other side of that door is as strong as an ox. It's the claw-footed phantom. You mustn't let him get him. You mustn't. You mustn't. I can't get any hold with my feet. He's gaining on me. I'm slipping. I'm slipping. Dr. Tuner, the fireplace poker's on the rack. Can you reach him? Good. It'll give me something to fight with. Oh, can you reach him? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. I'm going to let go of the door and crack him over the head with the poker when he comes in. Oh, be careful. Oh, oh you missed him. If he comes within range of this poker, oh. Oh. oh no! No! You killed Doctor Turner! You killed Doctor Turner! Oh. Oh. oh, don't, don't go away! Don't look at me like that! Go away! Go away! Oh, oh don't come near me! Don't come near me. Oh, please. Please go away. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Jimmy! Jimmy! Oh, oh no. Clawfoot has descended on the old caretaker's cottage. What of the girl's peril, alone in the presence of the wailing phantom? What of the ghoul caught digging in Ernie Morton's grave? What of the skeleton that walks, the phantom church bell, 
the buried treasure of black pearls. Listen at this same hour next week when we bring you Chapter 7 of the Carlton E. Morse adventure drama, City of the Dead. Listen to Chapter 7, entitled, Captain Friday Vanishes. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. Two o'clock. On the morning of the third day in the City of the Dead. Three nights and two days have been spent in this old abandoned cemetery. This is the morning of the third day. But let Captain Friday tell you. At midnight we were asleep in the cottage of my father, Mayor Friday, who's caretaker of the old cemetery. Then there came the disturbing wails of the old clawfoot phantom. I got up and with Jimmy Parker went out into the night. Almost immediately we stumbled onto a trail of bones that led us among the tombstones down into the city of the dead. It led to a grave upon whose headstone had been placed a skull. It was a freshly opened grave, and there was a man down in it, digging. So much for that. In the meantime, Dr. Tuner had been left at the cottage with Phyllis Carroll, kept abed by her knife wound. Also, the old mare was supposedly asleep in one of the bedrooms, locked in by Captain Friday, so that he would not be disturbed. Dr. Tuna became frightened when Old Clawfoot began to prowl outside the door and broke into Mayor Friday's room, only to find that he was not in the locked room at all. And then the Clawfoot creature took measure in his own hands. He broke into the front door, overwhelmed Dr. Tuna, and came to the bed beside the girl. When it reached toward her, she cried out and lost consciousness. It is now two in the morning, and we are down in the city of the dead, where Captain Friday and Jimmy Parker are watching the ghoul at work in the grave. The grave of old Ernie Morton. Get down, Parker. Down on your face and keep still. Did you see who it was digging in the grave, Captain? Keep still, I tell you. Not a move out of you. Don't even raise your head to look. Why so mysterious? Who is it? Never mind. You do as I say. Keep down here behind this tombstone. Here, where you going? Keep still. Now listen, I'm going to sneak out alone. Yeah, help. Be quiet. I'm going out alone because it'll make less noise. He's down in the grave now. I want to catch him red-handed. Well, I think that's a fool idea. Let me go along. You do what I tell you, Parker. Yeah, but he'll be desperate. He's liable to be the killer. I can take care of myself. Now, mind you, do what I say. Don't move a muscle until you hear me yell. I'll yell when I jump him. Uh, I don't like that it. That doesn't make any difference. Remember now. Wait until I yell. What's happened? What's been going on oh, here? Where have you been? Why have you been gone so long? Why are you so white? What's happened? Nothing. Nothing that matters now. Tell me, what's been going on here? Where's Doc Tuner? He's over there behind those overturned chairs. Jimmy, he's dead. Dead? Jimmy, the clawfoot phantom's been here. Phyllis. Dr. Tuner tried to drive him out and, and the thing killed him. Phyllis, are you sure Dr. Tuner's dead? Oh, please don't leave me. I'm not going to leave you. 
I want to see if there's anything I can do for the doctor. I know he's dead, Jimmy. I I saw him fall. No. No, he's not, Phil. No, he's not dead. He's still breathing. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. Oh, wait, I'll get him on the lounge. I don't think he's very badly hurt. There. There. Looks to me like he's just been knocked down. Oh, that's wonderful. What a fight there must have been. This place is a wreck. Everything upside down. Yes, it... It was pretty bad. And what happened after old Clawfoot knocked the doctor out? It turned on me. It made a little mewing wail. I never felt so awful in my life. Mewing wail? Phyllis, what are you saying? It was just like that, Jimmy. Just as though it was an animal that was glad to see me. Oh, for goodness sake. It crept toward me, wailing a little soft wail. Oh, Jimmy, I can't tell you how terrible it was. It just kept coming closer and closer. And you couldn't move. I screamed at it to go away. I begged it not to come near me, but it kept coming on and on. And then suddenly it was over me. It stretched out a lean claw hand. Oh, Phil, I... dear. And then I fainted. Ah, oh, you poor kid. I thought you'd be safe here. I'd never let you. I just came to. Just a moment before you came in. The thing was gone. I wish I knew what to do about Doc Tuna there. You're certain he isn't dying? No, he's not dying. Just a bump on the head. He'll be around presently. Hey. Hey, where's Mayor Friday? Who broke open his door? I forgot all about him. We... We don't know. What do you mean you don't know? We don't know what's become of him. When old Clawfoot began to wail outside, Dr. Tuner broke in the door to awaken him. But the mayor wasn't any place in the room. Yeah, but that's silly, Phil. We saw Captain Friday lock his father in. He wasn't there. He vanished. Vanished from a barred and locked room? And I've got to lie here in this miserable bed with my shoulder hurt. Oh, what if something should come after me? I couldn't run. I couldn't do anything. Now, don't you worry about that, Phil. I'm not moving from your side from now on. But but what about you? You were so white when you came in. Something's happened. Why don't you tell me? I... Oh, what do you mean, Phil? You're holding something back. What happened out there in the city of the dead? Why were you so white when you ran into the house? Where is Captain Friday? I... Well, Phyllis... Has... Has something happened to the captain? Now, Phyllis, you've got enough to worry about. Don't bother your head about it. It's Dr. Tuner. Yeah, still He's unconscious. Growing. He's still unconscious, but he'll be around pretty soon now. Oh, Jimmy Parker, you tell me what happened. You've got to tell me. Is he dead? Is Captain Friday dead? No. That is, I don't know. You don't know? Well, weren't you with him all the time? Oh, Jimmy, don't put me off. I'm not putting you off, Phyllis. Honestly, I don't know. Then... Phil, Captain Friday's vanished. <gasps> vanished? Captain Friday's vanished. Oh, Jimmy. Now, now, Phyllis, don't give way. Please don't. Oh, oh, but... But first the mayor disappeared, and... And now his son. Jimmy, do you think we're to be next? Of course not. But think of what's happened. First it was my cousin, Bert Arnold. They strangled him and threw him in an old grave. Oh, don't talk about it, Phil. It'll only make you feel worse. And then that stranger was stabbed to death outside your window. Well, we know old Clawfoot did that. We saw him. And, and then, then Lammy Fink, frightened to death. What is there in the world that could frighten a person to death? Well, that old caretaker was always scared of a cemetery at night, you know that. But what a horrible way to die. I've heard that a person's heart sometimes bursts wide open with fear. Did you ever hear of that, Jimmy? No, of course not. Stop it now, Phil. You're frightening yourself sick with this kind of talk. And then Mayor Friday vanished from a barred room. Oh, Phil, I tell you... And now Captain Friday. Tell me, Jimmy. How did Captain Friday disappear? How did it happen? It... Oh, listen here, Phil. Wait until morning, won't you? Wait until daylight and I'll tell you all about it. It'll only be a few hours now. No. No, I want to hear now. But... But, Phyllis, it's not a nice story. Tell me now. Well, I left the house and went to the shed where we laid out the skeleton. The skeleton with the message tied to it, saying it wasn't my grandfather? Oh, Phil, I wish you wouldn't. Go on, Jimmy. Well, well, the skeleton was gone. Gone? The skeleton, too. The mayor, the captain, and now the skeleton. Yes, the skeleton was gone. We were looking about outside the shed when I ran across the bones of its foot. Its foot? Yes. Just a little further down into the city of the dead, and Captain Friday found its ankle bone. What? Well, that's strange. 
What did that mean? We didn't know at first. But presently we found leg bones and most of the rest of the skeletons scattered out ahead of us. It was a trail of bones, Phyllis. A trail of bones? Yes, a trail of bones leading us down into the city of the dead. Leading us down to a grave. Any... Any particular grave? The grave of Ernie Morton. Ernie Morton? The grave we opened in search of the black pearl. Oh, Jimmy! The grave in which the strangled body of your cousin, Bert Arnold, was found. Oh, what does it mean? What is it? And, Phil, when we got down into the city of the dead, there perched on the headstone of Ernie Morton's grave was the grinning skull of our skeleton. Oh. And that isn't all. Yes? Phyllis, there was someone digging in that grave again. Jimmy! Yes, someone digging. Digging. He didn't see us. We threw ourselves down in the shadow of a tombstone. It was brilliant moonlight. Who? Who was it? I couldn't tell. I don't know. Captain Friday made me lie flat. I couldn't see a thing. All I could hear was the shoveling. Shoveling of the ghoul in Ernie Morton's grave. Then what happened? Captain Friday was peering around the edge of the tombstone. Suddenly he called my name and dropped back to the ground. You saw who it was? That's what I thought, but if he did, he wouldn't tell me. He said he was going out after the fellow and that I was to lie still until he yelled. He said he would yell when he leaped into the grave on the man. And that was my signal to come to his aid. Why didn't you go with him? Well, I wanted to, but he wouldn't let me. He wouldn't even let me raise my head to watch him while he sneaked up on the grave. Why? I don't know. Then he slipped out and I waited. I waited, waited. Pretty soon I heard the shoveling stop. I got ready to jump to my feet. I expected the captain to yell any second, but there wasn't any yell. I waited a few seconds longer, and then I raised myself and looked over the top of the gravestone. Yes, Jimmy? Phyllis, there wasn't a sign of anyone any place around. Jimmy! It's as true as anything I ever said in my life. Captain Friday had vanished. The grave digger had vanished. Even the shovel had gone. I rushed to the edge of the half-uncovered grave and looked everywhere. There was nothing. Oh, Jimmy, I couldn't have done that. I stood there in the moonlight at the edge of the grave, petrified for a moment. Then I yelled until my lungs hurt. And all I got from my trouble was a lot of echoes. Echoes coming up from the ruins of the old church. Echoes and the faint sounding of that phantom church bell. I couldn't have stood it. Then I got sick, and I got away from the edge of the grave and started to run. It's more than a mile, but I ran the whole way back here to the cottage without stopping. No wonder you were white and out of breath. And when I came in the door and found everything so upset, and you so frightened, it brought me to my senses. Mm. I think the doctor's coming too, Phyllis. Get a pan of cold water, Jimmy. Baby's head. Yeah, Okay. Watch him, Phil. If he starts to move around, yell. I don't want him to fall off the lounge. He's all right. Only hurry. Coming. Now we'll fix him up. Poor old guy. Now, this cold water will help that head. You know, Phil, this is pretty rough treatment for a man as old as Doc Tuner. It's pretty rough treatment on any of us. And, Jimmy, just as sure as anything in this world, this is building up to something. Yeah. I suppose everything has a payoff. I, I just hope that payoff won't, won't end up in a funeral parlor. That's all I hope. The old mare missing, Captain Friday missing. The prowling of old Clawfoot is building up to something more surely than Phyllis Carroll can know. And on the next appearance of one of these three who is even now making his way between the moonlit headstones toward the cottage. But more of that in just a moment. Oh, oh my head. Oh, he's coming too, all right, Phil. I'm awfully sorry about him. He's been so kind to me. Oh, my head. And the mayor keeps him stimulant around here somewhere. Oh. I think a little something would do him good. I saw it on the lower left-hand shelf in the kitchen cupboard, Jimmy. Oh, good. I'll get it. <coughs> Did you find it, Jimmy? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, this will snap him out of it. Here now, Doc. Try and drink this. <coughs> That's put color in his face. He's opening his eyes, Phil. Hello, Doc. Feeling pretty bad? What, what is it? What's the matter? Just a little bump on the head, Doctor. You'll be all right in a minute. Bump on the head? How did I get a bump on the head? Oh, don't remember, huh? Old Clawfoot slugged you. Clawfoot. Crawford, I remember. He was after Miss Carroll. Did he get her? I'm Did all... he get her? I'm all right, Dr. Tuner. Honest, I am. 
Don't you worry about me a bit. Oh, I shouldn't have let that thing get the best of me. I guess I ain't as young as I used to be. Well, don't you worry about that. You put up a good fight. The fellas told me all about it. I'm still a good fighting man, Parker. I'd have brained that thing with the poker if my foot hadn't slipped. That's what was the matter. My foot slipped. Yeah, of course, Dr. Tuner. That's the way it happened. Now, you just lay back and rest a while. Jim Parker. Well? You know, I'm feeling kind of dejected, like I think I could do with another spoonful out of that bottle. Oh, that's right, sir. I'll bet you could. In just a minute, I'll fix it for you. Here you are. <laughs> oh, thanks, Parker. Yeah, that's all right. Now, you just lie still for a bit until you feel stronger. Jimmy, could I have a drink of water? Oh, sure thing. Now, I'll have it for you in a jiffy. Here you are, Phil. Hey, where's Captain Friday, Parker? He hasn't come in yet. Uh, what's he doing out meandering around the city of the dead this time of night? Oh, he'll be in when he gets ready. What gets me is what that old clawfoot critter wanted in here. I reckon he didn't come from Miss Carroll after all, seeing as he went away without hurting her none. Did you see what he did after I was knocked out, Miss Carroll? No, Dr. Tuner. He came toward me and I fainted. Oh, fainted, huh? Yes, and... He was gone when I came, too. And you ain't noticed anything different since you waked up? Anything about the room or anything in the room? Why, no. Funny. What do you suppose he wanted, Parker? I don't suppose he wanted anything. Probably the midnight ramblings of a mad creature. I think you and Phil were lucky to get off with your lives. <gasps> Listen. The phantom church bell again. I wonder if it's going to begin all over. Begin over again? What do you mean? I mean, I wonder if we're going to have more trouble with old Clawfoot tonight. Oh, oh, Jimmy, would you please look out of the window and see if anything's outside? No, of course, Phyllis. Hey, Dr. Tuna, what are you doing? You lie down there. No, sir. I reckon I'm feeling a much prior than I did. I guess I'll be moving about a bit. Yeah, but you had a nasty blow on the head. Well, you don't want me to stay in bed the rest of my life just because you bumped my head, do you, Parker? No, of course not. Not if you feel like getting up. There goes the bell again. Oh, please look out of the window and see if that... that thing is around again. I don't suppose I'll be able to see much. Shh! Someone on the porch. Yeah, someone on the porch. Listen. Shh! He's coming up to the door. Is it bolted? Yes, I locked it. I don't want it to come in here. I couldn't stand seeing it again. Shh, Phil. Doc and I can take care of you. I wouldn't mind having a gun. Yeah, that's what I wished for on his last visit. Here. You take the leg of this broken chair. I'll handle the poker. Shh, shh. Hello! Who's there? You mean disposition, whoever he is. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so afraid. Hi, you out there! You better answer if you know what's good for you. That's right. We're two against you. You ain't got a chance. Doc Tuner. Doc Tuner, is that you? It's Mayor Friday. Well, that... Sure, it's me, Mayor. Here, unlock that door and let the mayor in. Dr. Tuner, are you certain it's the mayor? Certain? Of course I'm certain. Go on, open the door, Parker. Yeah, what did I tell you? Of course it's the mayor. Well, why shouldn't it be me? What in tarnation you going to lock me out for? Well, why didn't you answer instead of tromping up on the porch and banging on the door without a word? Because I ain't used to asking for permission to enter my own house. Hmm. What in the Sam Hills happened here, anyway? Who broke that chair? Who smashed in that door? I reckon it couldn't be helped, Mayor. We had a little visit from old Clawfoot while you were out. Clawfoot? I reckon so. By the way, Mayor Friday, where have you been all night? Curious, young squirt, ain't you, Parker? Perhaps so. But a lot of things have been happening around the City of the Dead tonight. And I think you can throw light on a great deal of it. What's been happening? Well, to begin with, we all saw Captain Friday lock you in that room there before he and I went out into the City of the Dead. You saw the captain lock me in? That's right, Mayor. I reckon we all saw him do it. Doc, you saw him lock me in? I reckon that's right, Mayor. Well, when was that, Doc? Just before he and young Parker here went out. I reckon it was something about like midnight, Mayor. Oh. How'd you get out, Mayor Friday? Where's the captain, Parker? Why? Why, he vanished. Vanished? Yes. We went down into the city of the dead together and, well, he disappeared. You, you mean something's happened to my son, Parker? I'm sorry, Mayor Friday. I don't know what happened to him. 
You see, we found someone digging in Ernie Morton's grave. Ernie Morton's grave? Yes. Captain Friday made me lie down behind a tombstone while he crept up to the grave. He told me to wait until he shouted. Well? He never shouted. Didn't shout? No. I waited as long as I thought it wise, and then I followed. What did you see? Nothing. Captain Friday had vanished, and so had the fellow that had been digging. Did you see who it was in that grave? No. When I got to the edge of the grave, there was nothing but a partly filled hole. That's a likely story, young man. Well, it's true. Yeah, I reckon I know better than that. Well, well, what do you mean? Just what I say. It just happens that I came up through the City of the Dead right by Ernie Morton's grave not half an hour ago. And that grave ain't been touched. Maybe, though, you filled up the grave before you came in. No. No, I left it just as it was. You say it's filled up now? Reckon it ain't been opened this night. Well, I tell you, it was open. And I tell you, Parker, if you killed my son, it's going to be the last sneaking thing you do. That's the most asinine statement I ever heard. Oh, another country heard from. Phyllis is right. It is asinine. Now, now look here, Mayor. Are you certain Ernie Morton's grave hasn't been dug into? I'll take you down there if you can't take my word for no, it. No, no. If you say so, Mayor, it's so. But look here. Parker ain't been acting like my idea of a killer. You're an old fool, Doc Tuner. How do you know how a killer acts? Now then, Mayor, you can't make me believe that you think the captain's dead. I ain't lived around you 40 years for nothing. If you really thought anything had happened to that boy... You keep your thoughts to yourself, Doc Tuner. But, Mayor Friday, why would Jimmy do a thing like that? He hadn't any reason. Honestly, he didn't. The captain was getting too much on him. Of course he had reason. Plenty of reason. Oh, no, no. Honestly, Jimmy wouldn't hurt anyone. Honestly. Yeah, there now, Miss Carol. <laughs> oh, Phil, don't cry. It's all right. Oh, but you didn't. <laughs> now, now, Miss Carol, you've gone and made yourself unhappy again. You've had too much trouble tonight. Oh, but Dr. Tuner, you you know Jimmy wouldn't hurt anybody, don't you? Well, yes, yes, of course. Here, now, you let me straighten out your pillow for you. But... The mayor said... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me lift you up a little. Yeah, now I can fix that pillow. I'll give you a powder that'll put... Hello. What's this under your pillow? Why, well, I don't know. Look. Look here, Mayor, Parker, look. Look what I found under Miss Carol's pillow. What is it? Let me see. What have you got there, Dr. Tuner? A black pearl. A black pearl. Jumping Jerusalem. Did you ever see anything like it? A black pearl as big as a pigeon's egg. But where did it come from? Dr. Tuner, where did you get it? I found it under Miss Carol's pillow, just where I said I found it. Phil, where did you get it? I, I don't know. It isn't mine. I never saw it before. But it was under your pillow, young woman. I don't care. I never saw it before. Ain't it a beauty? One of old Theodore Beverly's collection, as sure as you're born. But, but it's uncanny. How did it get under my pillow? Well, one thing's certain now, anyway. What's that, son? That somebody has found the pearls. Their whereabouts is no longer a secret to somebody. And to someone in this group. How do you figure that out, Mayor? Because we're the only ones who've had an opportunity of placing the pearl under the girl's pillow. Old Clawfoot. It was Old Clawfoot. My jiggers, I wonder. Of course it was Old Clawfoot. We were wondering why he broke into the place. He didn't take anything, didn't hurt anyone more than was necessary to carry out his mission. Sounds reasonable. Well, of course. If Phyllis hadn't fainted, I'll bet he'd have put the pearl right in her hand. Jimmy, do you really think so? I'll bet money on it. But why? Why? I don't know. Just the same, I'll bet it was he. I know it was. You seem awful anxious to convince us, Parker. What? What do you mean, Mayor? I mean, I don't think Clawfoot had anything to do with that pearl. Oh? Well, what's your theory? I think you put that pearl there. What? Me? Yes. I think that pearl explains why the captain didn't come back to the cottage with you, James Parker. I don't understand. Oh, yes, you do. In some manner, you and my son hid on the hiding place of them black pearls tonight. And it didn't suit your purpose to have anybody but yourself know about them. You're crazy. Well, maybe I am and maybe I ain't. But just the same, young fella, I ain't taking any chances. You're going in that there bedroom of yours, and you're going to stay there until we can turn you over to the police. But you can't do that. You mustn't. Look here, Mayor, that's absurd. Why on earth would I give myself away by bringing one of the pearls here to the cottage? You couldn't resist the temptation of bringing one along to show to the girl. Likely you and her was looking at it when Doc Tuner came to. You didn't have time to hide it, so you stuck it under her pillow. No, no. I never saw it before. Honestly, I didn't. I swear it. Now, now, don't you go getting all excited again, Miss Carroll. What's the matter with you, Mayor Friday? Why don't you give me a break? You're always making me the goat for everything. What have you got against me? I've never done anything to you. That won't do you no good, Parker. Well, you know what I think of you. With as much circumstantial evidence against you... Circumstantial evidence? 
I'd like to know if there's anyone in the world that's got more against them than you. You went out of this house with my son, and you came back alone. That's enough for me. Look! Look! What? What? Are you pointing at me? Yes, I'm pointing at you. Look there in his vest pocket. Jimmy, what is it? I don't see anything. He must be losing his mind. What's the matter with you? Look at that gold pencil in his vest pocket. That's Captain Friday's pencil. <gasps> you... You mean... Captain Friday had that pencil in his pocket when we left the house tonight. What? What's that? And look at the fresh dirt on the knee of the mayor's trousers. Oh, Jimmy. Mayor Friday, supposing you tell us what's become of your son, Captain Friday. There have been many clues pointing to old Mayor Friday of the City of the Dead all along. But now, had he finally hanged himself? And was it Clawfoot who left the Black Pearl for Phyllis? Not only these questions, but the whereabouts of Captain Friday will be brought to you next week when Carlton E. Morse presents Chapter 8 of The City of the Dead, entitled The Kidnapping of Clawfoot. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Four o'clock. On the morning of the third day in the City of the Dead. Four o'clock, the dead black hour, just before dawn in this old abandoned cemetery. The night has already brought fear, mystery, and sinister implications. At midnight, Captain Friday and Jimmy Parker had slipped out of the caretaker's cottage, had picked up a trail of human bones, had finally come up on a ghoul digging in the grave of Ernie Morton. While Captain Friday and Jimmy were about this nocturnal business, Old Clawfoot broke into the cottage, overpowered Dr. Tuner, and frightened Phyllis Carroll into a fainting fit. But let Jimmy Parker tell what happened then. Well, first, Captain Friday made me lie behind a gravestone while he approached the ghoul in the half-open grave. It was too dark to see what was happening. But the next thing I knew, there was a terrible silence. No sound from the grave. No sign of Captain Friday. I crept to the grave's edge, and there was no one. The ghoul and Captain Friday had both vanished. Then I raced back to the cottage and found Phyllis just recovering consciousness and Dr. Tuner lying on the floor. Phyllis told me that old Clawfoot had broken into the cottage. I got her quieted and was just bringing Dr. Tuner around when old Mayor Friday came in. He accused me of doing away with his son, Captain Friday. And then suddenly I saw in his vest pocket a gold pencil. A pencil that his son had in his pocket when we left the cottage. His son's pencil in his pocket and fresh earth on the knees of his trousers. If anybody had done away with Captain Friday, it was his own father. And I said so right out in meeting. Why, you, you young whippersnapper. Now then, Mayor, now, now. But I tell you, Dr. Tudor... Just a minute, Mayor, now. Just a minute till we sort of get this straight. Well, I've got this thing straight, all right. You now, Parker, you keep still till you're spoken to. Now, let me sort of sum up this thing and see if we can't find out what's the matter here. Well, if any young squirt thinks he can accuse me of murder, he... Well, you started oh, it. Quit it, quit it. You're both on edge and saying things you don't mean. As far as I'm concerned, neither of you is a murderer. We don't even know if Captain Friday's dead. Well, he disappeared in a mighty queer way. Now, wait a minute. Before we go a mite further, we're going to have a pot of black coffee. It's four o'clock and mighty black and miserable outside. Mayor, you go make the coffee. And Parker, you stir up the fire. It's getting a mite cold, appears like. I'm going to fix Miss Carroll here so she'll rest easier. What is all this foolishness? You go along now, Mayor Friday, and do what I tell you. Well... You keep an eye on Parker. Yeah, I'll take care of Parker. You go make the coffee. And Parker, you do what I tell you. Go rake up the coals and put fresh wood on the fire. Well, all right, but... No, never mind about anything. Now, Parker, you go do as I say. All right. But I think Mayor Friday's got a guilty conscience. <laughs> well, well, now, ain't this a mess, Miss Carroll? 
Oh, I, I'm so mixed up, Dr. Tuner. I, I don't know what it's all about anymore. <laughs> it is getting kind of complicated, ain't it? But you'll see. It'll come out all right. You don't think Jimmy killed Captain Friday, do you? Now then, Jimmy Parker's a nice boy, Miss Carroll. I don't reckon you've got much to worry about him. And Mayor Friday's such a grouchy old man. No, no, Miss Carroll. I reckon maybe you wouldn't say that if you'd known Mayor Friday as long time as I have. Now then, you sort of shift over so I can straighten this sheet under you. Uh, careful of that shoulder. Oh. Uh-oh, did we hurt you? Oh, it's all right. You've got your bed all torn up, shifting and turning. There, now that's better. I'll straighten the covers over you a bit. There. And if you need this extra blanket, you just sing out. How's the pillow? It's very comfortable. Thank you, Dr. Tunney. Good. Now I'm going to fix you up a real strong bit of sleeping medicine. Then when you've had your hot drink, you're going to get hot milk instead of coffee. You just slip off to sleep before you know it. Oh, Mayor. Uh, what do you want? Warm up a glass of milk for Miss Carroll while you're about it. All right. There. That's a fire that'll last until morning. Good. Here, Parker, hold this spoon for me. Yeah. There, now I'll take it. Uh, bring that glass of water from the table, will you? Now, Miss Carroll, you just swallow this spoonful of mixture and then take a drink of water. Is it very bad? I'm not very good at taking medicine. Oh, I don't reckon you'll even taste it. Here you go now. Jimmy, give me that water quick. Here, Phil. <sighs> yeah, not so bad, was it, Miss Carroll? Well, I've taken things I liked a lot better. Here's the coffee and the hot milk. Mm, all right. All right, Miss Carroll. Now you sip this glass of milk while we're drinking our coffee. Now let's stop this monkey business and get back to important matters. Now, now, Mayor, I was just thinking that none of us ain't quite so belligerent as we were a few minutes ago. Well. So I thought I'd sort of act as pacifier and sum up everything. Is that all right for the rest of you? Yeah, all right with me. Go ahead, Doc. Now, this is the thing as I see it. Captain Friday and Parker went out of the cottage when they heard old Clawfoot monkeying around. Before he went out, the captain locked you in the bedroom, Mayor, said he didn't want to awaken you. Then he and Parker went out to the shed in back where they'd laid out that skeleton. And lo and behold, the skeleton was gone. But the skeleton had come apart and left a trail of bones. Captain Friday and Parker here followed this trail and found that it led down to Ernie Morton's grave. Well, get along, get along, Doc. We all know about that. Well, I reckon I'll have to tell this my own way, Mayor. Now then, when they got down to the grave, blamed if there wasn't someone digging in it. That's what Parker says. Yes. So he and the captain dropped down behind a tombstone, and then Captain Friday insisted on creeping out to the grave alone. Well, Parker waited, and when he didn't hear any sound, he peeked out, and there wasn't a soul any place. That right, Parker? Yeah. Sounds dead burn funny to me. Now, never mind, Mayor. Well, back up here at the cottage, me and Miss Carroll were having our own trouble. Old Clawfoot broke in, clumped me over the head, and Miss Carroll fainted. But I'm getting a little ahead of my story. We got scared when we heard old Clawfoot, and I broke into your bedroom door, and there wasn't hiding her hair of you. We're still wondering, Mayor, how you got out of that room with the door locked and the windows barred the way they are. Go on with your story, Doc. Hmm. Yes, we're going to keep on wondering. Well, then we don't know what old Clawfoot wanted in the cottage here, because he'd left before Miss Carroll came to. What about the black pearl? Now, I'm coming to that, Parker. It seems that just as Miss Carroll came to, Parker here ran into the house, saw how things was, quieted Miss Carroll, and brought me to. And then he announced that Captain Friday had vanished at old Ernie Morton's grave. We were all pretty worried. Mayor Friday had vanished, and so had his son. And then who should walk in on us but the mayor himself? Ain't you never coming to the point, I'm Doc? I'm getting there, Mayor. I'm getting there. The thing is, you accuse Parker of doing away with your son. Then right on that, I happen to reach under Miss Carroll's pillow to sort of straighten it out for her. And what do I pull out but one of the black pearls? One of the Theodore Beverly black pearls. Supposed to be buried somewhere in the city of the dead. Old Clawfoot left it, I tell you. Well, Parker here claims that Clawfoot left the pearl when he raided the place. Mayor Friday thinks that his son and Parker discovered the hiding place of the pearls, and Parker killed Captain Friday so he could have the loot for himself. The mayor thinks that after doing away with the captain, Parker brought one of the pearls here to show Miss Carroll, and then hid it under her pillow. Parker denies this, and so does Miss Carroll. Don't you, Miss Carroll? You know, the sleeping mixture's worked. He's gone off like a lamb. Well, that's good. She needs the rest. Poor little Phyllis. Well, to go on with our story, suddenly Parker here lets out a yell and says he reckons the mayor himself knows what became of Captain Friday. He points to a gold pencil in the mayor's vest pocket, and he says it belonged to Captain Friday. 
He had it with him when they went out of the house together earlier this evening. Likewise, he points out that the mayor has fresh earth on the knees of his trousers. Now, that's how things stack up to this point. Is that right? That's right. Well, what do you got to say to Parker's accusations, Mayor? Nothing, except that the boy is a lunatic. Now, now, Mayor, ain't you going to explain how you came by your son's pencil? It is the captain's pencil, ain't it? Uh, yes, I reckon. Well, ain't you going to tell us how you got it, Mayor? Don't mind. Parker's simply mistaken. My son loaned me the pencil this morning, and I forgot to return it. That's all. You mean the captain didn't have the pencil when he went out this evening? That's what I'm saying, Doc. That's not the truth, and you know it's not. Are you calling me a liar, Parker? I'm sorry, but I reckon he's got a right to in this instance, Mayor. What do you mean, Doc? I mean, Mayor, that I was using that gold pencil myself just before we went to bed tonight. And I returned it to Captain Friday along about ten o'clock. You couldn't have had it, Mayor. Yeah. Well, what about it, Mayor? Oh, I must have two gold pencils, then. I see. You still stick to your story, then? Uh, of course. Why shouldn't I? It's the truth. Well, what about the earth on your trousers? I was down on my knees several times looking for tracks tonight. But that's freshly dug earth, Mayor Friday. Yeah, quite a detective, ain't you, Parker? And what about the black pearl, Dr. Tuner? You're not going to let Mayor Friday keep that. It doesn't belong to him. It's part of Phyllis's estate. Oh, I reckon the mayor will take good care of it, Parker. I'd rather have you keep it, Dr. Tuner. Don't be a fool, boy. The pearls are safe with Mayor Friday as it is with me. Well, come on, Parker. There's been enough foolishness. What? What do you mean? You heard me say I was going to lock you up, didn't you? Yeah, but look here. Shh. Listen to that. The phantom church bell is ringing again, Mayor. Uh, what of it? I'm getting so used to it, I don't pay no attention to it no more. Just the same. It's ringing, and I don't like it. Anyway, that don't affect you, Parker. Come on. No, Mayor, be sort of reasonable. You leave me be, Doc. I know what I'm about. Well, where are you going to put him, Mayor? Ain't many good lock-up places left in this house. Put him in his bedroom, of course. You don't reckon that'd help much, since the feller sawed the bars off his window the other night. Well, and I'll put him in the girls' room. Sorry, Mayor, but I busted in the door, as you can see. Well, what in tarnation will I do with him, then? Now, look here, Mayor. Let the boy alone. He ain't going to run off while the girl's sick of bed here. I ain't so much afeard of his running away. Well, what is it, then? He's liable to treat the rest of us just as he done my son. Now, now, Mayor, you don't believe young Parker here killed the captain. You know you don't believe that. Listen. There's the clawfoot. Nasty brute. He drools and sucks his teeth all the while. I saw that much before he knocked me out. I, I wouldn't mind the whole business half so much if it wasn't for him. It makes my flesh creep. How was he dressed, Dr. Tuner? Did he still have on those flowing white robes? I reckon he had his robe on all right, Parker. And his bare, hairy shanks were sticking out below. Bare, eh? Did you notice his feet, Doc? Did you see if he did have claw feet? No, Mayor. I reckon I was too busy watching the knife in his hand to pay much attention to his feet. The bell. That phantom church bell. Yeah, it seemed to be an almighty lot of action down in the City of the Dead tonight. Though who ever heard of corpses rising from their graves at four o'clock in the morning? Dark as the inside of a cow. Oh, did you hear that? Hear what, Parker? I heard footsteps on the porch. Listen. The whole phantom company of the old abandoned graveyard seems to be rising up at this dark hour to take part in the mystery of the city of the dead. The phantom church bell tolls. Old clawfoot wails among the tombstones. And now, the approach of stealthy footsteps outside the cottage. If the sinister figure of violence is coming, but wait. Do you hear it? Now, who in Tunket? Can't see a thing out the window. Darker and pitch black. Reckon it's Clawfoot, Mayor? How should I know? Not unless he's put on shoes. Listen. What's he doing anyway? Patrolling our front porch? Hey, you carrying a gun, Mayor? Yeah, I sure am, and I'm going to throw open the door. Now, be careful, Mayor. you got a light to your back. He's got you at a disadvantage. Put out the light. It won't do no good. The light from the fireplace is just as bad. Well, I'm going to chance it. Be careful, Mayor. Ain't nothing out here, Doc. Well, it's just as well, Mayor. Come on back in and shut the door. Dang funny. <clears throat> There must have been something out there besides just them footsteps. Yeah, of course there was, but... Shh! Listen. There they are again. 
It's strange. Old Clawfoot never pulled anything like this before. I still want to know when he put on shoes. Ah, of course it's Clawfoot. Who else could it be? I don't know. Besides, Clawfoot always wailed before when he was around. Well, we heard wailing back a bit. Yeah, but that was way off. We haven't heard a sound since the footsteps began. Shh, listen. I'm going to find out about this, Dad Bottom. Now, wait a minute, Mayor. I wouldn't go out there again. Of course I'm going out. Here, give me that flashlight. Well, if you're going out, Mayor, so am I. Well, come on. Nobody's keeping you. Just the same. I think we hadn't ought to go. Do as you like. I'm going. See, as soon as you touch that latch, the footsteps stop. You see anything, Mayor? <laughs> no. Porch is empty. Uh, hello? Look there, Doc. By gum, a sack of something. Now, where did that come from, do you suppose? I reckon our visitor left it for us. A gunny sack or something or other. Yeah. It ain't so very heavy. Mm, all tied up. What do you suppose it is? Come on, Mayor, bring it into the house. What have you got there, Mayor? Shut the door, will you, Doc? Found this sack out on the porch just now, Parker. Put the chain on, Doc. Yep. What is it? Don't know yet. Say... Do you suppose it's the rest of the Black Pearls? I jiggers, Mayor. Hand me the knife on the table there, Doc. We'll soon find out. Yeah, here you are, Mayor. If it is the Pearls, remember, they belong to Phyllis and no one else. You stand back, young fella. This is none of your affair. It is my affair. I'm here to see that Phyllis gets what's coming to her. You'll both get what's coming to you before this thing settles. I reckon you two better stop glaring at each other. Now, Mayor, go on. Cut that sack open. And make him stand back. Come on, Parker. Be a sensible chap. Well, I'm going to see what's in that sack. Well, of course you are. What is it, Mayor? What's in the sack? If I ever catch the fellow that done this... A sack of bones. A skeleton. Our skeleton's back with us again. Somebody is playing tricks on me, and I ain't gonna have it. Yeah, but look. Look there around its neck. It's back with another message. Jiminy, Mayor. Look there. Yeah. Printed, just like the other one. Yeah. Hmm. Listen to this. For twenty years, I've been resting uneasy in the grave of Theodore Beverly, because it is not my grave, and I do not belong in it. The bones that belong in Theodore Beverly's grave lie at this moment in the burned ruins of Lammy Fink's cabin. What's that, Doc? That's what it says. Well, what does it mean? I reckon it means, for one thing, that Theodore Beverly is dead. Well, I'm glad to know that, anyway. Glad? What do you mean by that, Parker? Well, to tell the truth, Dr. Tuner, I've had a hunch all along that old Clawfoot might be Phyllis's grandfather, Theodore Beverly. Hey, you know, come to think about it, I reckon I've had about the same idea in the back of my mind. Would have been terrible for Phyllis. They've never known for sure whether her grandfather was dead. Now, wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. I wonder if this message means that one of them three bodies that was burned up in Lammy's cabin was that of old man Beverly. I don't see how it could be. We know the caretaker, Lammy Fink, and Parker here identified the other as Miss Carroll's cousin, Bert Arnold. But there was a third body. No, no, that couldn't have been Theodore Beverly. It was too young a man. Then there must have been a fourth body in the cabin when it burned. No, I swear there wasn't. Then if this skeleton's telling the truth... Beverly must have been one of the three. Well, he wasn't. You know, we ain't under any obligations to believe these here messages uh, from the grave, as it were. Somebody may be just sending them to throw us off the track. I don't believe it, Doctor. There's something behind these notes. Someone's trying to warn us about something. All fired, unpleasant way of doing it. It's someone with a horrible, morbid complex. I've read about people with queer fetishes, fixed ideas and all that. This looks to me like the work of someone with a graveyard complex... A morbid fascination for skeletons. Yeah, I reckon he's morbid, all right, whoever he is. Yeah, that bell's ringing more tonight than any time yet. And every time it's rung, something's happened. Oh, I reckon not every time, Parker. Well, it seems like it. There. There, do you hear that? Clawfoot, eh? Yeah, didn't I tell you? The bell rings and then Clawfoot begins to wail. I reckon that thing it wail, bell or no bell. Well, just the same, that bell's getting on my nerves. I wish it would hurry and get light. Yeah, not for another half hour yet. Shh. What's the matter, Dr. Turner? I thought I heard something in your room, Parker. Listen. Oh, don't hear nothing, Doc. Reckon you was mistaken. Maybe so, Mayor, but I... I'm sure I heard something, though. But how could anyone get into my room? Well, somebody could climb in between those sawed-off bars on your window. What did it sound like, Doc? You remember I told you how Clawfoot sniveled and drooled? Yeah. Sounded just like that. Maybe Clawfoot is back in the house again. Listen. There's Clawfoot wailing outside. It can't be him. Yeah, likely it was, my imagination. Yeah, I reckon it was, Doc. 
But just the same, I'm going to take a look in there. Well, I'll go along, just in case. Got the flashlight? Yes. Shall I come? I reckon two's enough. You stay with the girl. Well, are you coming? Yep. It's got the mayor. It's got the mayor. Parker, come here. I saw it. I saw it, Doc. Just as the mayor opened the door, a hand reached out and jerked him into the bedroom. And it slammed the door right in my face and locked it. You're sure the door's locked? Yes, of course I am. <laughs> Do something. Do something. We've got to save him if we can. Break down the door. That's it. That's it. Grab that chair. Stand back, Doc. Get away from the door. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Harder, Parker. Here, let me do it. Stand back. I almost got it that time. It's giving. It's giving. Yeah, hit her lower down. <laughs> There she goes. We got her that time. And then we were waking Phyllis. Well, come on. She'll be all right. Look. Look, there's a mare. Turn your flash over there in the corner. <laughs> Murder. No. No, he's not. Look, he's sitting up. Mayor. Mayor Friday, who was it? What happened? <laughs> oh, he, he, he choked me. Are you all right, Mayor? Are you hurt? <laughs> oh, he tried, he tried to wring my neck. <laughs> Dear. Here, help me up. Who was it strangled you? How'd he get away? Uh, I don't know. And out through the window when you started battering the door, whoever he was. Yeah. Can you stand? <laughs> yes, I reckon so. Well, you don't need me. I'm going to Phyllis. Yeah, I'll bring the mayor. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, what's happened? What's the matter now? Phyllis. Phyllis, you mustn't cry like that. I'm all right. Look, Phil, here I am. Oh, Jimmy, what was that noise? It wasn't anything, Phil. Really, it wasn't. But look. What's the matter with Mayor Friday? Why, he just slipped and hurt himself. <laughs> Jimmy, you're not telling me the truth. Now, now, Miss Carroll, don't you go to getting excited. The mayor's all right. Yeah, my neck feels as big as a barrel. Being strangled ain't no picture. Strangled? Strangled? Did somebody try to strangle the mayor? Oh, Phil, please, please. It wasn't anything. Really, it wasn't, Phil. Oh, no, not anything, not anything. Well, I reckon you won't say that when I tell you that feller got your precious black pearl. The pearl? What's that? You let him have the pearl, Mayor Friday? No, I didn't let him have it. He took it. Well, I swan. Got it, did he? Went right through your pockets, did he, Mayor? Held me by the throat with one hand and lifted the pearl out of my vest pocket with the other. Who was it, Jimmy? Who did it? We don't know. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. Well, it wasn't Clawfoot. We've been hearing him outside. No, no, it wasn't Clawfoot. Look. He had on dark clothes. Dawn's beginning to break. Look, Phil, you can see it through the windows. Oh, I'm so glad. Just the same, I'd like to know who got a hold of that black pearl. How did the person know about it in the first place? None of us had a chance to talk with anyone on the outside since it was found. That's an idea, Parker. And more than that, how did this burglar know that the mayor had the pearl? There's something mighty queer here. A lot of queer things, that's a fact. And another queer thing. In spite of the fact that Mayor Friday claims he was choked until his neck felt like a barrel and he could hardly breathe, have you noticed there wasn't a mark any place on his neck? Look here, Parker. I guess that's just about the now, limit. Now, now, Mayor. You're an old medical man, Doctor. I ask you, does a mayor's neck look as though he'd been choked? Look, you blasted young smart Eric. You keep on sticking that snoot of yours into other folks' business and watch what happens. You're afraid to let Doc examine your throat. You know as well as I do that you weren't choked. So does Dr. Tuner here. No, no, don't include me in your fracases. Are you going to let Dr. Tuner examine you? Well, if it means shut dad burn much, yes. I'll let him look at my neck. Come on out in the kitchen, Doc. Why out in the kitchen? Let him examine it right here in front of me. Look here. Who are you ordering around? Whose house is this? I guess we've just about got you cornered, Mayor. Nothing left to defend yourself with but a lot of hot air and bluster. No, but after all, Parker, both you and me saw that hand reach out and jerk the mayor into the bedroom. We both saw that. Maybe there was a hand. Maybe there really was someone in the bedroom. But if there was, the fellow was a friend of the mayor's. Now, now, Parker, I wouldn't say that. Well, I wouldn't. I say it again. Maybe you're in on it, Dr. Tuner, and maybe you're not. But whether you are or not, Mayor Friday knows what it's all about. Yes, that's right, Parker. I know a good many things. Too much for your own safety. Well, I've used my eyes, and I can tell you, Mayor Friday, I've picked up a few things of my own. When the showdown comes, I'm not going to be tongue-tied either. Oh, Jimmy, please don't quarrel. I'm so tired I can't even cry anymore. I just lie here and ache. Poor little Phil. This has been an awful night for you. Rub your hand over my head, Jimmy. My face is so hot. Oh, of course I will. Oh, that feels so good. Your hands are cool, Jimmy. So nice and cool. There, I'll try to relax. The church bell, Jimmy. Do you hear it? 
The Sandham church bell. There, there, Phyllis. That medicine I gave her a while back is strong enough to put her to sleep again, Parker. I think she's drifting off. She's going back to sleep in spite of herself. Jimmy, dear. Yes, Phil? Jimmy, dear, will you please go to the window and, and see if it isn't almost light? I think I could go to sleep if it wasn't so dark. Of course, I'll go to the window. It should be getting light. The night is beginning to break up, Phil. It isn't near as dark as it was. I can see the shapes of trees down as far as the edge of the road. It's getting light. It's getting light. Now I can sleep. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so tired. Yes, in another 15 minutes, Dawn will be down here in the City of the Dead. Shh, Parker. She's dropped off. She's gone back to sleep. <coughs> My gosh, Doc! Cough was right outside the house. Oh, for... Yes. Yes, I see him moving among the trees, just his outline, but I couldn't miss him. Where? Where? I don't see him. Watch over there by that big pine. See? See? Do you see him? Yes. Yes, I see him. See him there? Sure. My gosh, Doc. Look! Look right behind him. Do you see it? Something's crawling after Clawfoot. Something's stalking Clawfoot. Watch. Watch. He's going to leap. <coughs> it's a man. It's a man. He's got Clawfoot. He's got Clawfoot. Look, he's handling him like a baby. Can you see who it is? No. No, it's too dark. Look, he's got him gagged. He's picking him up on his arms. He's kidnapping Clawfoot. He's kidnapping Clawfoot. <coughs> The story of Theodore Beverly's priceless black pearls is whirling into a great seething cauldron of sinister activity. Captain Friday vanishes. Old Clawfoot kidnapped. Old Mayor Friday lying right and left like a cornered pirate. And the phantom church bell. Where is it? What makes it ring so persistently? All these get further explanation next week when Carlton E. Morse Productions brings you another episode in Adventures by Morse. Listen for Chapter 9 of The City of the Dead, entitled The Trail of the Phantom Church Bell. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Nine o'clock on the morning of the third day in the City of the Dead. The most harrowing night in the lives of Phyllis Carroll and Jimmy Parker is past. During this night of terror, the following incidents have taken place. Captain Friday has disappeared. Jimmy Parker is convinced that it was Mayor Friday whom he and the captain saw digging in Ernie Morton's grave just before Captain Friday disappeared. One of the black pearls belonging to the collection of Theodore Beverly, Phyllis's grandfather, was found under her pillow. It was placed in the mayor's care and within half an hour was taken from him by some mysterious person. Then, in conclusion, the inmates of the mayor's cottage, including Jimmy, Phyllis, old Dr. Tuner, and the mayor watching the dawn break from one of the windows, saw old Clawfoot captured and carried off by someone unrecognizable in the dim light. But the night is behind them. The warm morning sun has become a tonic to the shattered nerves of the group and has done much to dispel the terror of the night hours. Phyllis alone is still abed with her wounded shoulder. Jimmy. Well, hello there, sleepyhead. Good morning. Jimmy. Lie down, Phil. You hurt your shoulder. Oh. See? Oh. I told you. Now you lie still. I forgot. Jimmy, is everything all right? Right as rain. But old Clawfoot was kidnapped. All the better. We don't have to worry about him anymore. I just remember you saying that. And then I guess I went back to sleep. But what happened after that? Not a thing. Dr. Tuner and Mayor Friday went out, but they couldn't find a trace of anything. Clawfoot and whoever captured him had vanished. How long have I been asleep, Jimmy? Four hours. It's just past nine now. I feel an awful lot better now. Hungry? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. 
Ah, oh, gee, Phil, it's good to hear you laugh mm-hmm. again. It seems ages since we've had anything to laugh at. Well, things are going to be all right now, aren't they, Jimmy? I don't know, Phil. I hope so. What? What's the matter? Has something else happened? No, thank heavens, no. But everything is just as mixed up as it was last night. It just doesn't seem so bad in the daylight. Oh. And Phil... What is it, Jimmy? I hate to tell you. I suppose I ought to. Oh, of course you should. Everything. Well, the mayor called up the police station in the city this morning. Jimmy. I tried him to, to try to get him not to do it, and so did Dr. Tuna. Well, does, does that mean we've got to go to jail? I don't know. I didn't hear what he said on the phone, but, well, you know how he feels toward me. Well, don't you worry about it. I know you haven't done anything. They can't lock you up. They can't. I know. They can make it awfully hot for us, Phyllis. We did dig in Ernie Morton's grave, and the next morning, Bert Arnold's body was found buried there. How can we possibly prove that we didn't murder Bert? Where are Dr. Tuner and the mayor now? Well, the mayor's gone down into the city of the dead. Dr. Tuner was out in the kitchen just a minute ago. I suppose he stepped outside. Anyway, Jimmy, if if the police do come, we won't have to spend another night in this terrible place. We wouldn't anyway. Oh, I hate Mayor Friday. He's been antagonistic toward us ever since we first came here asking for help. He's got an awful guilty conscience or something. Do you suppose he's been looking for the pearls himself? That would explain why he'd be jealous of us. Dr. Tuner must be in on it, too, then. Oh, no, I'm sure he's not. He's so friendly and gentle, I... I don't think he knows anything about what the mayor's been up to. How could he help it? Hasn't he been coming down to the City of the Dead for the last 20 years to visit his old patients buried here, he says? And I reckon that's the truth, too, son. Hey! Dr. Tuner! How long have you been standing there listening? No, no, Parker. Ain't no use to get all worked up on a nice, sunshiny morning like this. Well, just the same, you had no business eavesdropping. Parker, I reckon you've got a lot to learn. It ain't always the best policy to jump at conclusions. You're young yet. Someday you'll find out diplomacy is a mighty fine trait to cultivate. Well, facts are facts. Yeah, I reckon they are, my boy. Just the same, I venture to say that three-fourths of your trouble here has been of your own making. But what do you mean? I mean you should have done your best to make the mayor like you instead of irritating and badgering him. You ain't had any considerations from his feelings right along. So why should he bother to think anything but the worst about you? But I've never accused Mayor Friday of anything that wasn't perfectly apparent on the surface. No, of course you haven't. Neither has he suspected you of anything that didn't look almighty queer. Yeah, but I told the truth. Yeah, I reckon you did. That ain't the point. You've made the mayor dislike you all along. Now, when there comes a time when you want him to trust and believe in you, he naturally turns against you. What time will the police be here? Oh, I don't reckon there'll be anyone down before afternoon. Is he going to turn Phyllis and me over to him? Well, the mayor don't do much talking, not even to me. But you don't think we've done anything wrong, do you, Dr. Turner? Well, I calculate I'd rather not say what I believe, Miss Carroll. But say now, I've been standing here lecturing you two when I come in to see about breakfast. Hot cake batter's all mixed up and the skillet's piping hot. Mmm, hot cakes. Are they the sour milk kind? <laughs> I reckon sour milk hotcakes are the only real hotcake there is. Oh, I adore them. Oh, come on, Jimmy. You are hungry, aren't you? No, uh, I suppose so. Miss Carroll, you're lucky to have a young fellow like Jimmy Parker. He sat by by your bed all the time you were asleep. He just wouldn't move from your side. Oh, Jimmy, you shouldn't have done that. Haven't you had any sleep all night? No, forget it, Phil. I feel fine. Yeah, I'll go out and put on a batch of hotcakes. Oh, by the way, Miss Carroll, do you like your eggs straight up or over easy? Over easy. Oh, isn't he a dear? Mine straight up, doctor. One straight up, one over easy. I got some mighty fine home-cured bacon for you, too. Jimmy, it was awfully nice of you to sit beside me while I slept. I think that was why my dreams were so sweet. Oh, Phil, dear, you were so lovely sleeping. All the time I sat here beside you, you were smiling in your sleep. I wondered what you were dreaming about. (laughs) Don't you wish you knew? Phil, dear, was it... Listen, Jimmy Parker, you go get me a pan of warm water and a comb and a mirror. You're a fine nurse. I'll bet you'd have let me eat breakfast without even powdering my nose. (laughs) Yeah, I guess I would. But, Phil... Hurry, Jimmy, or Dr. Tuner will be in here with the hotcakes before I'm ready. They're browning nicely. I got a good dew on them this morning. Oh, here comes the mayor, Dr. Tuner. I caught a glimpse of him through the window. Well, I'll put a couple more eggs in the pan, then. Good morning, Mayor Friday. Yeah. Good morning, Miss Carroll. How do you feel? Oh, much better, thank you. Mayor Friday, 
Are you going to turn Jimmy and me over to the police? Now, now, Miss Carroll. But we only parked Jimmy's car near the City of the Dead. I think if you understood about us... Miss Carroll, I think you and I ought to have a good long talk together. Why, what about? Shh. Here comes young Parker. We'll talk about it after breakfast, huh? <laughs> Here you are, Phil. Oh, Mayor Friday. Yes, it's me. Here, Phil, is a basin of water and soap and wash rag. Thank you, Jimmy. Now, if you'll get me a comb and a hand mirror... Sure thing. I... Comb and a mirror. All right. Here you are. Thanks. And now, if you two men will go out in the kitchen with Dr. Tuner so a girl can have a little privacy... Sure, I'll... okay. Come on, Mayor Friday. We'll get together after breakfast, miss. Yeah, pretty good cook, if I do say so myself. Mmm, smells good. Yeah, there's a stack of cakes about ready. Oh, hello, Mayor. Ready to eat? Be ready as soon as I wash up. I put the table in beside Miss Carroll's bed so we could be sort of sociable. Hey, Doc Tuner, why don't you let me fry the hot cakes? I can jump up from the table and trot out here to the kitchen easier than you. No, I reckon I'm the hot cake expert. Say, Doctor, do you feel a difference this morning? I can't explain it. I feel as though a great weight had been lifted. Well, I reckon I know what you mean, Parker. I, I feel chipper this morning myself. It's as though we had passed through a nightmare and now the danger's over. Hmm. You don't suppose it's because old Clawfoot isn't hanging around any longer, do you? Well, I don't know as I can say that... Oh, Jimmy! Jimmy! Oh, coming, Phil! Well, didn't take you very long. <laughs> it was hard to get the powder on straight when I had to hold the mirror propped up against my knees. Hi, Doctor! Phil's ready! Bring on the bacon and eggs. And oodles of hot cake. Breakfast coming up. Everyone sit down. Uh, Miss Carroll gets her plate in her lap. <laughs> right side up, though, please. <laughs> I'll sit here by the bed so I can hand things to Phil. No hot cakes for me, Doc. I think too much of my insides. Why, Mayor, they're lovely. Really, they are, Dr. Tuner. Now, don't you feel bad. Oh, Mayor can't hurt my feelings that way, Miss Carroll. <laughs> I ain't been able to make him eat a hot cake in all the 20 years I've known him. He simply ain't got the taste for them. Oh, they're great, Doctor. I, I was up to Lammy Fink's cabin this morning. That is, what's left of it since it burned down. Lammy Fink? Mayor Friday, just who was Lammy Fink? An old feller I had working for me in the City of the Dead. Kind of adulated, but he was a good worker. Loved flowers. Well, what about it, Mayor? Why did you go to his cabin? Made the trip for nothing. Everything fell into the cellar when the building burned. Couldn't get to the bottom with all those burned timber, cook stove, and other junk that crashed down into the basement. Couldn't tell how many bodies really was in the place then, huh? No. Oh, listen. The church bell. Well, that's the first time I've heard it ring in the daytime. Mighty strange. Mighty strange. Heard it a couple of times already this morning. Now, look here. If it keeps up, we should be able to trace it in the daylight. Been thinking about that. Yeah, I think we should go right after breakfast, don't you, Mayor? One of us ought to. Both of you go along. I'll stay with Phyllis. No. But look here, Mayor. Surely you don't think I'd run away and leave Phyllis. You know as well as I do that with that knife wound in her shoulder, I couldn't possibly move her. Gonna keep you under my eye until the police get here. Oh. Well, then suppose you take Parker with you, Mayor, and I'll stay with Miss Carroll. No. Well, Mayor, I'll go look for the bell alone if you say so, but I'll tell you flat, I ain't hankering for it even by daylight. You know how the fog comes up in the middle of the day. Might as well be night when that miserable stuff settles down in the city of the dead. I ain't asking you to go alone. You'll take Parker with you. But look here, Mayor. I promised Phyllis I wouldn't leave her again, and I'm not going to. I... Jimmy, maybe you'd better do what the mayor says. You want me to go and leave you here with this... With... With Mayor Friday? Oh, no. Well, that is... Oh, please, Mayor Friday. Just Jimmy have to go. Yes. Well, I won't. Now, oh, now, Parker, what was I telling you this morning? I reckon you better come along with me. Dr. Tuner, you don't want me to leave Phyllis with this... this man. Why not? I ain't gonna eat her. Well, if I should leave Phil and... if anything should happen, I'd never forgive myself. Well, I reckon the mayor's just as capable of looking out for Miss Carroll as you or me. Yeah, but look here, if I can't stay with Phyllis, why don't you stay here, Dr. Tuner, and let Mayor Friday take me to look for the Phantom Bell? No, you're gonna do what I say. What? Well, I guess it'll be all right, Jimmy... You go along with Dr. Tuner. Something's wrong. Why do you want to separate Phyllis and me? Oh, now, Parker, nothing's wrong. Look here, young fella. I'm going to tell you something for your own good. The quicker you learn not to suspect the people around you, the better you'll get on in this world. You're keeping something from us. No matter what you think, Parker, you're going out with Dr. Tuner, and that's final. Supposing I refuse to go? You haven't got a chance of refusing. You're going with Doc Tuner even if he has to walk behind you with a gun. Oh, please, Jimmy. I'll be all right. 
Honest, I will. Uh, I don't like it. Well, I reckon the girl... Hello, what in Tunket made that shadow? Where, where's the sun? Going behind a cloud, I suppose. No, it ain't. It's a fog coming in. What, already? Saw it coming from way off when I was up at Lammy Fink's cabin. Yeah, looks as though we're going to hunt that church bell in the fog. Shouldn't have no trouble if it keeps her ringing the way it has been. Oh, dear. And I was feeling so much better. Uh, more hotcakes, Parker? No, no more. What about you, Phil? No, thank you. Oops. Mighty skinny appetites. Well, if everybody's finished, let's just carry the table back into the kitchen. Grab a hold there, Mary. Yeah. As soon as we get the dishes stacked, Parker and I will go on down to the old church. Look here, Phyllis. If you're afraid to stay here alone with Mayor Friday, you just say the word and I won't go. That gun business is all hooey. Dr. Tuna wouldn't shoot anybody. No, Jimmy. You go ahead. It'll be all right. Really, it will. Only... Well, I wish this fog wasn't settling down on us again. It makes me cold inside just to think of it. Listen, Phil. I found this knife out in the kitchen. Jimmy! It's the one you were stabbed with. Oh, take it away. No. No, Phil. Take it under the cover with you. Oh, no. I don't want Shh, it. Don't let Doc of the Mayor here. Please take it. Hide it under the covers. I'll feel a lot better if you if I know you've got something to protect yourself with. I, I hate the sight of it. It's a terrible weapon. You'll be glad enough to have it if you were fighting for your life. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Nothing really, Phil. Only well, here, take it. All right, but why oh, you what an ugly handle. Quick, put it under the covers and don't tell anyone. Oh, I I hate it. There. Now, if anyone gets funny, you can carve your initials on him. Why is old Mayor Friday so intent on having Phyllis to himself? What is it that Jimmy fears for her? And beyond all else, what will Jimmy and Dr. Tuner find in taking up the trail of the Phantom Church Bell? And the missing Captain Friday? But more of all that in just a moment. That ugly knife gives me the shivers. I won't rest a bit while it's under the covers with me. Use it if it's necessary. Here's something else. What is it? A whistle. Where did you get that? It's a police whistle Captain Friday left here. Take it. Why, what for? To use if you're in danger. Do you think something's going to happen to me? Not if I can help it. But but with this knife and, and the whistle... I don't want to frighten you, Phyllis. Honest, I don't know of a single thing that might happen. But, well, you know what a time we've had so far. Yes, I know. Well, and you take this whistle... If you get suspicious that things aren't going right, or you become frightened, you just blow this police whistle as hard as you can. You'll be surprised how far it'll carry. Do you think you could hear it anywhere in the city of the dead? I think so. Anyway, we won't be out of range of it very long. Oh, that does make me feel safer, to know that I can call you. Shh, watch it. Now, Parker, get your hat, and let's get started before the fog settles too thick among the tombstones. All right. I'll be right with you. Now then, Miss Carroll, don't you worry. You aren't in any danger, and nothing's going to happen while we're away. You just see if you can't get a lot of sleep today. If everything goes as it should, you'll be up and walking around another day or two. You're sure I'll be all right, Dr. Tudor? Well, of course you will. But don't be gone too long, will you? Oh, I don't reckon we'll be out any longer than we can help. Mayor, you're going to take good care of Miss Carroll now, ain't you? Yeah, I reckon me and Miss Carroll are going to get on right smart, ain't we, miss? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Me and her got a lot of things to talk about. Well, don't get so interested talking. You forget about your job as nurse, Mayor. Well, I'm ready, Dr. Tuner. All right, Parker. Goodbye, Phil. Remember, don't take any chances, will you? No, Jimmy. I promise. Come along, Parker. Come along. Look there, Dr. Tuner. There's Ernie Morton's grave just ahead. Let's look at it a minute. It's getting pretty foggy, Parker. We ought to keep moving. It won't take but a minute. Look here, Doctor. See, this is where Captain Friday and I were lying just before he sneaked over to the grave. You can still see the impression of my body in the grass. Mm -hmm. Looks so all right, son. Of course it's so. If that bell keeps ringing like this, we shouldn't have any trouble following it. Look here at the grave, Doc. Oh, come along, boy. Come along. But I want to prove to you that the grave was open last night. Yeah, how will you do that, Parker? Here. Look at this piece of sod turned upside down. Yeah, what's that prove? Look, the grass is still fresh and green when I turn it over. If that sod had been lying bottom side up since Captain Friday opened the grave three nights ago, the grass would have wilted, wouldn't it? I reckon you're right, son. Of course the grave was opened last night. You know what I think? Yeah, come along. You can talk as we're moving along. I think that it was Mayor Friday himself digging in that grave. Well, that ain't nothing new. You've been intimating that that's what you thought right along. 
Well, I never came right out and said it before. Yeah, well, there's the old church looming up down there through the fog. We must be getting near the bell. Doesn't sound much closer, though. What sort of woods are those behind the church? Oh, well, hardwood, mostly. Oak and beech, I reckon. Shall we go on down to the church and make that our starting point? All right, I... Hey, what do you keep cocking your ears back toward the house for, Parker? You can't hear anything down here. Don't know. Thought I might. It's a queer thing to say. What do you expect to hear this far off? Oh, never mind. Well, where are we going to look for this bell? Well, I reckon the best thing we can do is sneak down there alongside of the church and just sit and wait till we hear it. That'll give us a clue to work from. Yeah, but we might sit all day. Hey, there you are now. Listen. Gosh, can't tell anything about it, can you? Don't seem to come from any direction at all. That's a fact. Listen. Seems to be coming from the church, don't you think? Well, it ain't possible. The mayor and I gave the place a good going over, and so did Captain Friday, and the bell ain't in the ruins. Listen. Stopped again. Look, Parker, I've sort of had an idea that that bell might be out there in the woods in back of the church. What do you think? Well, maybe. Sounded in the church to me. Well, now, just supposing it was hanging out on a limb of a tree in the woods and was swinging free. Mm -hmm. The wind could blow it or rock the tree, and it'd ring soft-like off and on, just like it had been. But what would a bell be doing up in a tree? Well, there ain't any explaining a good many things down here in the city of the dead these days. Well, why these long waits between the ringing? Sometimes it's been hours. Well, perhaps there hasn't been enough wind to ring it. Well, there's as much breeze now as there was a moment ago when the bell was ringing, and that isn't any. Well, I... There she goes again. Now, listen careful and try to place the direction the sound's coming from. Just the same as before. I'd say the church. It does sound so. But it can't be, I tell you. Still, if it was out in the open, we ought to be able to walk right straight toward where it's ringing. Well, are we going to stand here all day or are we going to scout around and see what we can find? Yeah, this damp burned fog would have to come down just now. Danged if I know which way to turn. Look here, Dr. Tuner. Let's go inside the church and listen. Maybe we'll get some clues that way. Mm, might as well, I guess. Ain't no good standing around out here getting fog in your ears and throat and down your neck, that pesky stuff. Up in San Francisco, I rather like the fog. This is miserable stuff down here, all right. I've hated it ever since I can remember. Decayed atmosphere, that's what fog is to me. A nice day that's begun to rot. That's a pleasant thought. Mm, can't help it. I always get the grumps and the creeps and the sniffles in the fog. Worst nightmare I ever had was about fog. Well, here we are. We might as well go in. Good thing I brought a pocket flash along. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, but mind your way. Them floorboards are rotten as punk. You're likely to break a leg. You want to leave? No, you go on ahead. This here's your idea. Here, you can have a flashlight. Well... Okay. Ah, this is a miserable hole, isn't it? Everything wet and mildewed. Shh. Why, the bell's fainter in here than it was outside. I reckon I was right after all. Quick, let's get outside. Now we're getting somewhere. Hey, hey look out where you're going, fella. You'll go through the floor. Come on, Doc. Come on. Oh. Parker. Parker, are you hurt? Parker, are you hurt? Answer me. Parker, you got the flashlight. Turn it on. Parker, answer me. Answer me. Doctor. Dr. Tuner, don't carry on so. I'm all right. All right. All right. Well, then why in Tunket was you making them ghastly groans? That wasn't me, Doc. Wasn't you? No. There's someone else down here. I'm looking for my flash. I dropped it when I went through the floor. You say there's somebody else down there? Hey, Doc, stop asking questions and come and help me. I'm down in the basement. There must be a door to the outside someplace. Basement? Ba By George, that's right. This place has got a basement. Well, go outside and see if you can find a door to it. It's blacker than pitch down here, and something's down here with me. The door to the basement's right outside. I I'll be right with you. Oh, what a noise. Oh, blame it all. Where'd I drop that light? Doc ever gets that door. Hi there, Parker. Can you hear me? Yes. What's the matter? Is the door locked? All right, the hinges rusted so bad, I'll have to break the door down. Are you still all right? Yes. Hurry and break it in. I can't find my flashlight. Oh, this groaning is getting on my goat. Well, hang on. I got a piece of timber for a battering ram. Well, go to it, Doc. Oh, this is great. The bell! Hey, Doc, the bell! Hurry, Doctor, I discovered something. 
Dr. Tuner, I found the bell. The Phantom Church bell's here in the basement. Parker, are you crazy? No, I'm not. Here's my flashlight. There. There's your church bell. Look. Look there in the corner. Yeah. A man bound and gagged. Come on, Doc. Oh, so that's where them groans come from. You know him? No. Never saw him before in my life. Here, help me untie him. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Look at here. He ain't only bound and gagged. He's roped to this two before in the wall. Uh, they weren't taking any chance on his getting away. Yeah, poor chap. Mighty near dead. He's unconscious, isn't he? What's the matter with him? Uh, it looks mostly like starvation, but there's a bad lump here on his head. Uh, we'll have to carry him up to the house. Yeah, and mighty quick, too. He'll die on our hands. His heart ain't showing much signs. Stand aside, Parker. Uh, uh, uh. Look here at this old bell, Doctor. Standing here on its rack. Just swings clear of the floor. I can't figure out what made it ring, Parker. I've got it. This man was ringing it. It was the only way he could call for help. Look here, Doctor. See, he was tied to this two-by-four. When he stretched out his bound feet just as far as he could reach, the tip of his toe would just touch the rim of the bell. He'd give it a shove, and the bell would ring a few strokes. Why, criminy, Parker. And then he'd probably have long spells of unconsciousness on account of this crack on the head. That'd account for the spells of silence. <sighs> now then, you ready? There, yeah, you take his shoulders and uh, uh, his knees here. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Yeah, careful. Uh, he's bump his head on the door, Jan. Yeah, all clear. What'll we do? Leave the bell as it is? Sure, Parker. Ain't nobody gonna touch it. Just strike off through the tombstones and keep on the grass. It's easier walking. Poor guy. Looks more like a corpse than a living man. Yeah, so that was the answer to the phantom bell. No wonder we couldn't locate where the sound was coming from. By the time it got outside the cellar walls, the sound was so broken it seemed to come from everywhere. Funny you or the mayor didn't think of looking in the basement when you came down here three nights ago. Yeah, is it? Did you think of looking in the basement for a ringing church bell? Had to fall right in on top of it before you got the idea, didn't you? Just call out if you want to rest. Well, he's not heavy. Well, if we knew as much about old Clawfoot as we do about the bell... The whistle! That's Phyllis! Hey, don't drop the man. It's Phyllis, Doc! Something's happened to Phyllis! Hi, right, Parker, come back here! Something's happened to Phyllis! Don't you hear the whistle? <laughs> You have just heard the ninth episode of The City of the Dead, written for radio by Carlton E. Morse. Next week brings you Where the Pearls Were Hidden, the tenth and final episode of this adventure thriller. Next week you will know the identity of Old Clawfoot, the name of the man who rang the bell, what really became of Grandfather Theodore Beverly, who the murderers were, who the grave looters were, and what became of the famous collection of black pearls. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. Two o'clock on the afternoon of the third day in the City of the Dead. A drenching wet blanket of fog still lays upon this old abandoned cemetery. In our last episode, Jimmy Parker and Dr. Tuner had gone down into the City of the Dead in search of the phantom church bell, leaving Phyllis Carroll alone with Mayor Friday. Jimmy tried to prevent this arrangement, but was unsuccessful, and so at the last minute he slipped Phyllis the knife with which she had been stabbed two days previously, and a police whistle. If in danger, she was to blow the whistle. Jimmy and Doc then went down to the old church ruins and accidentally discovered the bell in the basement of the ruins. But that wasn't all we found. There was a man down there. He was bound and gagged and near death from a blow on the head and from starvation. He was the one who had been ringing the bell. Dr. Tuner and I unbound the now unconscious fellow and started back to the cottage with him. And halfway there... 
Suddenly, out of the murk and gloom came the piercing squeal of a police whistle. I knew that meant Phyllis was in danger. I dropped the unconscious man and ran through the fog for the cottage, leaving Doc Tuna to follow with the stranger as best he could. I'm coming! I'm coming, Phil! Oh, I was a fool to leave her with Mayor Friday. There's the house. Phil! Phil, I'm coming! I'm coming! Phyllis! Phyllis, what's the matter? Jimmy, you're so white. What's the matter with you? Well, isn't anything wrong? You blew the whistle. Oh, I know I didn't, Jimmy. You mean that police whistle, Parker? Captain Friday! Well, where did you come from? He's back, Jimmy. Nothing happened to him at all. Never mind that now. Were you talking about the police whistle? Yes. There's one of my men outside. I've got a whole crew down from the city hunting for that phantom church bell. Well, you don't need him. Dr. Tuna and I found it. What? You found it? You say you found the phantom church bell? Where? Yeah, Mayor Friday. Found it in the basement of the old church. Basement? Basement? Well, now, ain't that the beatenest? Why didn't I think of that right off? But who and Sam here would think of looking in a basement for a ringing bell? Oh, but look here, Parker. What made the bell ring? Well, there was a man. Say, we've got to go help Dr. Tuner. He's got a dying man down there in the City of the Dead. I left him alone when I heard the whistle. A man? Who is it? Well, I never saw him before. Neither did the doctor. You say he's dying? Well, that's what Dr. Tuner said. Well, come on, Parker. I want to see that man. Uh, well, listen. Here he comes now. Captain Friday. Now, very tongue. Never mind that now, Doc. What'd you do with the man? I reckon you won't need him any longer. Of course I do. I want to question him. Can't question him, Captain. He died back yonder while I was fetching him up. Died? Without saying a word? He was unconscious for a few seconds. Gave his name, told me who he was and how come he was tied up, and then he died. Oh, the poor fellow. Well, who was he? Said his name was William Rogers. Said he was an employee of Cartwright, Hobson, and Cartwright, the attorneys who sent Miss Carroll here her letter about the black where the black pearls were hidden. There! That's the key to the whole story. That's what I've been looking for. Doc, did he say what he was doing down here in the City of the Dead? He said he was looking for the black pearl. Why, the dirty double-crossing son of a thief, he got what was coming to him. Them was his own last words, Captain. Said he deserved what he got. Did he say how he got information about the pearls? Yes, he said that two days before the letter was sent to Miss Carroll, it was taken out of the company vault and put in a special file. He had access to this file and made a practice of stealing information that he could sell. What a fine piece of jail bait he was. Cartwright will be tickled pink to hear about this. Well, that just about gives me a line on this whole affair. You mean you can explain everything now? Yes, Miss Carroll. It's a deuce of a mess, but I got it straight, I think. And and you don't think Jimmy or I killed my cousin, Bert Arnold? No, wait. Let's go back to the beginning of the whole thing. Here, sit down, Parker. You too, Doctor. A long and intricate story, and it's going to take a while telling you. Sit here on the bed beside me, Jimmy. Oh, you mind putting another log on the fire first, Parker? Oh, sure thing. So you got the whole thing straightened out, Captain. Yeah, right? but with you and Dad acting like a couple of clams, I mighty near slipped up. Eh, no, you think you got the thing straightened out now, huh, son? I certainly have, Dad. No fooling. Oh, you all set, Parker? Yeah, go ahead. Comfortable, Phil? Oh, yes, Jimmy. Well, as I said... To get the thing straight, we'll have to start way back at the beginning. You mean the night we caught these two youngsters sneaking out of the City of the Dead? The night somebody shot at the mayor? No much further back than that, Doc. We'll have to go way back to the San Francisco fire in 1906. Ooh. Yes, Miss Carroll. Back to the time when your grandfather, Theodore Beverly, and your uncle, Robert Beverly, lost everything in the blaze. Robert Beverly? You mean my uncle who disappeared? That's right. Is he mixed up in this, too? <laughs> oh, rather. Well, this is the way things happen. On the night the fire got such a hold on San Francisco that it was apparent most of the business and residential district was going to burn, old Theodore Beverly and his son Robert took that precious collection of pearls, drove down here to the City of the Dead, and buried them in one of the graves. Their clue to the place where the pearls were buried was the name on the tombstone. The name was Ernest Morton. Well, that explains all the activity in the vicinity of Ernie Morton's grave. Yes. Now then. After the fire had been subdued in San Francisco and everything was put more or less to rights, old man Beverly and Robert came down here to recover their hidden treasure. It wasn't there. What? Nope, not there. Oh, but, but I don't understand. What about the letter he left with the Cartwright lawyers for me? Well, the old man lost a good deal of his reason in the fire. He saw his business burn up before his eyes. He saw his great fortune vanish overnight. He saw his beautiful home burn, everything go. His mind went with it. 
So even before they returned for the pearls, Theodore Beverly was a broken man. Well, then he might have forgotten where he hid the pearls. Yeah, but Robert should have remembered. That's true, and yet Robert wasn't all that he might have been. I'll have to say a little about him to explain. He was an unhealthy young man. had always been pampered, not too brilliant. In every way, a minus quantity. Uh, almost subnormal, wouldn't you say, Dr. Tuner? No, I wouldn't say that. Just a fellow who'd never have to lift a hand to help himself. Absolutely at sea when thrown on his own. Well, there he is. Certainly he was thrown on his own after his father's fortune disappeared. And he was twice as helpless when his father lost his reason. Well, then the pearls may still be buried somewhere down here in the city of the dead? <laughs> You're getting ahead of the story, Miss Carroll. Well, it was sometime during this period that old man Beverly made out those elaborate papers giving the pearls to you. He was obsessed with the idea that the pearls were buried in Ernie Morton's grave. That's the excuse for the papers. You see, Cartwright didn't know what the letter contained. They just filed it away to give to you on your 20th birthday as ordered. Oh. Now then, Doc Tuner didn't quite tell the truth when he said all his patients were buried in the city of the dead. Mm, told all it was necessary. Well, perhaps for general knowledge, yes, Doc. But as a matter of fact, he had one patient left. It was Theodore Beverly. Oh, my grandfather. You were his doctor. One of my best friends before he lost his mind, Miss Carroll. Now then, for the next three or four years after the fire, Theodore Beverly and Robert used to make trips down here to the City of the Dead to dig around for the pearls. It wasn't only the old man who was becoming obsessed with the idea that the pearls were still in the cemetery. Robert grew more and more peculiar. At first, the mayor here, who knew them both well, too, tried to curb them, but it was useless. Yeah, we'd have had to lock them up. Yes. It soon became apparent that either they'd have to be allowed the run of the cemetery, or else they'd have to be locked up in an asylum. Oh. Doc and Dad here talked it over quite a long time. To put them away would have meant a tremendous scandal. So finally, after much thought, Dad built a little cabin back there in the woods and moved both of them in. Say, look here, Captain Friday. You're not going to tell us one of them was masquerading as Lammy Fink. Exactly what I'm saying. Robert Beverly and Lammy Fink are one and the same person. Yeah, but if you knew... I that... didn't know it, Parker, until I got on this case. I grew up as a kid down here thinking that Lammy Fink was no one else but Lammy Fink, an adult-pated grave digger, and that the old man who lived with him was his crazy father, old Fink. So Mother's suspicions were right. Grandfather wasn't drowned. No, not drowned. They just faded out of the world they'd always lived in and became mere shadows in the city of the dead. Their obsession concerning the pearls took a peculiar form. They set up a sort of guardianship over the city of the dead. They watched everyone who approached the cemetery like hawks. Everyone who came down here, they believed, were here to dig for their pearls. Yeah, I never heard no one. Just watched them until they left. That's right. Well, it got so they didn't do much digging themselves. The old man would grow uneasy about once a month and go out and dig like fury for a few hours. Dad here got so he could tell when a spell was coming on. After old man Beverly had worn himself out and had left, Dad would go down and fill up the hole and replace the turf. So that's how all those graves have been refilled so mysteriously. Remember, Captain, I told you the place where Phil and I had dug had been covered up, and the grave was refilled after we er opened Ernie Morton's grave and found Bert Arnold. Yes, Dad was responsible for all that. Well, now, that brings us down to the night that the phantom bell started ringing, and old Clawfoot put in his appearance, and you, Miss Carroll, and Parker here were captured. Yes. Well, who was old Clawfoot, Captain Fry? Now, now, just a minute. At least two days before you and Parker came to the City of the Dead, Dad here discovered that the cemetery was receiving night marauders other than Robert or old man Beverly. He called Dr. Tuner down the second day, and things just about reached some sort of a mysterious climax when you two kids walked onto the scene. Dad and Doc naturally thought they'd finally caught the guilty parties, and they locked you up. They didn't call the police because they feared giving away the Beverly secret which they dreaded doing after all these years. So they just locked us up. That's it. But they were curious about this phantom bell. They went down to the old church and found that new rope hanging from the ceiling. As you know, Dad pulled the rope, thinking it would ring the bell, and he was creased by a bullet. Yes. Who did that? That was a booby trap. That rope wasn't fastened to a bell. It was fastened to the trigger of a revolver on the opposite side of the room. A thread fastened to the rope ran across the ceiling and down the opposite wall to the gun, which was pointed directly at the rope. Anyone pulling the rope would be in a direct line with the bullet. But who would rig up a trap like that? <laughs> That's what took me the longest to figure out. You see, it wasn't the sort of thing a person of old Clawfoot's type would do. This was underworld stuff. Somebody was trying to bump somebody off. 
I began to check up on Bert Arnold's recent friends, discovered that he'd hired three men to work with him on some kind of a hidden treasure hunt. He didn't know it, but they were some of the Morelli mob, bad boys to tangle with. The moment he mentioned half a million in buried treasure, they were with him all the way. Well, the police in San Francisco have picked up two of these fellows. That's where I got this information. Bert Arnold wasn't bad, Captain Friday. I know he wasn't. I know that. He just picked the wrong man to work with him. Well, but where did Bert find out about the pearls? Well, that's where this chap from Cartwright's office comes in. The phantom bell ringer. He opened your letter. Got the information about the pearls. Sealed up the letters again. And then took his information to Bert Arnold. Then that's the man we found bound and gagged in the old church? That's it. He sold his information to young Arnold for a thousand dollars. But he evidently didn't know what square shooting was. As soon as he got the thousand, he organized his own searching party and came down here to hunt for the pearls himself. Hmm. Seems funny he gave Bert the information. Yeah, it does seem funny, Doc. On the other hand, his game was to give out stolen information. Probably the idea of hunting for the pearls himself was an afterthought. Anyway, Bert and his three friends came down to the City of the Dead, and right after them came, what was his name, Rogers and his men. Neither party could locate Ernie Morton's grave the first night. Eventually, they clashed, and Bert Arnold and his men caught this Rogers fellow, but his men got away. They tied him up in the basement of the church, intending to leave him there until they found the pearls. Mm, real gang stuff. And that's not the half of it. Yeah. Throw another stick of wood on the fire and we'll get to the second night. That's when murder really came to the city of the dead. Slowly the skein of intrigue and desperate action is beginning to unwind. When Jimmy and Phyllis came down to dig in the grave of Ernie Morton, they sent into motion a train of events which shook the whole graveyard. Death was breathing down their very necks. But wait. The second night, Bert's gang had no better luck in looking for the Morton grave. But the third night brought you two kids down here. You went directly to the grave. How did you find it? Well, there's a map in the City of the Dead with all the plots named on it and the recorder's office and the city hall up in San Francisco. We found it on that before we came down. You don't say. Well, you're not so dumb. Oh, and now to get back to the gun trap in the church. Bert's men were using the church for a hangout in the daytime, doing their searching at night. One evening, while Bert and his men were out, Roger's men slipped into the back room and rigged up the booby trap for revenge, hoping that one of the other gang would be shot. Evidently, however, Doc Tuner and Dad were the first to run across it. Yeah, just my kind of luck. What a horrible, cowardly thing to do. Well, now to get back to the night you came down. You went to Ernie Morton's grave and began to dig. It wasn't any time until Bert and his men heard you and crept up to see who it was. Bert recognized you in the moonlight, Miss Carroll, and kept his men back. You see, Jimmy? I knew I, I knew someone was watching. Yeah. But they weren't the only ones watching. Really? Who else? There were two other groups. Two? Yes. There were the men of Rogers' gang, and back watching you and the Rogers' gang were old man Beverly and Robert. Well, <laughs> now, if that wasn't a setup. Finally, Miss Carroll, you became frightened, and you made Parker quit digging before he'd really had a chance to get deep enough to find anything. I couldn't stand it any longer. The minute you two left, Bert and his men sneaked up, saw that it was Ernie Morton's grave you were digging in, and took up the work where you two left off. You see, they saw that you hadn't found the pearls. Oh, I, I'm glad we didn't find them now. Just think what might have happened. Well, the Rogers gang waited until you were out of hearing, and then they jumped Bert and his men, and in the fight, Bert was strangled and his men driven off. Oh. Then they, in turn, took up the job of digging. Then the Rogers gang got the pearls after all. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. After they dug to their satisfaction, they threw Bert's body in the grave and partly covered it up. Later, Dad came along and saw the half-opened grave, and thinking that old man Beverly had been up to his tricks again, filled it in, not knowing that he was helping to cover up a murder. But what about the sobbing we heard on the road? And who stole Jimmy's car? The car was stolen by Bert's three friends. They wanted to make a quick getaway after Bert was killed. You thought there were only two, but the third one got into the car further down the road. And what about the person we heard sobbing? That was Robert, or Lammy Fink, whichever you wish to call him. But where was the old man Beverly? In Lammy's arms. In his arms? Yes. The old man's terror at seeing a man murdered was so great that it killed him. Lammy, or Robert, grabbed his father's body up in his arms and fled sobbing through the tombstones and down the road. That's who you two youngsters hurt. Yeah, but look here, Captain. I thought you told me it was Lammy Fink who was scared to death. Well, I thought it was at first. You see, I hadn't seen either Lammy or his father for ten years or more. 
Besides, they only had a few moments to examine the three bodies down in the cellar of Lammy's cabin before the place was set on fire. Light was bad, and added to that, Lammy and the old man always did look a great deal alike. Yeah, but Dr. Tuner and the mayor should have recognized the old man. Well, they would have, except that they had even less time to look over the bodies than I had. I thought Lammy's face looked awfully old, but the captain said it was Lammy, and I never thought to check up. The light was so bad, I didn't even get a good look at his face. So my grandfather has just died. It it seems so strange. I, I can't realize it. You see, I've thought of him as dead for more than ten years. But that means Lammy Fink isn't dead. Yes, Parker. That means Lammy Fink isn't dead. Well, where is he then? In custody. You mean Lammy Fink is in jail? Robert Beverly, alias Lammy Fink, is under observation. But we'll get to that presently. The next question in line is who burned Lammy's cabin? Yeah, I'd like to know about that myself. Well, it was one of Bert's gang, Dad. They made their getaway in Parker's car, but they'd left so many clues behind them that it was necessary for them to return and sort of clean up. I got this from one of the men we caught. According to him, they returned the next night after Bert was killed and saw us dig up Bert's body. We left him at the grave while I went after a stretcher, and you, Dad, and Doc here, dashed off after old Clawfoot. Parker was still out from that clip I gave him on the jaw. They sneaked in and got the body. Parker woke up just in time to see someone carrying the body away in the fog. But why'd they bother about the body? Because they knew that as long as we didn't know who was murdered, we wouldn't be able to get a line on their gang. That, likewise, was the reason for the burning of the cabin. Now... The next incident was the murder of the stranger who tried to saw his way into Parker's room. The man we saw Clawfoot murder? Yes, that was another member of Bert's gang. Remember, I was clipped on the head and his body also stolen for the same reason that Bert's was stolen. To hide the identity of those still remaining alive. Yeah, but how did the bodies get in the cellar of Lammy's cabin? Well, according to the men we have in custody, they put the bodies in the cabin thinking it was a deserted shack. Lammy must have come along and lugged them down into the basement and arranged them alongside the body of old man Beverly. Lammy, by this time, was completely out of his head. Say, Captain Friday, just when did you capture a Lammy thing? <laughs> later, later. Oh. But why did Clawfoot kill him? To protect you and Miss Carroll. To protect... Say, who is Clawfoot, anyway? Oh, Jimmy, don't you know by this time? It was Lammy Fink, of course. Yes, Lammy Fink. Or, if you prefer, your Uncle Robert, Miss Carroll. Oh, well, then he must have known me. Yes, he knew you all right. That was why he patrolled about the house. That's why he brought you the black pearl. The black pearl? Uh, Clawfoot or Lammy Fink brought me that? Yeah. The night he broke into the cottage. He put it under your pillow when you fainted. He threw the knife through the window that stabbed you, too, Miss Carroll. He did? Well, but why if he was protecting me? He didn't mean to hit you. That was an accident. By the way, where is that knife? What? Well, but tell me, Captain Friday, why did he throw it? Well, where's the knife? I'll show you. Well, I... Give it to him, Phyllis. Well, I... Well, I'll... Well, what's it doing there in bed with you? I gave it to her for protection when I had to leave her. Oh, you did, did you? Thought I was going to murder her, I suppose. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Friday. Honest, I am. I shouldn't have suspected you, but... Well, I had to do everything I could to protect Phil. Uh, I think I understand, boy. Forget it. Well, uh, look here at the knife. See here how the handle screws off the blade? Oh, what's inside? There. The black pearl. Not the black pearl, Miss Carroll. A black pearl. But I don't understand. Well, it's simple. Old man Beverly kept two of the pearls out of the collection for some unaccountable reason. And the old man died. Lammy fell heir to them, and he was trying to give them to you. He was highly unsuccessful both times he tried. The first time he almost stabbed you to death. The second time he nearly frightened you into fits. Say, I reckon while we're on the subject of that visit, I want to know how the mayor here got out of that bedroom when he was locked in. <laughs> oh, that? Yeah, that. Well, the mayor had slipped out of the house hours before. I didn't know where he was or what he was up to, but I didn't want the rest of you to know he was out and increase your suspicion. So I pretended he was asleep and I locked the door. <laughs> I'll be dead, Bern. So it was you, mayor, who was digging in Ernie Morton's grave at the end of the trail of bones. No, Parker, dad wasn't digging in the grave. He was just filling up the grave that Robert Beverly, alias Lammy Fink, alias Clawfoot, had opened. He was getting battier and battier. The opening of the cottage door and dropping that skeleton inside was one instance. The scattering of his bones through the city of the dead was another. And finally, he gathered them up again in a sack and left them on the porch. But I want to know what became of you, Captain Friday, while I was lying behind that tombstone. <laughs> well, you have got an explanation coming. Mm. 
I saw it was Dad in the grave. I didn't want you to see him. So I made you lie flat, and then I sneaked out and took him away. After you'd gone back to the cottage, Dad finished filling up the grave and then returned to the cottage. So that's how it was. Uh, 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 and about that gold pencil you had, Mayor? Go ahead and explain it, son. Well, when I caught Dad in the grave, I had him in a tight place. So I made him sit down and write out the whole story, most of the story I've told you. He'd been trying to cover up for the Beverleys, but I made him give me the lowdown then and there. Mm. Anyway, he borrowed my gold pencil and then stuck it in his pocket. That's how that happened. <laughs> I hear you tried to lie out of it got caught Dad. Yeah. Doesn't pay to lie if you aren't good at it. Now then. But who jerked the mare in my bedroom and robbed him of the other black pearl? Oh, here, just a minute. Yeah, here it is. Here's your other black pearl. Then it was you in there. Yes, I needed that pearl. But I didn't choke Dad to get it, and I didn't take it away from him. He gave it to me. Well, I had to tell some story. You didn't want him to know the truth. That's right. You see, folks, I wasn't getting anywhere working in the open, so I decided to disappear and keep my eyes on things from cover. It didn't take long to get to the bottom of things that way. Was it you that kidnapped Clawfoot out in front? Yes. Did you see that? Well, partly. It was still so dark we couldn't see who it was. It was I. Say, what made him make those horrible noises? Why didn't he talk? I rushed into the city and an examination was made. His throat became paralyzed, evidently, the night he saw Bert Arnold murdered. It was a condition paralleling his mental state. All he could do was wail. Oh. Well, but why did he wear that funny robe, then? And, and what about his claw feet? Oh, yes, his claw feet. Haven't you ever seen these Indian moccasins made out of the foot skins of animals with the claws left in to make them ornamental? <laughs> Bag gum, of course. Oh, then his feet weren't clawed at all. No. Lammy had a pair of those moccasins. He lost all of his clothes. When the cabin was burned, he didn't even have a coat. It was awfully cool. Dad had some sheets out on the line airing, and Lammy stole one of them to wrap himself in. Oh, the poor thing was just trying to keep warm. That's all. He wasn't the least bit interested in being ghostly. Well, isn't that the limit? Mm, about explains everything, too, I guess. Well, there'll be points coming up from now on, but that covers the most important phases of the case. Yeah, but look here. You haven't even touched on the most important thing of all. Yeah? Yes. What's become of Theodore Beverly's collection of black pearls? Oh, the black pearls. <laughs> well, my dear Parker, the pearls are waiting for Miss Carroll up in a strong box in the Civic Center National Bank, where they have been ever since the fire of 1906. What's that? You mean to say those pearls never were buried down here in the City of the Dead? Yes, they were. When the fire started, the pearls were buried here. But after it had been checked, old man Beverly came down here alone, dug them up, and deposited them in the bank. Right after that, he lost his memory. He remembered burying them originally in the City of the Dead, but he forgot all about coming back here for them and putting them in the bank. Hmm, you don't say. Carmine, how did you find that out? Well, at dawn this morning, I rushed Lammy to the city, and the whole story came out in the first editions of the paper, about me having two of the collection of the Beverly Pearls and all that. Well, the bank saw the story and called me. They had the rest of the pearls. They had an order to deliver the pearls to Miss Carroll on her 20th birthday. They did? Well, why didn't they do it then? Because the old man had made a mistake of a month in her age. The bank would have automatically delivered the pearls to you, Miss Carroll, next month. You mean to say that that I'm worth a half a million dollars? Exactly that. Oh, golly. Well, Jimmy, now you've just got to marry me. Hey. Yes, you do. A girl with that much money needs protection. Well, if you insist. Oh, darling. And you're all invited to the wedding. Yeah, and we'll be there. Don't you think we won't? And you, Captain Friday? Well, I don't know. I've got some business that's going to take me out of town if I get back. What, what kind of business, son? Military intelligence, Dan. The government's put a finger on Skip Turner and me to do a job for them up off the coast of Canada. Who's oh, Skip Turner? One of my operatives in my agency. Off the coast of Canada? Hmm. That sounds like smugglers. Well, I can't talk about it, but I can guarantee you there's liable to be plenty of death and destruction before we get through. There's some pretty lonely, wide-open spaces up in that country. And not all the animals go around on four legs. Smugglers, death and destruction... A country where all the animals don't go around on four legs? Next week, you will find Captain Friday and his sidekick, Skip Turner, fighting for their lives and for a very beautiful young woman when Adventures by Morse brings you the first episode of A Coffin for the Lady, 
a new Cartony Morse production. <laughs> <laughs>